dauert ungefähr noch. Kommt an. So, also ich schicke jetzt noch einmal das raus und das heißt in 20 Sekunden oder eine halbe Minute. resulted in a significant increase in a prostate cancer survivors with the potential of experiencing the symptoms of uh, hypogonadism. It's increasing with age and androgens decline with age. In majority, androgen levels
I'm impressed. You, you see the real veterans here. Party and still here. You see the young generation still recovering in the sauna, probably. Waking up. <laughs> but um, good morning. First of all, uh, I want to thank you all for joining this, I think, very important meeting and making the way to Vienna. You know, the six years ago, we were sitting at the meeting and thinking about what's going to be the future for the next generation in Central Europe. We're thinking what made us friends over the years is meeting at, meeting at meetings, sharing expenses, having fun, and having the opportunity to build something special. So then we got together this six years ago. We sat at the table, if you all remember, in, 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 in Vienna, and we said, we're going to somehow bring back to life the Central European meeting with really three goals. Number one, educate at a top level the next generation of leaders. Number two, foster creative minds for research and interaction. And number three, a networking that is built on friendship and partnership in the region. I can assure you yesterday, as you saw the posters and the things, that it was a true success for the first two. But I can show you the third one was even more successful. The young can confirm it. Because at 1 o'clock, we had Azerbaijani songs being sung, right? And Frank Sinatra, birthday party. Um, we got a huge uh, consumption at the bar. I don't even know how we could have drunk so much. Then son, suddenly this, uh, the Slovenians brought multiple bags of more alcohol in a bar. And at 6 o'clock this morning, the hotel called me and it said, there are still some people here at the bar. What are they doing here? So I was thinking, who's at the bar? But I see Harun is not here, so I'm sure he's still at the bar. <laughs> we have to bring him here for the thing. So I think this is an essential part of every meeting, also building these friendships and, and coming together. I want to thank you all for coming to Vienna. And I want to specifically thank the national societies to making the effort in believing in the Central European meeting. And uh, four weeks ago, when I was sitting and I said, we have maybe a short window of opportunity to make this meeting a reality, because who knows when the next you know, closures and so on will happen. And so I sent an email to all the leaders of the national meetings, we want to do a meeting in four weeks in Vienna. Can you come? And everybody was resoundingly, yes, let's do it because it's time to take the chance. Everybody said, it's in four weeks, it's crazy, but let's try it. And that uh, we see that this happened yesterday and today will continue to happen as the day will evolve. And that is very special. And it shows that not only we can produce good research, as we've seen yesterday in the poster presentations of the next generation, really proud of them, but we can not only uh, have, you know, a fantastic workshops of the uh, really experienced stars and senior guys in the region, sharing their knowledge, their experience uh, with the next generation. But today we will see also that we can take it to the next level, not only uh, um, in debates, in state-of-the-art lectures, but really making, uh, ending up the day in a country competition where we take good things and make it even greater. So I want to thank all the uh, presidents and, and national society members. I want to, with your kindness, call you all up here to just give a brief introduction and, and uh, start the day with the first session. So I will start in order that I have it here. Dejan, you're uh, listed as the first one. Um, you were the last one, I think, leaving the bar. You're the first one on stage. We will see the performance sold. But I will say a good urologist is somebody who can work and party hard, right? And uh, that happened. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And, and dear Sharok, really thank you for organizing this and to invite us here. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here and to have at last a live meeting where we can meet. And like you said, the socializing and the social part is as important as the scientific one. And it's a really great opportunity for our young uh, colleagues that can come here and, and learn a lot. And uh, 
from my heart and also on behalf of Slovenian Urological Association. I thank you for organizing this and I hope to have many more of these meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. If you want to just stay one second. <laughs> uh, Piotr, you're on the next, next one on the list for the Polish society, which is, you know, uh, not only a huge society, but a hugely active society. Dear, dear colleagues, uh, there is a not too long speech, but this is the necessity to strongly depict that in the name of the whole urological community in Poland as a part of the very prestigious Centra Urological Society. Um, this is a fundamental way that the coming together is a success, but working together is a progress. Thank you very much for perfect organization and thank you very much that based on your activity and the scientific and the organization we can be together. Thank you. Thank you so much. We, we even organized snow today in April for you. So it's, it's, it's been crazy. We chose this setting because in April it's pretty beautiful with a Daniel, but I don't know what happened. Um, so next one, uh, Milan, actually, as a vice president of the Czech Society, um, actually, actually the Czechs had a very short drive here, right? So ladies and gentlemen, I'm so happy to be back in Vienna. Uh, I was a young guy when I went for the first time to the Central European meeting. You remember it was uh, supported by EAU, by regional uh, office. Former chief was uh, Mike Marberger, thanks to him, to establish uh, this, uh, these meetings. And I am so happy that we have uh, so strong leader like uh, uh, Sharok Shariat, uh, uh, because it's not so easy to organize such meeting without support of EAU. So I am happy to be here and I hope for a nice future of this meeting for next year as well. Thank you very much, Sharok. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Stefan Krause for the Austrian Society. He's the president of the Austrian Society, a very close friend. He's a German living in Austria, so he's a <laughs> and he made it. Huh? Yes. He survived. You know, Austria and Germany in Austria is like, uh, I don't know. Oh, well, we end up talking about football. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sharuk, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure for me uh, uh, representing the Austrian uh, Society of Urology here. And I was really impressed when I arrived uh, yesterday afternoon how many young doctors, uh, researchers are joining the lecture and the workshops. And this is only possible if there's a, a person, who, a, a, tough, a tough leader, who makes pressure on all that starting uh, perfectly, organization perfectly. We need the industry. There was a, everybody talked about, there was a real, really short period of time to organize that. I'm really impressed, Sharok, and uh, I'm happy for that kind of meetings that we got on presence, you know, not not on uh, on uh, on media, social media, or so something like that. I think in the future we need that regular, and I hope uh, that could take place like like this uh, started now, yesterday uh, in the next two years, and um, it's it's a good job you do, really Thank good so job. Much. It's Thank a pleasure you. for me to take part here. Thank you so much for the Austrian Society. I, I think we still have to train the young ones to be able to party and to still wake up on time, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing we didn't train enough in residency. They want to learn robotics, but they need to learn also to. They will come, they will trickle in. Marta, thank you so much for coming for the Romanian Society. Uh, it's very special for you to be here, uh, specifically um, also all the greetings uh, from the Professor Sinesco, who, who said Marta would be the best per representation. Dear Professor Shariat, most appreciated organizing committee, honorable, distinguished guests, speakers, conference participants. We are now celebrating the birth of a new Central European meeting in a special year, in a certainly most special place, Vienna. After two hard years defined by a worldwide pandemic, we were forced to find new ways of communication. We were inventing new teaching methods. And we try to share knowledge via internet, seeing each other's face on the monitors of our laptop. It's a great pleasure to finally see you, talk to you, to this great venue, many familiar faces, but also many young urologists who could participate for free at the, this second, 22nd Central European meeting to obtain insight into the most recent developments. 
And for this, my sincere thanks, Professor Sharia. On behalf of Professor Sinesco and the Romanian Neurological Association, I want to thank you for your kind invitation. And I want to express my sincere gratitude and honor to represent my colleagues at this outstanding event. I wish you fruitful discussions, and I hope this Congress will yield another important step towards the future of Central European urology. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marta. Thank you. I think everybody can agree that we're sick of webinars and ominars and whatever, and it's so nice to be together. Each time we meet, actually, I realize how close we are, how similar we are and in this region, right? Uh, I always tell the joke that uh, my wife and I got a, a genetic test, you know, for our background and our roots. And my wife was like, I, I'm, you know, I'm from Austria, 300 years, I can prove it and so on. And when she got her genetic test, it was 60% uh, Slavic genes, you know? So in reality, you know, we're such a mix in this region of exchanges and so on. So, and, and that is uh, uh, what makes us not only diverse, but strong and healthy, looking towards the future. Ivan, for the uh, Slovakian uh, society, thank you very much for being with us. Morning. Good morning. Good morning for everybody. I think that atmosphere in this nice meeting is very friendly. Everybody is smiling, not only in the bar, also mm -hmm. during conference, because uh, this meeting is uh, very good organized. The uh, scientific program has very high level. Thanks to Sharok and his great team, we have the opportunity to meet, meet each, uh, each, uh, with each other uh, again for a long uh, time because we didn't see uh, each other only uh, during the online system, due the internet, and now we have the opportunity to, to uh, improve our knowledge and this meeting is very important mainly and is very great impulse for mainly for young generations so thank you very much for organizing such very nice meeting very for very short period thank you thank you Sharok. thank you so much thank you so much Ivan. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, we did it four weeks. Uh, yesterday you made the jokes. Next year we're going to do it in two weeks. And, <laughs> and, and before I forget the, the end of the day, I want to thank two people for doing it because I know I will forget it. One is Sylvia. Thank you so much for making this happen. She said uh, to me, she said, I'm not going to do any more meetings with you. You have to promise me if you want to stay working with you. I promised her that two years ago. But then actually this meeting, I said, we need you back to make this happen. And Christoph was behind the scene. In, I told him, uh, we're going to have a meeting in four weeks. He said, are you crazy? And he's worked for TV. He's worked for everybody. He said, he said like, it's impossible, but he made it happen. And this is the team that came together. Thank you to you guys as well. So uh, next one is Peter. Thank you for the Hungarian Society, a very close friend. I have seen Peter more than I have seen my wife in the last month. We have seen each other three times. <laughs> so thank you very much, dear colleagues and dear friends. On behalf of the Hungarian Eurological Society, I want to welcome all the audience. It is great to be together again. I think everyone agrees. So we have to be, we should be very grateful for uh, Professor Sharia to organize this meeting and his team and his colleagues. I think nowadays in these uh, difficult times, it falls in, into the case of almost an impossible challenge. I think Central European meeting for all of us has been something very important. But as I already mentioned that in uh, today's difficult times, it's just getting more and more important. Its importance is uh, significantly increasing. So therefore, I... I'm confident that this meeting is the foundation and also the guarantee of our common uh, scientific uh, cooperation. So I think the complete program, the number, and also as Sharok mentioned, uh, the quality of the pro uh, posters, this is predict the quality of this meeting. But I think uh, we should say again, many, many thanks for all the audience, for all the colleagues, and last but not least for the ph uh, pharmaceutical companies and also for the Open Medical Institute for the financial support. So I wish all of you a very nice and very useful meeting. And thank you very much for all of you coming and getting together. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for specifically reminding us actually the Central European meeting, you know, uh, um, 
Wolfgang Olitsky has been very kind supporter, has uh, sponsored within each society the hotel rooms for eight uh, members. And that's we should be very grateful for that because uh, it's a small support, but it's a sign that there's investment and there's a look towards the future, specifically with the goal of building capacity and retaining talent in the region. Um, and the last one for the Croatian Society, Igor, um, um, thank you very much for coming. I know you had a very difficult flight. Last year, Igor told me, uh, he had a meeting in Croatia. He said, Shirak, why did you take the plane to come to Croatia? You're crazy. You should have drove. I was like nine hours in the plane. And then he did the same thing now yesterday. <laughs> Apologize for my um, uh, for being late yesterday. Um, good morning, everyone. On behalf of Croatian Society of Urology, I wish to express our gratitude for being here. First of all, I want to express our gratitude to Sharok, who organized this meeting against all the odds. Uh, congratulations for that. I think it's a great platform for everybody, especially for young urologists in the region, to be here and perform under international audience. And I think this meeting is very important because it embodies European unity, cooperation and friendship, which is very important at this time when the peace in Europe is very fragile. I wish you all successful meeting. Thank you so much. Yes, my wife this morning told me, why don't you make it a, uh, you know, for the registration, everybody should give five euros for uh, Ukraine. I said, it's for free, you don't know, <laughs> for us everything. No, it's fantastic and I think it's very important. And we saw yesterday that we have, you know, people from even Israel and, and Russia and for everywhere in the world and that makes it very special. As I was making jokes, you had the Japanese and Saudi Arabians giving lectures here. So the Central European is expanding. Um, so. Before we start, and uh, while I have everybody here, I want to just give two little things before I forget. Number one, for the Medical University of Vienna, I want to give a, a something uh, to Piotr Kloster. Um, where is Piotr? Uh, there, here you are. Piotr, uh, I before I forget it, uh, I've been running around from meeting to meeting. Here is your adjunct professorship that um, um, Marco Babjok is uh, adjunct professor at our university, Peter Niradi is adjunct professor, and now Piotr Kloster, you're also adjunct professor at our university, which uh, should foster the exchange and a partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, it's so funny because universities are always uh, thinking if they want you to work more and uh, they don't want to pay you more, so they give you fake titles. <laughs> I always feel sometimes we're like the Russian, you know, in the Soviet times, you know, those generals with 20 things on it, the jacket big, but it's a, it's a sign. And I think this exchange and things we're doing, it's going to be very special also to, to build that platform for research on top of everything else. So. Um, at each, um, at each um, meeting, Central European meeting, we said, we're going to give a Distinguished Contribution Award. The Distinguished Contribution Award is to somebody who made significant advancement through leadership and dedication to the vision, science, and quality of the Central European Urologic Society, and, and that specifically shows itself in the meeting itself. So this year, it was a pretty unanimous chosen a uh, Peter. <laughs> I should take it out of the box, but it <laughs> open the envelope, <laughs> Peter. So uh, this was uh, very unique. You can put it, uh, you can tell your wife it was worth it. Yeah, to yeah. Go <laughs> I, I got a piece of paper. I, 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 order, I order if you have something <laughs> bad because I, I'm spoiled by you more than I should be. So thank you very much. I, I'm deeply honored and, and it is a great, great pleasure and thanks a lot. I, I really, it's a pleasure for me to do everything for the Central European meeting and thanks Thank a lot again for all of you, you. my dear colleagues. Good. We need to make one picture. Do we have a, do you want to make one picture all together? And Marco, please. Yes, absolutely. You know, Marco has become the dean of a university. His life has just ended. <laughs> 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 Everybody is trying to work life balance, he's making <laughs> different type of. Marco, you want you on the stage? Join us. Join us. <laughs> 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 
Absolutely, Marco was a, a unique heart. Fantastic. It's going to be on uh, Facebook and not on Playboy. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> I know at this age, everybody wants to <laughs> wish us to me. So thank you so much uh, for the presidents. Thank you so much. And uh, we're going to start the first session. And actually with Marco in the lead. And as you're going to see over the day, we're going to take you through a, a potpourri of urology. Uh, the way we were thinking about how we're going to do it, we're going to have a state-of-the-art lecture uh, representative by two experts, and then we're going to have a debate and a case presentation by a young doctor that sets up the debate. And, and so we're going to move through oncology to stones to reconstruction, voiding dysfunction. And at the end, we're going to finish with a potpourri of things that are interesting, but yet not fully represented in the program. Thank you very much, and uh, please the stage to Marco and Stefan. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, now we start really with the lectures. The first uh, topic we got is the bladder cancer in the morning. And um, let's start with the first lecture of molecular classification of bladder cancer, the promised land. I think a very important topic. Dr. Oswald from Austria, please. Good morning, everyone. I feel honored to present the important and timely topic of molecular classification of bladder cancer. For centuries, pathology had to rely on autopsies, often illegal, to obtain vague descriptions of bladder tumors. Virkov revolutionized pathology by promoting the use of microscopy. Even today, we use this tool to distinguish tumors based on their cellular appearance, tissue architecture. Around 1995, the marketing of cDNA microarrays, again, in my opinion, revolutionized pathology, since it really opened up the field of transcriptomic <clears throat> analysis to a wide audience. But most pathologists will scorn me just for making this comparison. We've seen explosive advances in technology, including next generation and single cell sequencing. But the question, are these tools the end all to pathological classifications, um, the promised land, if you so like? This question needs to be asked. And the aim of my talk is to empower you to strengthen your answer to this question. As pathologists, we want to provide a diagnosis that correctly distinguishes diseases based on differences in underlying biology. This will, of course, affect management based on differences in prognosis and prediction. Separating diseases and understanding their differences will help us to devise different strategies that are more effective and more efficient, which is very compelling. The molecular classification of bladder cancer was largely established around muscle invasive disease. In fact, most of these studies made use of cDNA microarrays. And since 2003, we've seen a number of studies with different names and different numbers of classes becoming increasingly complex. So in 2020, Kamun and others made an important step and tried to find a consensus to unite these different um, investigator groups. Although some aspects of this work remain controversial, it is up to date the most important reference framework we have in the molecular classification of bladder cancer. The authors took several large cohorts and aggregated them and, and clustered the different molecular classes that had been proposed and came up with consensus classes. And these are basal squamous, luminal, papillary, luminal unstable, luminal non-specified, stroma-rich, and neuroendocrine-like. They described that there were differences in the frequencies of mutations in commonly affected genes in bladder cancer, such as FGFR3, TP53, KDM6A, and so on. They found differences in underlying pathways, but also differences in the um, tumor microenvironment regarding both the immune and the stromal um, components. Overall, there was quite a good concordance between the morphological subtypes that pathologists describe and the molecular classes. So in brief, Squamous and sarcomatoid carcinomas were most prevalent in the basal squamous class. Micropapillary carcinomas and cases associated with carcinoma in situ were very prevalent in the luminal non-specified class. Neuroendocrine carcinomas obviously were very frequent in the class that they called neuroendocrine-like. There was overall a difference in survival between these groups, but this test did not really tell us between which groups exactly. 
Surely every pathological classification should promote better prediction and prognosis. In 2020, Sjödal showed that luminal, especially the luminal unstable groups, had a higher rate of uh, pathological response compared to basal squamous groups after new adjuvant chemotherapy. The luminal unspecified and the luminal unstable groups also had increased cancer-specific survival compared to basal squamous groups. But looking at the raw p-values, it was a close call, especially if you compare it to the very um, strong effect of the clinical stage that was observed in the study. On a side note, patients who received upfront cystectomy did not show any difference based on molecular class. When the authors compared their results to uh, previous cohorts from important studies from, from Seiler and Taber, they found only partial concordance. And in fact, the additional case numbers decreased rather than increased the statistical significance of their findings. So how can this be? A more critical approach was uh, made by Morera, who investigated a separate independent cohort and found that only the TCGA classification predicted overall survival. And that was barely significant. Um, in contrast to the established surgical pathology criteria, such as TNM stage or lymphovascular invasion, the molecular classifications failed to significantly predict overall or recurrence-free survival. In fact, many of the proposed gene profiles across the field of medicine failed to reproducibly predict outcome. And several studies have tried to approach this topic. One of my favorite studies found that in breast cancer studies, any random set of genes in combination can pre significantly predict outcome. By the way, breast cancer studies are typically larger and better powered than those in bladder cancer. Some authors have even gone so far to say that prognostic gene scores or gene profiles in breast and prostate cancer are not useful to infer meaningful biological insight. Consider this. In addition, the problem of multiple testing in statistics is, is an important issue for, for gene profiles as well. Every comparison you make, let's say molecular class versus overall survival, recurrence-free survival, morphological subtype, associations with X, Y, and Z, each comparison will increase additively the rate of a false positive study result. Besides this, there is a lot of misconception and debate about how different are tumors from different molecular classes actually. And I think a lot of this stems from the general misuse of heat maps in research papers. So in a typical study, samples will be profiled and clustered based on their similarity. The heat map then plots the data in a specified order, typically to enhance the visual contrast. But this practice obscures that the data often represent a, a spectrum. And it is not evident where you should place the thresholds or how distinct the groups really are. So on the left side, you see a typical heat map, and you can agree, well, there might be three clusters. But if you simply rearrange the rows of this graph without changing the data using identical clustering, you see that the picture is completely different. And there's a spectrum. And whether there are three groups or two groups or where to place the thresholds is a lot less clear. So in summary, this means that tumors from the same molecular class may actually be more different than two tumors from different molecular classes. And this poses big problems for pathology at the moment, trying to apply these kind of classifications. So what about non-muscle invasive disease? Only recently have there been extensive studies, and these typically relied on RNA sequencing, combined genomic and proteomic studies. So in a way, we can consider them next generation classifications, if you like. All of them have their merits. This one had a large cohort and provided a nice summary, so I chose to show this graph. And you can see that there are some associations between the proposed molecular classes and specific factors, such as stage, grade, or risk of recurrence and progression. But the authors go further and propose specific lines of therapy for specific molecular classes. For me, this is a very important step forward in how we deal with the output of basic research papers. But it is important, as with other classifications, in truth, the distinction between these tumors is far less clear cut than in this graph. And we will probably need a consensus classification and we will definitely need a lot more validation before we can even consider to apply this in praxis. So where are we on our road to the promised land of molecular pathology? Um, we are playing a game of leapfrog at disease classification. And by that, I mean every month we have a new study with new classifications and whether this is really useful is a different debate. However, the WHO is already incorporating molecular knowledge from 
less recent studies into current tumor classifications. So there is progress. But we also know that our current models are limited in providing additional useful information for prognosis and prediction. For instance, we would like to predict complete remission and spare patients cystectomy. But we're far from that, and we likely will stay far from that. So instead of trying to make this accurate prediction at diagnosis by molecular classification, our efforts might be better focused if we improve monitoring strategies. Lastly, to develop targeted and effective therapies requires that we don't only describe heterogeneity in tumors and lump them into different groups, but that we use this information to further understand the underlying biology. And naturally, this aspect is somewhat lagging behind. As a result, there is currently no clinical implication for molecular classification of bladder cancer. In contrast, mor morphological subtypes have some well-established impact. Thus, none of the relevant organizations recommend molecular subtyping at the moment. From a technical perspective, none of the several tests that have been proposed have been rigorously validated, and none of them are economical because there is currently no clinical impact. The tests will not be available everywhere because of the lack of resources and technology in many places. Lastly, if we in Vienna were, were to start testing every bladder specimen on a molecular side, we would dramatically increase the term over time for all molecular tests, simply because of the way that resources are currently allocated within pathology. So for pathologists, it is really important that we try to reconcile our concepts of morphological classification subtypes and molecular classifications. If a tumor is neuroendocrine by morphology, but it is luminal by molecular status, who wins? Most pathologists will say morphology wins, but keep the molecular data in mind. How do we deal with these statements? What use is such a statement to, to you in, in the practical work? It is unclear how sensitive molecular tests are to small compo com components of morphological subtypes, like 5% micropapillary, which may be relevant, or even the presence of multiple morph morphological subtypes. So I think that for the foreseeable future, there'll be a strong role of classical surgical pathology, not simply, or not least because crucial factors such as resection margins, concomitant carcinoma in situ or lymphovascular invasion, we have no idea how we will even approach this by molecular testing at the moment. So I think that in summary, we are approaching a tipping point where our incremental increases in knowledge will culminate in fundamental changes in practice. And we will see, I'm convinced, the transformation of basic discovery that is exploding into improved clinical care. And meetings such as these, I think, are important to discuss where are we on the path to this point? What steps do we have to take now in order to promote the transformation of this basic discovery to actual care? Where are the biggest points of potential for molecular analysis in bladder cancer right now? And what is preventing us in this moment from making the most of it. So I hope that this talk can promote fruitful discussion among surgeons, pathologists, and basic researchers, and others who may be here. Because surely, if we don't discuss, the promised land may remain far away, and we may be disappointed once we arrive at what we now think it will be. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very interesting speech. We got just a little time for discussion to stay in time. Is there anybody interesting? Yes, please. Um, yes, Melanie Hassler from Medical University of Vienna. Andre, thanks for this very exciting talk. Um, I have one question for clinical everyday practice. Um, what do you suggest for um, the time of sampling for molecular assessment? So which samples should we actually take? Do you recommend to do a biopsy, for example, in systematic uh, disease? Or would you uh, also say it's possible to go back to uh, the cystectomy specimens, um, how should we deal with this? The knowledge on the differences between tumors of different sites, for instance, regarding, I don't know, immunotherapy, is a lot less well-established than bladder cancer in general. As a pathologist who works with tissue in, in Europe, laboratory medicine and pathology are much more closely related. And here, we focus a lot on tissue. So out of a kind of 
professional prejudice, I, I would like to see more tissue samples from metastases of different locations because we will only then be able to really characterize the, the, the true heterogeneity and, and, and the true merit of, of our different, um, different ideas. Um, but in the end, I guess it's also a clinical question and what do you want to do to a patient? And so maybe this answers your question. Thank you. Maybe this is the technical aspect, this question also. So which material we need in this moment to really be able to perform the molecular classification? No, because there it was always the limitation of many studies in the past. Um, uh, many marker studies, for instance, because in some rather dangerous tumors like tumor in situ, and so it was not easy to get enough tissue for the sampling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, carcinoma in situ is still a very difficult topic. Um, it's unclear how you will really address this by molecular studies because it's often just a small component. Um, it's a hard question. There are, there are increasing refinements in technology that enable you to analyze such features. Um, I think it will, at least for research purposes, be solved by collaborative effort between different institutions to try and really amass a large cohorts and a lot of tissue. For routine practice, um, I, I think that if we spend the tissue that we have wisely, um, let's say not try to make a 10 immunostains that have no value at the moment, we may be able to use what is present to do molecular studies in, I don't know, a year or two years when it has actually uh, become relevant. Yeah, but we must solve this problem, you know, mm -hmm. because the, the most dangerous by the tumors are those where we don't see exactly where mm -hmm. is the tumor in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could you consider doing random sampling? I'm sure many pathologists would not like to look at the extra tissue. I'm sure many would. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We can proceed. Okay, if there are, thank you. It was excellent, excellent lecture, and I hope this is the future. And uh, uh, we can proceed with the second talk, which is Eurofilial Carcinoma 2022. What is on the horizon? Uh, Professor Dobruk from Poland. Jakub. Good morning, Jakub Dobruch, Warsaw, Poland, uh, Sharok. I'm delighted to be here. All right, um, I will cover two cases in my talk. I'm sure you all encounter these in your daily clinical practice. The first, the first one, 72 years old, retired medical professional who was diagnosed with TA low-grade disease, two small lesions, and unfortunately, after the surgery, he experienced severe infection. A year later, during cystoscopy, two, again, two tiny, two, three millimeters lesions were diagnosed. And let me ask you, ask you a question. How many of you would go to OR and remove the lesions? Please raise your hands. How many of you? How many of you would consider other options? is his reluctance towards any kind of transurethral surgery due to his experience make any influence on your attitude, your, your recommendation? Okay. We know that this type of disease has very um, large risk of recurrence. We know that these lesions recur in more than 60, 70, 80% of cases. But the risk of progression to the disease that might pose a threat to the patient's life is negligible. Yet at the same time, numerous urethral intervention would pose the risk on the patient's urethra, I mean urethral stenosis. He may end up with small contracted bladder and these repeated procedures drive cost. So is there a uh, reliable septal to cystoscopy. When patients with non mastering invasive disease were asked what the test would be to supplant cystoscopy, their answer was it has to be extremely reliable, accurate. Sensitivity should exceed 90%. 
And through all the recent years, we have witnessed introduction of several novel, novel urinary biomarkers, including those that I present at this slide. According to systematic review, their performance is, is excellent. But let me focus your attention on the one of these four metrics. I mean negative predictive value. Negative predictive value means that if the patient has the negative result of a test, it makes sure me and him that he is not having a deadly high grade disease, the disease that would pose a threat to his life and our accountability. And according to this review, if we implement these urinary biomarkers, we would uh, decrease, significantly decrease the number of uh, cystoscopies performed according to um, surveillance protocols. And I'm glad to see that EU guidelines opened the door for urinary biomarkers uh, to be implemented in the surveillance of this TA low-grade cancer patients. And the other case is rather the small one. This is a 66 years old gentleman who was diagnosed with bladder tumor, is slightly obese, hypertensive, and has diabetes. Typical muscle invasive cancer, CT together with TOR led to the diagnosis of muscle invasive disease, CT2, CT3, probably, and the patient entered the typical standard way of treatment, meaning neoadjuvant chemotherapy, followed by radical cystectomy scheduled in our OR, OR plan. Unfortunately, along chemotherapy, he experienced retention. And then the images, repeated images, showed the disease that is far beyond resectability. Right? Um, when you look at the MRI images, you, you may see that all tissues adjacent to the bladder are involved by the disease. So he, he is, he became a not surgical, surgical patient. We know that, that when the disease progresses along chemotherapy, the prognosis is much worse than in those who, in whom the disease uh, responds to chemotherapy. Is it possible to address the risk? Is it possible to assess the response? Um, do we have any markers to, uh, to address the response correctly in an individual patient? Um, we are familiar with prostate cancer MRI images. I'm sure every one of you uh, look at the images almost every day. So we are familiar with MRI images. When I look at the when I look at MRI images of the bladder, I'm convinced that this type of imaging um, provides significant amounts of information that it might be used with this it, or in this respect. Um, in the literature, the information is rather scarce on that. You will find at least two groups from Italy that look at look at the specific issue, and they are trying to trying to provide a scale, a way of uh, assessment of the of the response of the bladder tumor in MRI. But there is a long way there is a long way to go. Apart from imaging, let us look at the immunotherapy trials that um, that assess the response to novel uh, immunotherapeutic agents in this perioperative setting. And let me address, let me focus your attention on the, on the study called Abacus. It was a small two-phase, two-phase study with atezolizumab, who was, which was uh, delivered before radical cystectomy. And the study met its primary endpoint, but the authors looked at ctDNA. You heard about it yesterday. Um, looked at ctDNA and noticed that among those who responded to, uh, to therapy, ctDNA have been cleared out of the blood of the patients. So let us look now at randomized uh, study, adjuvant study of the same drug. And again, you will find that those with CT positive, ctDNA positive, do much worse than their ctDNA negative counterparts. And furthermore, 
in the group of those with ctDNA who received atezolizumab and became ctDNA negative, the prognosis became good. Uh, these two slides present the same, the same issue. On the left-hand side, you will see the probability of disease-free survival. On the right-hand side, you will see the overall survival. And again, notice, please, look at these patients with ctDNA-positive disease and the influence of this immunotherapeutic agent. And finally, positive randomized 3 trial with nivolumab um, provided to patients with locally advanced disease or T2 disease if new adjuvant chemotherapy was delivered. Patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to, uh, to receive nivolumab or placebo, and additionally, they were assessed uh, with respect to expression of PDL1. Uh, PDL1. And you will notice that the, the program survival, um, uh, disease-free uh, survival is better in the group of patients with nivolumab when compared to patients with placebo or so just observed. And uh, in the group of patients with increased expression of PDL1, nivolumab did a slightly better job than previously. Unfortunately, three deaths were recorded in the group of nivolumab, two because of pneumonia and one because of bowel, bowel perforation. So when I look at the horizon of urothelial cancer 2022, I am glad to see evolution of our perioperative attitude towards patients qualifying to radical cystectomy and happy to see increasing implementation of urinary biomarkers in our Surve surveillance protocols of patients with non-muscle invasive disease. Thank you. Thank you very much. The questions, Sharok. Thank you very much, uh, Jakub. Fantastic talk. I think uh, you know a lot of evolution progress is happening in bladder cancer, as you mentioned. And I think your first case was an excellent uh, scenario where active surveillance if the patient would be older, or office fulguration, and we're moving toward that. But the one thing in muscle invasive that I think if you want to go back to the first talk, it's the holy grail talk, is, is probably bladder preservation. Do you think that with this improvement landscape of perioperative treatment or let's take operative out, better treatment of muscle invasive disease, we will reach that point that preserving the bladder of the patients? I'm sure uh, we are close to that. Uh, we, um, I have, I have uh, shown a case of extreme progression. So this is the one end of the studies. The other one is to go to predict lack of disease, right? so the complete response. Um, at this time, either or neither MRI, neither TUR are adequate enough to predict T0 disease. So it is, it is um, a long way to go, but, it, but you can see the horizon, correct. So both ways. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You, you, in the uh, first part of your speech, uh, you talked about uh, the active probability of active surveillance. Yeah. Can you give me a, a short overview, inclusion criteria, where's the landmark for that? Mm -hmm. When do we go for operation? Is it just the age, the, the, the risk of complications? Uh, the stage is important. Uh, can, can you sum up that a little bit? I think we all accept this small, low-grade disease, right? We all accept that. You might find, well, many authors suggest that you just, you may just surveil, it, surveil the disease and do anything, do, do nothing. Uh, whether you do this office fulguration or just follow the disease, um, you will not you will um, not harm your patients. So small TA low grade specifically low grade disease TA low grade disease because if, if, when you find when you have T1 or high grade, it's a completely other story. And the focality? Hmm. Hmm. I would be happy to I would be happy to give you a specific number. Um, <laughs> Yes. Okay. <laughs> 22. Is, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, 
Okay, you, you opened several several yeah. uh, topics which with really unmet needs. Uh, maybe one comment. You spoke about uh, the the perioperative uh, treatment uh, in muscle invasive tumor, but there is something which we maybe should uh, change our strict scenarios for non-muscle invasive disease because uh, this is not only the question of surveillance and. Uh, 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 coagulation. It is also the question of uh, potential okay, no ablation of the tumor, sure. maybe neoadjuvant sure. treatment to be able to test new treatment modalities. And there is, I think, a huge space which is not discovered yet. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, now we challenge the experts, the best management of clinical localized muscle invasive bladder cancer is. First, we got a case presentation from, from Dr. Brennemann from Austria, and then we got a nice topic to two speakers presenting operation and organ sparing. Yeah, dear chairs and dear audience, um, I have the honor to present the first case today. I will take over for Dr. Brünemann because he unfortunately cannot be with us today. So the best management of clinical localized muscle invasive bladder cancer is for our patient. He's a 63-year-old man, a retired uh, painter and vanisher. His BMI is 25 and he has been having cross hematuria for one month. In his medical history, um, we see hypertension, COPD, grade two. Uh, he's also an active smoker of 80 pack years. And for major surgeries, he has had in his only inguinal hernia repair. Uh, in the diagnostic workup, we find a three centimeter tumor on the right bladder wall. And in the cytology, um, this is high grade. Um, we did an uh, MRI uh, for the bladder, where um, we um, found a 2.5 centimeter lesion, which was uh, suspicious for infiltration of the muscle with a virus 4. There was no evidence of infiltration of adjacent tissue and also no evidence of infiltration of the prostate. The prostate um, had a volume of 25 milliliters and there was no evidence of a focal lesion there. So these are uh, the MRI images. You see the uh, lesion on the right bladder wall. And uh, then this patient got a hexweek tiora. And um, with our um, 10 item checklist, uh, we see there was uh, one tumor of about 2.5 centimeters. And the characteristics were nodular. It was a primary disease. There was no sign for uh, in situ, cytinoma uh, in situ. And um, in clinical, uh, we would stage him as a CT1. Um, the tumor was completely resected, and uh, there was also tristial muscle and no uh, sign of perforation. The histology came back as a muscle invasive urethral carcinoma with a PT2 high grade classification. Um, the patient also got a staging CT um, where we did not find hydrorotor nephrosis. There was regular contrast on both renal pelvises. Um, excretion was um, normal, and there was also no evidence of lymphadenopathy. So, summing up, for this 63-year-old uh, male cisplatin fit patient who had no previous major surgery and a PT2 CN0 CM0 um, bladder tumor um, with an e uh, score of zero and a Kanofsky rate of 100, and an IIF5 score of uh, 21. What is uh, the best management, bladder sparing or radical cystectomy? Thank you very much. <laughs> For the bladder sparing now, Kilian Gust, the new standard, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, for myself as urologist, I would think, wow, that's the ideal candidate for radical cystectomy because I rarely see such a healthy patient, no previous surgery, no medical history, 
But I have to say, there are other options, and I would actually think letter sparing should be the new standard. We as urologists have to be aware that for years, there's data out that radiation therapy, chemoradiation therapy, trimodal therapy is actually an valid option for patients with muscle invasive disease. Nick James published this huge series about radiotherapy with or without chemotherapy. We have a huge series with long-term experience from Nuremberg. We have the Mass General Hospital in Boston who has a long-term experience for over 30 years in treating those patients actually with radiation therapy um, for those tumors that we fear as urologists. Though the big problem till nowadays is that there is no randomized phase three trial that actually evaluates radical cystectomy versus trimodal therapy. The spare trial was nicely planned, but failed poorly the accrual after 45 patients, they closed the trial because most of the patients haven't even been referred to the radiation oncologist to evaluate those patients to be included into the trial. So when we're talking about trimodality therapy, we as urologists, we have to be aware, we are the ones who are diagnosing this patient with an TRBT, but we have to see this tumor that challenges us every day in a multi-bacillary team with the radiation oncologist and oncologist because the trimodality therapy includes TRBT, radiation, and chemotherapy. In general, after maximal performed TRBT, Chemo radiation, either with neoadjuvant chemotherapy or the use of chemosensitizers during the radiotherapy, is being used. It has been followed up by restaging uh, TRBT to make sure that this patient is tumor free. Though some of the patients do not show complete responses and they can have either non muscle invasive residual disease, so therefore they have definitely the options of another TRBT and intravesical therapies, or if they still have muscle invasive disease present, we still can perform a salvage radical cystectomy. When we look at these long-term outcomes, and these are patients reported from 1986 till 2013, within five-year follow-up, we do see that with the experience that the Mass Gen Hospital has, the complete responses is specifically increased from 66% to 88% complete responses for patients undergoing uh, trimodality therapy for muscle invasive bladder cancer. And that translates into an overall survival improvement, a cancer specific survival improvement, but also a foreign bladder intact survival improvement. And the rates of radical cystectomies salvage performed dropped over these periods from close to 40% to less than 15%. So we have to accept this is an effective treatment. But definitely we have to choose the right candidate. And usually as urologists, we have to agree, we are lacking uh, and we are looking forward to those patients that Melanie just presented, yeah? these healthy young guys, small tumor, no lymph nodes, we love them and we love to do surgery on them. But we have to be sure that those are also the patients that are really ideal candidates for trimodality therapy. Patients that have T2, T3 disease, no or minor hydronephrosis, that do not have extensive carcinoma in situ, that have a unifocal tumor that is smaller than seven centimeters, where we as urologists could have performed a complete TRBT and patients, especially with a good bladder function and capacity and patients that under, are willing then to undergo a lifelong follow-up, including cystoscopies and imaging, are the ideal candidates for this therapy. So therefore, it starts really with the patient selection. And we have already heard from, uh, from uh, Dr. Oswald that molecular profiling can also predict responses to systemic therapy, but it can also probably predict response to chemoradiation therapy. We already heard MRIs. MRIs can also be used as biomarkers to predict the response to chemoradiation and actually to observe the tumor responding and also to modify my scheme. And 
we know that there are challenges also for the, uh, for a radio oncologist because the filling of the bladder, the filling of the bowel can modify it, but therefore novel uh, schemes and strategies are actually overcoming this issue that we might miss during the sessions, treatment sessions, the tumor. And now look at the data. We look at cystectomy series and you will see MSKCC or the SWOC data. I mean, these are big series and we have an overall survival at five years of roughly 50%, but the same for all the trimodality therapies. At 10 years, we're also still looking at the same numbers. Yes, these are different series, but we also have to be sure we probably send also the bad patients to the radio-oncologist. Um, this is a multi-institutional institution study from Toronto, MassGen, and LA. And they actually did a matched pair analysis of patients who were ideal candidates for trimodality therapy and compared it uh, with their radical cystectomy series. And we do see trimodality therapy is for sure not inferior to radical cystectomy. And that in all measurements. We're looking at uh, tumor-free survival. We're looking at, at radical cystectomy and overall survival, cancer-specific survival. They are all at least equal. Yes, for sure, if I leave the bladder in, there can be local recurrences. But for most of the patients, it was non-muscle invasive disease. So therefore, they could have been salvaged with TRBT and intravesical therapies. And the rate of salvage radical cystectomies in this series was 13%. So quite low in such a long follow-up time. And how did they do if they failed really trimodality therapy and had to undergo radical cystectomy? They actually did not do worse in terms of five-year cancer-specific survivals compared to those patients who underwent TMT but had not the need for salvage radical cystectomy. And we have to agree that a radical surgery is also a radical cut for the patient that we do. In terms of functional outcomes, quality of life, body image, TMT is associated with an improved sexual function, improved body image. And this is something we have to look at ourselves, I think. This study shows basically that patients who underwent TMT are greater informed in terms of the decision-making scores and processes, they are less concerned about negative effects of the cancer as the patients were that underwent radical cystectomy. And novel therapies, we already heard it. Immunostimulatory agents, novel targeting drugs, and immune checkpoint inhibitors that already have been involved are probably going to improve trimodality therapy. The trials are ongoing the addition of immunocheckpoint inhibitors to uh, and chemoradiation therapy, but they are also already looking into patients who have um, high risk BCG unresponsive disease. So we as urologists have to be aware that there are several treatment options and we should look into those trials. We should include also our patients into these trials and accept that this is really a valid option and not only stick to radical cystectomies. Therefore, I want to conclude, and I hope with the data that I presented you, um, I gave you a good idea what is trimodality therapy. I think it's an excellent treatment option with good functional outcomes, low associated long-term pelvic toxicity, which is seen in less than 5% of the patients, that the addition of checkpoint inhibitors will probably improve bladder preservation rates. Adaptive radiation therapy and dose escalations may also probably increase the treatment efficacy and the reduction of the side effects. And hopefully, as we're all thinking of biomarkers, is it an MRI, is it really genetic biomarkers, will therefore also move the field forward into a personalized treatment in terms of radiotherapy and trimodal therapy. Thank you very much.
thank you very much. We will have discussion after the next talk, I think. Uh, so, and in this traditional debate, I would like to ask uh, Anna Czech from Poland, uh, who will support the role of radical cystectomy, which remains clearly superior according to her talk. So, Anna, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, chairman. Thank you very much for the invitation. Kilian, that was excellent presentation. You almost convinced me. <laughs> I have no conflict of interest to disclose to relevant to this presentation. So the presented case is clinically localized muscle invasive bladder cancer. But do we have good tools to predict muscle invasive bladder cancer final pathological stage? What tools do we have for clinical staging? It's imaging and it's by manual palpation. By manual palpation is associated with relatively high rate of understaging and overstaging. In everyday practice, we rely on imaging. CT, CT's accuracy in determining extravesical tumor extension is very variable, something between 50 to 90%. MRI has better resolution. We have virates, but virates is about muscle invasive versus non-muscle invasive. And sensi sensitivity of MRI to detect perivesical invasion might be around 70%. PET CT with FDG, its local staging is hampered by urinary excretion of FDG. Even with rest staging TURBT in no signs of disease, CT0 after T two TURBTs, as in this retrospective analysis by Kukreya and co workers, among 155 patients with CT0 after rest staging TURBT, advanced. PT3 and higher disease and or lymph node invasion was detected in 25% of patients. CN0, this case, presented case is CN0, but imaging performance for clinical node staging is even worse. And lymph node dissection during radical cystectomy remains reference standard for end staging. There are controversies regarding its therapeutic benefit, but systematic reviews suggest more favorable oncological outcomes with lymph node dissection compared to no lymph node dissection. And study from Memorial Sloan Kettering suggests that progression-free survival and overall survival might be correlated with number of lymph nodes removed. Of course, survival is our primary outcome. We know from studies with long-term observation what survival we might expect after radical cystectomy for different stages of muscle invasive bladder cancer. If we precede radical cystectomy with neoadjuvant chemo, we might, we might add 8% overall survival benefit. Of course, there are studies that suggest that survival outcomes after trimodal therapy are similar to those with radical cystectomy. But unfortunately, we don't have randomized controlled trials and there are very different protocols for trimodal therapy. There is different patient selection and different reporting. In some studies, in retrospective studies from National Cancer Database, on patients treated with radical cystectomy or bladder preservation strategies, it shows that survival after mod modeling is, was significantly better for radical cystectomy compared to bladder preservation strategies. And in propensity matched comparative analysis of survival following chemo radiation or radical cystectomy, Initially, the risk of mortality was lower for chemoradiation, but at two years and later, mortality risk favored radical cystectomy. Another very important aspect is quality of life. And in very recently published paper, patient reported outcome studies on quality of life after radical cystectomy, there were no large observable detriments to heart-related quality of life by three or six months 
post operatively post op operation were detected except for sexual functioning and body image in ill conduit patients but average reported scores in most domains typically recovered or even were better we advocate upfront cystectomy in t1 high grade afraid of upstaging and progression to muscle invasive bladder cancer of course we know that studies show that prognosis after secondary progressive muscle invasive bladder cancer is worse than if you compare it to primary muscle invasive bladder cancer, but aren't we afraid of upstaging in already diagnosed muscle invasive bladder cancer? Guidelines recommend chemotherapy, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radical cystectomy as our standard. So to summarize, clinical staging has its limitations, but radical cystectomy provides good local regional control with predictable survival outcomes and favorable heart-related quality of life. And neoadjuvant chemo and radical cystectomy with lymph node dissection remains the recommended standard treatment for muscle-invasive bladder cancer. Thank you. Okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, we got two therapy options. Who would choose the three modality treatment? Please, hands up. <laughs> and who would choose the operation? Hands up. Okay, there's uh, still time for discussion now. Maybe, may I have <laughs> another question, you know, uh, similar but different. If this were your disease, if you were ill, who would decide for radical cystectomy? <laughs> <laughs> Not so. <laughs> okay. So. Okay, we go for the discussion. Mesut. Covered it very well, and and uh, we got more insight now in, into this topic. I have a question for Kilian, please, um, because as you saw, the majority <laughs> or the vast majority, and also we have in our mind cystectomy. So we face a patient with a big tumor in the bladder, and we go for staging T or B. So we just resect a little bit, and T two tumor is coming out and is confirmed. And then the patient says he does not want cystectomy and he does not want that and, and so on. And, and then you say, okay, of maybe for tree modal therapy, when do we have to do the TORB resection if it's a big tumor? Do we have to do it upfront? Do we do have to do it after chemo, before radiation? Do, do we have any signs to clear this up? I mean, I think from my side, there are two different schools. When you look at basically big series like MD Anderson, they also always want to do a maximum TRBT even before radical cystectomy. I think to have the tumor in there, if the patient is asymptomatic, is not bleeding, is also a good indicator for you to see how he does respond to chemotherapy. So you actually have a visible tumor response. I fully agree with you that before you go then to uh, the radiation therapy, you should perform a maximal TRBT. But I think it does not need to be, especially before the chemotherapy, but before the radiation therapy. That is the key, I think. Thank you very much for a, a hot debate, I think, because, you know, the field is changing and we're all sure that radical cystectomy is going to become rarer and rarer with the future with better combination therapies, systemically or differently. But I think it's often an unfair comparison, and uh, I wondered what you, your idea is, because radiation therapy is a local therapy. Cystectomy is a local therapy. Where the trimodal therapy has a gain on the local therapy is a systemic therapy that is added to it, which often in the, in the cystectomy world is not added to it. So I think, what would you think as a comparison? If you would do a fair trial, would be systemic therapy plus radical cystectomy versus tramol therapy. That would be a fair trial because the real events happen, local recurrence happens in 10 to 20%. The real failures happen distant. So 
do you think such a trial will be possible? We saw a spare trial is not possible. But the question for me is for Kilian and Anna, would you enroll in these trimolar therapies with the checkpoint inhibitors? Do you think that sustained effect of the, check, uh, of the checkpoint inhibitors will you know, allow more durable response? Where do you think the future will go from both of you? I, I think that uh, taking into consideration very promising results of immunotherapy, that trial designed with also uh, immunotherapy would be very, very interesting. And I think the results would be sustained. I mean, the thing is, I think also radiation therapy, trimodality therapy did change over the years. So we have a better local uh, therapy from the protocols. I think, as you mentioned it, also just uh, giving a radio sensitizer during radiation therapy isn't the game changer. It's still a local therapy. So we have to set basically the same standards. All patients should be eligible for a near adjuvant therapy. This might also change in the future. I mean, we have trials running in the perioperative setting, combination of immunotherapy plus minus chemotherapy, the same for patients who are ineligible for cisplatin-based neogen chemotherapy. And I think it's also up to us as urologists to take, again, this chance to run the trial because, I mean, it was driven by radio-oncologists and it basically failed because they didn't get the patients sent to. But I think the evidence is there. And I mean, radical cystectomy is also the gold standard without a randomized phase three trial, just because for historical reason, because it was the only option we had. So therefore, I think um, when you look at these large series and uh, the improved um, outcomes for TMT, we should definitely should go for another phase three trial and do it in a proper way, neogen chemotherapy, TMT versus radical cystectomy. But, but Kilian, there was a discussion on uh, secondary cancers in prostate cancer patients treated with radiation therapy. You have you have shown the trials with long term for a while, but with uh, excellent results. Are there any cases of secondary cancers, including rectal cancer, for example? No, I mean for sure there are. Yeah, I mean you have to be aware that any kind of radiation therapy can cause. But when you look also at our series, and it might be the bad series that included 75-year-old patients, it might be even the, the series that included patients who were 65, 67, in other words, those patients are still multimorbid, and most of them probably do not reach their secondary cancer. And that is different if you're talking about testicular cancer radiation therapy in young patients, because just the time to a secondary cancer with a, probably a delay of 10, 15, 20 years is probably too long for a patient with muscle invasive bladder cancer to actually experience that. One, one last question. So uh, very specific. You had one of the exclusion criteria extensive CIS. Can you give me a definition of what is extensive CIS? I've been struggling with that. And, and the second thing is, um, I think the quality of life and so outcomes, which are very important to patients, are very important. And for Anna Cech, it would be the question, also it relates to trimodal therapy, um, is the argument of foregoing, because this patient you showed is going to get a neobladder, right? Young, fit, and it's going to, if you give, uh, and you have a 13% savage cystectomy rate, but 15, 13 or 15 percent, or in other series, up to 30 percent of salvage cystectomies will forego the chance of having a nerve sparing neobladder. Is that an argument that also in quality of life argumentation? So, uh, these two questions. Yes, I also find this patient a perfect candidate for neobladder, and that's why I would uh, advocate this option because I think when we concern quality of life, we have some data, uh, relative, fresh data on quality of life after uh, radical cystectomy with neobladder. It's not 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 bad, and I would be really be afraid that if the patient chooses trimodal therapy, he will be after radiation, and then he will develop recurrence. Then surgical, we know as surgeons what surgical conditions do we have after radiotherapy, so that would definitely make the surgery salvage surgery uh, associated with more complications and probably exclude the patients from their sparing. Quickly coming to the question, what is extensive CIS? 
I think the thing is, that's what always comes up in these series. You have a marker. Uh, there are some data that basically just a small peritumor CIS definitely is not a game changer. If you have the entire bladder, also from the approach, because you always try to boost radiation therapy onto your primary tumor. So if you have an extensive CIS in the bladder now, you would have to take the entire bladder in the full dose protocol. So therefore, that is uh, one of the reasons why you probably will have an increased um, failure rate locally then uh, with the tumor progression. So therefore, extensive CIS, kind of like if you really have it everywhere in the bladder, that's what I would call extensive CIS in the setting. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we got excellent speeches about the topic bladder cancer. We got a very good discussion and the best we stay in time. Now the next session is going to start immediately with uh, kidney and adrenal cancer. Please. It's wonderful to be together. Um, it's um, a very pleasure and honor to see the full audience. The next session concerning kidney and adrenal cancer uh, is chaired by Professor Hanno Vajkovic, one of the leading urologists not only in Austria. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be together with you. My name is Peter Rosta. I'm a urologist from uh, Krakow, Poland. Uh, what is new for adrenal tumors? It's a talk uh, presented by Professor Mesut Ramsey. Uh, one of the greatest surgeon, not only laparoscopic, but also robotic. Um, as Tremzi is a leader in a minimally invasive surgery, uh, great uh, doctor and then a great surgeon and looking for the operation providing by uh, Professor Ramsey is a really, really big honor and a pleasure. Uh, Mesut, the floor is yours. Piotr, Haun, thank you very much. Um, it's a big, big honor to stay here. And uh, as I can see in Shark, I think you really did a good job in four weeks. This is incredible. And I think the quality increase year to year and everything is increasing. And we started, I think, six years ago with the Austrian-Polish meeting in Krakow with you, Piotr. And then it developed and developed. And this is great. Thank you very much that I have the opportunity to give this lecture. And my topic for today, which I will cover in the next 15 minutes, is what is new in adrenal tumors? Why do I talk about adrenal tumors? Uh, because um, we really uh, build a program for that, and um, we are dealing more and more with this topic, and I think it's important. The first thing, and this is an easy thing, is uh, I want to give you a few insights into the topic of incidentalomas. The incidentaloma is a finding of an adrenal tumor by chance due to an imaging procedure, um, which pr primarily has no symptoms. And what we, what we know is that not all incidentalomas are automatically insignificant. And this is very important. 20% of them are endocrine active, 80% are not. So all the incidentalomas should have a hormonal evaluation. And what we do also know is that size matters. If the size is very low, very low means lower than four centimeter, the chance that it's malignant is only 2%. But this does not mean that they cannot be hormone active because there are also benign tumors which are hormone active. If the size increases and if it's more than six centimeters, the chance that it's malignant is going to one quarter already. The prevalence of these incidental numbers is very high. We know that in octogenarians, for example, the prevalence is already 10%. So on average, so if you do 100 CT scans in your hospital a day, you will see, will see each day three incidental omas, and you need to know what to do. And uh, maybe you as a urologist or the endocrine surgeon will confront it with that or the endocrinologist. However, who is doing it has to use the new guidelines, 
in the enzyme guidelines show that the aim in this NC dentalomas is at first sight to give a definitive diagnosis. So this is no strategy to say, okay, we found it, we do a CT scan in three, six, 12 months, whenever. So the, uh, the aim is to check it now. So no further controls are necessary in adenomas, which are hormone inactive. And this is the goal to get it. But how can we do it? The first thing is we need to know what kind of imaging. As I told you, the most of the incidentalomas are found by chance by CT abdomen. The CT abdomen per se has no uh, native uh, non-contrast CT face in it. So it's mainly based with a contrast. So you don't have that. But if you want to know if it's an adenoma, the first thing, just go like a stone CT, a non-contrast CT. You measure the Hounsfield units. If the Hounsfield units are less than 10, then it's an adenoma for sure. This is clear. It has to, of course, it has to be homogeneous and it has to be small, less than four centimeters, because as we heard, these are also risk factors for malignant disease. But then you can be sure it's an adenoma. Then you check for the hormone treatment. You do it by yourself. Or you send it somewhere else. And if it's negative, it's done. And the patient does not have any control ever for that anymore. And this is important. If it's not clear by the non-contrast CT, like you see here in, in this tumor, yeah, it has 15 Hounsfield units in the non-contrast, then you should go for a uh, contrast CT or alternatively for an MRI with chemical shift or alternatively for an FDG PET, but we will come to that later. And if you normally you go for a CT scan and then you look for the washout phase. There we, we have an absolute washout and we have a relative washout. And if the washout is more than 60%, the absolute one or the relative more than 40%, it's clear it's an adenoma. It's done. Clear diagnosis. If it's not clear, you have these alternatives. So if it's still unclear, you can do further imaging. MRI, FDG, PET. You can say, okay, I do a control in six to 12 months because it was unclear, or you can opt for an operation. And in the guidelines, all three options are equal. So all three options are um, a valid option to go for uh, uh, further uh, treatment or evaluation. The biopsy has a minor role. It's only in rare indication mainly in patients who had an other malignancy in their history and you want to rule out that this is metastasis. But if you go and opt for, um, for, for a biopsy, you have to rule out pheochromocytoma upfront. This is very important. Otherwise, you can go into crisis when you put the needle in and this can be a life-threatening complication. If it's still, well, if it's suspicious, Suspicious means if it's not a clear adenoma, everything is suspicious. If it increases over time, so if you take option two, imaging control after six to 12 months and then it has an increase in size, or if it's uh, larger than four centimeter, then we have a suspicious lesion and you should opt for um, surgery. So this is the first topic I want to cover and the main message is, so do it at the first sight get the evaluation done and tell the patient no further controls. The second thing I want to cover is a complex of PPGL, which means pheochromosotoma and pyroganglioma complex. We know these are um, tumors which uh, produce uh, metanephrine, which uh, give hypertension and all the, the problems. And this is a clearly lesion, a surgical lesion, if you find that and it's potential malignant. And this is something we need to know. And this is something we have to face with. So if it's potential malignant, what are the factors which can say, okay, it's the chance that it's malignant, it's clear. The definitive diagnosis can only be done if you find metastasis. So as long as there are no metastasis, it's potential malignant. Even there's no clinical sign to predict that. So if he has more hypertension, he has more symptoms, it does not mean anything. Yeah? 
we know that you need a very good Europa, uh, Europatologist to give you the scores, the pass score and the gap score. I will come to that a little bit later. But this has to be scored. So it's very important that you have a specific Europatologist who is uh, dealing with adrenals and give you the scores. Of course, as we already heard, size matters. So if it's larger than five, this is a cutoff coming out from the literature. So it has uh, more malignant uh, probability. And of also the uh, uh, proliferation index, the ki 67 index, and the cutoff is 3%. So again, the europatologist is very important. He has to measure it and give it to you. And also if he has a somato, uh, somatostatin mutation into the tumor, which also given you by the uh, europatologist. So the histology should give you three things. It cannot tell you if it's malignant or benign. It's impossible to say it, but you can have risk factors. The first is the ki 67 index and the mutation. This is a report how we get it in our department. It's in German, of course. But you see they have all the stainings for chromogranin A, which is also marker for ACC and so on. And what they give you is the ki 67 proliferation rate in the hotspots. So in this one was 2.5, and they give you the mutation HDHA and B expression. And this is something you need to know, because if you have this mutation, then the chance for malignancy is uh, much more increasing. And it also has an impact on your imaging and on your uh, uh, evaluation for the patient later. What, is, what are the scores? The two scores are the pass score like you can see here, it's, uh, it can has 20 points, and as uh, higher the number goes, as more uh, chance is that it's malignant. What they test is um, the growth um, of the nest, the cellularity, uh, if it has an extension in the adipose tissue, vascular invasion, capsular invasion, and so on. And then at the end you get the score, and then the second score is the GAP score. It's a grading system for adrenal pheochromosotomas and paragangliomas. And there uh, you should look at this uh, HE staining, and then you should look for this uh, tell button uh, where you see um, and score. At the end, this is a, a scale, and this is validated. Uh, if it's very low, which means 0 to 3, then you have a low chance for malignancy. If it's going higher from four to six, then it's moderate. If it's seven or above, then the probability is very high. In the gap score, there's also a score of 10. So zero and two is well differentiated. Three to six is high and seven to 10 is very high. And this is something you need to know. And if it's uh, increasing, so everything above three, is a high probability of a malignant tumor, and you have to do a follow-up. You have to monitor the patients yeah, uh, for a long period. The second thing I want to discuss with you in this in this group, in the pheochromosotomas and paragangliomas, and this is an ongoing discussion right now, do all patients really need a preoperative systemic pharmacological treatment, which means mainly an alpha blockage before? This is in all the guidelines, you see that this is standard and it's recommended to improve uh, the blood volume and the blood pressure control to um, protect you from the catastrophic effects with, uh, which can also cause mortality, which means uh, severe hypertension or stress cardiomyopathy. Historically, the mortality rate was up to 40%. But nowadays, due to major uh, um, better management by the anesthesiologists and endocrinologists and better medications we have, the mortality rate is less than 1%. So the rationale for alpha blockers is clear. They uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine uh, docks to the alpha receptors and they cause vasoconstriction, then you get this hypertension. It's, I think this is clear. But controversies are uh, very high because um, when you treat them with the alpha blockers, especially when you do the unselective fen phenoxybenzamine, uh, or you go more for the selective like doxazosine, which we use more. And I, I don't know in, if in every country phenoxybenzamine is still available. In Austria, we don't have it anymore. 
Um, then you have the problems with orthostatic and all the complication you cause by alpha blockers. It prolongs surgery because you need two weeks upfront, and so on and so on. And so uh, the calcium channel blockers are more and more coming into this field because they have a much better tolerance for the patient to control um, the preoperative uh, management. So mainly you have to give fluids and you give alpha blockers. And as I said, if you take this unselected one, the phenoxybenzamine, you start with two uh, 10 milligrams two times a day, and then you increase till you have one milligram per kilogram uh, of the body weight. But it has a very high incidence of reflex tachycardia. Then you have to go for better blockers, and, and you need the internal doctors all the time. You have this nasal congestion, which is very uh, um, bothering the patients. And the mo biggest problem for us surgeons is they have a long postoperative period of hypertension. They need intensive care. They need catecholamine postoperative and this can take days and it's annoying and um, this is why you better go for selective alpha blockers like doxorzine. We all know, we are all aware for, for BPA treatment also, they have a short half-life. You start with a low dose and then you go to the maximum of 60 milligram and it has less side effects and it's much easier to handle during surgery and postoperative. <laughs> These are the lists of what you can do, alpha blockers, but you have also the calcium channel blockers or other medication which are ongoing. And the third thing I want to discuss with you, and this is the last thing, is the imaging in this pheochromatotomas and paragangliomas. What is imaging? We have this classic imaging, and this is a CT with contrast. We all know sensitivity is not too bad, specificity is okay, with 70 to 80 uh, percent, and um, what we also know, they can be homogeneous or they can be heterogeneous. They can be solid. They can be cystic. So it's uh, it's hard. This is a uh, an example for a silent pheochromocytoma. Silent means that the hormonal workup didn't show anything, but at the end it was a pheochromocytoma. And what you see, they have a, a really vascularity inside. They have uh, the contrast washout is less than 60%. It has a high signal in T2, uh, which is bright and uh, can have different shapes. All these uh, three uh, examples are all phreochromocytomas. This is a very small one with uh, 34 Hansfeld units. And when you look at the washout, this is the criteria we had. This was the pheo. This was the pheochromocytoma with calcification at the end. And this was a pheochromocytoma, and it looked like that. So this is, this is you cannot be sure if this is always like this. You have this bright on MRI, but this is not always the sign. So it's not so easy to go only for imaging and say it's a pheochromocytoma. As I told you, MRI is an alternative. Typically, it's very bright. You have to compare it with the liver. Yeah, then you see it's a bright lightning, then it's a sign for pheochromosotoma, but you cannot be sure that it's pheochromosotoma. But you, when you see that, it's pretty sure. But if it's not, it does not exclude pheochromosotoma. But, and this is important now, and this is the main message from the imaging, is if you go for staging and it's potential malignant uh, tumor, then the CT and MRI has a sensitivity of only 57%. So it's not good anymore. And this is why you have to go for functional imaging. Historically, you go for an MIBG scan, but this is already done, I think. It's because it's already showed that it's uh, not so good like FDG PET or DOPA PET. So in whom do you take what? This is the question you are dealing with. So both options are good if you have a, a paraganglioma, if you, when you look for metastasis, and when you have an, a mutation in the somatostatin uh, um, uh, cascade. If you already have metastasis known and you do have to need follow up for the chemotherapy treatment, then FDG PET is uh, better. If you find, and this is the most common thing we are dealing as urologists, if you have a sporadic pheochromocytoma, 
in, in the smaller lesion, which means less than five centimeter, then the DOPA pet is much better than the DOTA pet. This is something you need to know. In the overall, the DOTA, which means it's a, it's a somatostatin uh, analog, uh, so DOTA TATE, DOTA NOC, or DOTA TOC, outperforms all the modalities. So in all the recent meta analyses it showed it's much better than the other ones. Especially if you have mutations, then you have to go for this. What does it mean? You have the radionuclide, uh, then you have a chelator, and then you have the somatostatin analog, and depending on what you get, octreotide, octreotate, or uh, naf octreotide, then it's called dota toc, dota tate, dota noc. And this is, uh, you have to discuss with your um, nu uh, nuclear medicine doctor. And again, here, it depends on what kind of tumor do you have, if you have a mutation or not. If it's adrenal or extra adrenal, you go for DOPA, or you go for FDG PET. So yeah, you need to be specialized on that, that you know, especially the uh, evaluation. And if it's metastasis, you can use it also for terranostic, but I will not cover that. So in summary, there are the main messages. Incidentalomas should be elevated, evaluated and categorized at the first site. Follow-up is one out of the three options, only if it remains unclear. In the paraganglioma and pheochromosatoma should be treated in specialized centers because it's the major force to do correct the preoperative evaluation, the preoperative medical treatment, the imaging, and the histology. And at the end, systemic preoperative medication with alpha protocols are in discussion, but should only be skipped in experienced centers after interdisciplinary discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mesut, thank you for an excellent lecture. Um, there is uh, some questions from audience. There is, if not, I have the one, um, the first question. Mesut, based on your surgical experience, what are your shortly tips and tricks during the laparoscopic or the robotic adrenal surgery? There is uh, some uh, tips you would like to recommend for the adepts. I see. To go laparoscopic or robotic yeah. re mainly remains on, on the imaging you have up front. If it's a localized tumor and has no uh, adhesions to the next, the most important thing is you get a negative margin. And I prefer the direct approach. So um, I go really um, directly to the adrenal. If you have a pheochromosotoma, you have to deal first with the vein. This is very important that uh, you get no storm of, uh, of uh, metanephrine. During the surgery, you have to talk to the anesthesiologist. I think this is very important. And if you think of ACC, it's also wise sometimes just to skip laparoscopic minimal and go for open surgery to be safer. Thank you very much once again for an excellent lecture. Thank you, Mesa. <laughs> we are moving from adrenal to kidney, and I have a great pleasure to introduce Milan Hora, great friend, great surgeon coming from Czech Republic, and he will discuss with us the cytoreductive kidney surgery, and it's interesting because something changed after coming, and I will see your point of view. Thank you, Milan. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, many years ago, uh, uh, faculty of Central European meeting decided uh, to introduce young guys for, for these lectures, uh, uh, and for especially for these lectures was invited Dr. Travincek from our department under age of 40. Unfortunately, he's busy because this was organized so quick. So I have to replace him, so sorry. <laughs> so what's new in cytoreductive nephrectomy in 2022? We used in TKI era, uh, introduced in 2006, uh, data from uh, uh, cytokines. It means uh, two, two trials uh, published 2001. And uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy was uh, part of treatment of metastatic renal cancer. But to be honest, it was indicated only in about one set of cases. But uh, our habits completely uh, were changed thanks to new two randomized clinical trials, Sertam and Carmena. Probably you know both of them. First one, which was run by Axel Bex, 
It's uh, from Germany in origin, working in Amsterdam, now is moving to the London, uh, vice chairman of guidelines group of RCCA. Better results with deferred cytorenephrectomy. It means to start systemic treatment and nephrectomy in a good uh, response three months later. But really crucial uh, cytorenective nephrectomy was Carmena, introduced by uh, French guys. And we know from uh, this trial, sunitinib alone was not inferior to cytoreductive nephrin sunitinib. It means we can omit uh, the cytoreductive nephrectomy and start uh, systemic treatment immediately following biopsy. But, but by this data should be cytoreductive nephrectomy excluded. But it's not really true. Why? I will show you some some uh, new data. First one, uh, updated of Carmena 2021. It's shown clearly that patient with only one MADC risk factors have some advantage of cytoreductive nephrectomy. Unfortunately, it's not reason why it's not involved in guidelines. Second one, patient indicated for secondary cytoreductive nephrectomy in Carmena trial a significant long next reason why to think of 2022 as about 40% of patients suffer from local symptoms and these patients are indicated for nephrectomy as well. Of course, it's not uh, called cytoreactive nephrectomy, it's palliative nephrectomy, but results is the same. 40% is important. CC, of course, it's very uh, difficult to organize trials with uh, less common histopathological uh, diagnosis, especially papillary RCC. For papillary RCC, we have only retrospective data showing us that cytoreactive nephrectomy is a good option as well. Uh, here is conclusion of uh, our guidelines group, EAU 2022. You see it's a, a big group with uh, not only urologists, even with medical oncologists, Lawrence Albiges, Tom Pauls, and so on. If you want to uh, get a summary review, you can download uh, last week published 2022 version of uh, RCC guidelines. Of recommendations, this guidelines group. Here is a summary from my point of view. If you have patient with pure risk, never perform cytoreductive nephrectomy. But you can, uh, you can perform uh, delayed uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy, but we don't have data supporting uh, this decision. And where is uh, now indicated cytoreductive nephrectomy? That are relatively rare cases. First one, if patient is not indicated for systemic treatment, and second one, it's probably more common if you have chance to remove all metastasis. It means single metastasis or oligometastatic disease. Uh, these patients are exception indicated for immediate cytoreductive nephrectomy. But as I said, we miss some important data. First one, we don't know how to deal with patient with systemic treatment and deferred cytoreductive nephrectomy. And second one, uh, do we have to change our habits in era of immunotherapy? Because uh, Carmena uh, deals uh, with uh, TKI, but you know well that uh, now it's introduced a new era, a new, new, uh, new category of drugs, immunotherapy. So we don't have up-to-date uh, data from high quality trials, uh, three or four, Trials are ongoing. You, you see here Nordic Sun Probe, Adapter, and Cytoshrink. But we have to wait for results for many years. But even in uh, these two questions, we have already some, some answers based especially on retrospective uh, databases analysis. First one, you see well, if you compare deferred cytoreductive nephrectomy by this uh, retrospective. Uh, uh, data, you see uh, real uh, 
improvement of uh, survival in patient with uh, cytoreactive nephrectomy deferred. Uh, second uh, analysis showing that uh, we have to change our uh, decision not to remove kidney before uh, uh, systemic treatment is uh, this trial. And you see that cytoreactive nephrectomy combined with immunotherapy, it means with new drugs, has uh, advantage uh, comparing with, uh, with uh, immunotherapy only. So here is conclusion for 2022 for our clinical practice. Very rarely it's indicated in a patient with pure risk disease. Upfront, it needs immediate cytoreductive nephrectomy only in favorable uh, disease who are not candidate for systemic treatment, only for active surveillance or patient with chance to remove all metastasis. And uh, important part in our clinical uh, practice are patients with symptomatic disease. It's up to 40 percentage. And deferred cytoreductive nephrectomy it's uh, indicated for patient with good answer to systemic treatment. So thank you very much. Milan, thank you very much. That you also saved some time. That was important. But if there are any questions from auditorium? Then I will ask you something. Um, when you analyze the Carvana data, you you will see, as everybody as everybody knows, that uh, data are not really po population based. We have much more worse, worse, worse tumors in that data set. And how now you inter in interpret that or how do you think that we should really make clinical decision not to perform a cytoreductive nephrectomy if we know that the data set is not, is not that representative? Why, why do we think that we should do it? What is the rationale behind it? Because data are not. Uh, I, I will go uh, back to the decision of guidelines group uh, because we discuss uh, all biases of this trial. It was clearly said, we have only Carmena. We know that there are a lot of disadvantages, a lot of biases, but we don't have better trial. If we want to show that Carmena, it's not the, uh, the best trial with the, uh, with the uh, reality uh, results, you have to organize next one, but we don't have better trial. So we have to strictly follow Carmena, but you are right. Uh, uh, it's a huge space to, to discuss if really not indicate cytoreductive nephrectomy. I think in a clear, uh, uh, in, in a real clinical practice, it's indicated more commonly than is recommended in guidelines. And as, as I showed you, we have a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, trials supporting our decision to indicate cytoreductive nephrectomy even in 2022. Thank you, Ivan. Very nice presentation, Milan. Congratulations. Are there any recommendation for artery embolization and then start systematic therapy and then cytoreductive uh, ra radical nephrectomy? We don't have high quality data uh, dealing with uh, with uh, this option. So you don't have any data? Thank only you. only in symptomatic disease, especially hematuria, but not data dealing with this one. But it was, uh, you are right, uh, it, it was uh, broadly discussed in the guidelines group, this question. Milan, thanks a lot. We will move, thank you. We will move to oncology now. It, it, there is a, some small change in the program. Dr. Tordai will not come because he, he, he gets sick. Uh, we will switch to his talk first online as a, as a film. I'm looking at the technique. Christoph, if that is possible, Man Manuela, Manuela will come as the second, but, but the introduction will still do Dr. Arman, Al Arman Ali Mohammadi from our clinic. To, to just introduce you to the case which will be discussed between two oncologists, IO, IO versus IO, TKI, Manuela and Dr. Torda. Afterward, first, Al Arman Ali Mohammadi. I'm just doing this one because I know this is your first, first international talk in your life, and I'm with you. Good morning, colleagues, chairman. My name is Ali Mohammadi. I'm a junior resident at the Medical University of Vienna. 
The topic of this session is the challenge the expert first line for metastatic RCC should be IO-IO or IO-TKI combination. I'm going to present you a case of a 60 years old male patient. He had a nephrectomy in August 2012. The histology showed a clear cell RCC. The patient had a good uh, uh, performance status with an ECOG zero. The Leibovitz risk score was two, so the probability of a 10 years uh, metastasis free survival was approximately 92 months. So the patient was disease free until December 2017. Then in the CT scan, uh, suspicious uh, pancreatic lesions were found, so we performed a biopsy. The histology showed metastasis of a clear cell RCC. So in January 2018, we performed a partial pancreatectomy. Afterwards, for approximately one year, the patient was uh, uh, disease-free, sorry. And in December 2018, he had a recurrence of a pancreatic lesion. Uh, the histology again showed a metastasis of a clear cell RCC. So in January 2019, we discussed the therapeutic options with the patient. First, a local treatment with, for example, cyber knife therapy. Second, an operation, but only if an enucleation is possible to avoid a development of an IDDM. Or third, a, sys a systemic therapy, for example, with a TKI. Uh, the patient decided to go for a local treatment, in this case for cyber knife uh, treat treatment. Afterwards, he was again uh, disease-free till uh, October 2020. In his staging, he had then multiple liver metastases and also a local recurrence. So in November 2020, the decision of the tumor board was uh, to go for a systemic treatment. Uh, we have a patient with a clear cell uh, met metastasized R RCC with uh, abdominal meds. According to the IMDC risk category, he was intermediate risk with one risk factor, thrombocytosis. So we start with an IO-IO combination with Nevo EPS first line. Uh, after two cycles, the patient had side effects, for example, hyperthyroidism, uh, asthenia, and diarrhea. So we decided to go on with uh, one cycle Nevo Mono. Af after this, in his staging in January 21, he has a progressive disease with new lung meds and also a progress of his liver meds. So we then changed to second line cabozantinib and maintenance treatment with Nevo. After three months uh, in the CT, uh, the CT showed that he has a partial response of his abdominal mats and a complete response of his lung mats. In the next stagings in July 21 and also in the most recent one in uh, January 22, he had ongoing partial response. So what is the best option for a metastasized RCC patient? Is it a uh, first line IO-IO combination or an IO-TKI uh, combination. Thank you very much. Arman, thanks a lot. Thank you. We will try to start the movie from Dr. Tordai. Let's see if it works. If not, Manu, you will have to talk for both. First of all, I would like to say a huge thank to the organizing committee to inviting me to this lecture because uh, presenting with uh, Manuela in the same section is like to be in the paradise. Unfortunately, I'm not able to attend personally because a nice Eastern European airway virus just knocked me out and I'm not able to uh, be there. To answer the question raised, we should put together the information what we have. This patient has a pancreas only metastasis in the beginning, and uh, he was treat he or she was treated uh, having uh, an oligometastatic disease uh, with local regional management. That's it, it is a very feasible approach, I guess. And uh, unfortunately, after that, the disease had been transformed into a more aggressive form. 
with multiple uh, organ involvement, accelerated growth, and this resulted in attitude change uh, because we had to initiate a systemic therapy. But uh, the patient has still low tumor burden with no bone metastasis, with IMDC intermediate risk with one risk factor. Unfortunately, no important histological features and no important genetic features has been provided. Uh, we don't have information about the probably important medical history, concomitant diseases, and medications. Uh, MRCC patients, one of the most important tasks to uh, define the prognostic criteria of the patient regarding the, to the IMDC criteria. NCCN guidelines gives us uh, treatment uh, options according to the risk uh, classification, and it seems to be that uh, poor and intermediate risk patients has to be treated uh, with uh, uh, combination chemotherapy and probably cabozantinib. The category one recommendations includes three IOTKI and one IOIO combinations. This combination based on the fact that only four to define which is the best we have credible data only regarding the ITT population. If we see the factors which can affect the OS data, we can see that uh, it seems to be that the overall response rate is uh, better for IOTKI uh, studies. The complete remission rates are pretty much the same, but it's very important to note that uh, Ipinivo combination has uh, the highest uh, rate of uh, primary progressive disease. Here is the graphical interpretation of the previous data. So putting together everything, IOTKI combo seems to have better overall response rate with lower rate of could be at least partially due to the effect uh, on the good risk population. It seems to be that IOTKI combo is uh, producing a better NPFS and uh, more efficacious tyrosine kinase inhibitors used producing better MPFS values. Regarding the MOS, a couple of data are missing, but uh, uh, the range of hazard ratios and the landmark 12-month uh, OS are pretty much in the same range. Graphical interpretation can be seen here. With OS results are somewhere in the same range. The next question is that do we have Sometimes yes, sometimes not. It seems to be that overall response rate is uh, better for IOTKI combos, while uh, the complete emissions rate are pretty much in the same range. It's really hard to judge the MPFS values. as well as the 
MOS values because the data reporting is not consistent. Consistent, probably the 12 years OS values uh, can guide us in the decision. But putting together everything due to inconsistent data reporting, it's very hard to draw a valuable conclusion. So this is one of the most striking results of the EPNIVO study uh, that uh, somewhere around 36% of the patients are benefiting from the treatment after four years by the improving hazard ratio. It could happen that we are going out of time. Er, Sharok, Manu, are you ready to ramble? Then I would stop and please let the same you let you can be seen. Yeah. We stop, thank you. Manuela, please, if you could maybe a short a sh you cannot, please do a favor just to, to let us understand why no and why yes. Otherwise you could win. As the chair wishes, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and Laszlo has already shown you the guidelines and the currently available treatment strategies. And as you know, we have plenty of options in the first line setting. We have IO three different IOTKI combinations and we have one IO doublet, which I really like and I'm going to advocate for today. And all of these strategies have shown a significant benefit in overall survival. And we know that these benefits in OS are driven by what we call a robust response from our immune system to fight this enemy. This is a summary of the, of the recent updates of the outcomes from these four trials. And of course, we are attracted by numbers. We are attracted by numbers provided by IOTKI combinations. When we see a PFS of 24 months, an OR rate of 70%, as shown for the CLEAR trial with lenvatinib um, pembrolizumab, of course we are attracted. But this is the danger that it lies in the cross-trial comparison because we need to be aware, for example, that the CLEAR trial had significantly less poor risk patients and a pretty high number number of favorable risk patients. And also because the follow-up is very short when compared to the IO doublet, we actually don't know what is the meaning of such a high response rate. I mean, response is only relevant when it's long lasting. And this is something that we simply don't know after such a short median follow-up. Today, in fact, the question is not which treatment is better. The question is which treatment is suitable for which patient. And we need to answer the question, the most relevant question is what is the underlying immune escape mechanism in our individual patient that is sitting in front of, in front of us? Are there no antigens? Is the antigen presentation impaired? Is the trafficking or the infiltration of the activated T lymphocyte impaired? Um, so there are plenty of options that can be, uh, be relevant. And this is something that we should eventually uh, try to answer these questions to better know which treatment is best. The truth about the choice IOIO versus IOTKI is we are in fact discussing a minority of treatment options for a problem that is so much bigger because of these various uh, immune escape mechanisms. So many other uh, mechanisms may be relevant and many other therapeutics may be relevant that are, by the way, currently under investigation, such as HDAC inhibitors, stromal disruptors, epigenetic regulators, agents that re, um, reprogram the macrophages, microbiome manipulators, and so on. So what are the major differences when we compare IOIO and IOTKI? First, early responses, as shown by Laszlo, are more common with IOTKI. 
However, long-term responses, and this I would like to remind you, is a minimal requirement for cure. And this is not this is the this is what we actually should go for. What this should be our main target. This was so far only shown for IO doublets because they have the this study has the longest follow-up. And when we just indirectly compare the survival curves of IOTKI and IO doublet um, uh, studies, mm -hmm. we can see that the tail of the curve, in fact, is higher for the IO doublet. Which factors do we need to consider when choosing IO doublets? Don't choose the wrong patient for an IO doublet. And the patient you have seen earlier was not the right patient for an IO doublet. Does time matter is a question that you need to ask. Has the patient a metastasis in a very critical site or size? Are there obvious factors that would, in the tumor microenvironment, that would hinder a response, that would hinder T lymphocyte? Is there a subgroup that is likely to derive a tremendous benefit? Can we increase the likelihood of response? How important is the duration of response with respect, for example, to the patient's age? What is the role of toxicities? So don't choose it for the wrong patient. If time matters, Laszlo is absolutely right. The PFS rate, uh, the primary progression rate is higher for the IO doublet than for IO TKIs. If the patient has inflammation, and you remember this patient had thrombocytosis, if you have signs from the tumor microenvironment that there is inflammation, thrombocytosis, neutrophilia, don't go for IO doublets. This patient has a myeloid gene signature most likely in his tumor microenvironment and will not benefit because of myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Is there a subgroup that is likely to derive a tremendous benefit uh, is another, another question that you need to ask to answer when you think of IO doublets. And in fact, there is. nivo EP is probably the best thing that ever happened for patients with sarcomatoid features. We have recently seen the five-year minimum follow-up for this subgroup of patients. And you can see that the CR rate in these patients goes up to 25%. And if you combine sarcomatoid plus PDL1 positivity, P PFS and overall survival has not been reached today, this is a tremendous, tremendous uh, impact for our patients. Can we increase the likelihood of response to IO doublets? We can. We have seen very nice data at ASCO um, this year showing that you, when man manipulating the microbiome with, for example, Clostrid Clostridium butyricum, you can really increase the response rate and you can increase, you can double progression-free survival. How important is the duration of response? Well, I think this is what I uh, mentioned earlier. Response rate is only relevant when you can demonstrate a long duration of response. And this is something that we know from the IO doublet, and we have no clue about this from IO TKI combinations for the moment. Look at this survival curve for patients with intermediate and poor risk who received nivolumab, ipilimumab, and who responded to the treatment. The median has not been reached after such a long observation period. And in fact, it, they also have um, calculated the what they call the conditional survival outcomes, meaning the probability of remaining in response at specific landmarks. And they clearly showed that after three, two, five years, that if you are in response, if you achieve a response, the likelihood to remain in response increases with time. What about toxicity? IO doublets mean that you avoid chronic TKI toxicity. And the doublet, I'd like to remind you, is given four times, then you are very smooth on the NIVO maintenance. You fear the toxicity of ipilimumab? Well, dose and frequency uh, is related, um, of EP appears to, relate, to be related to toxicity. And we have seen at ESMO, the PRISM trial, there are other ways to deliver ipilimumab, for example, every 12 weeks with less toxicity and the same efficacy. And also, um, yes, it's true, immune-related adverse events are more common with IO doublets than with IO TKI. However, I'd like to remind you in this context that the development of an immune-related adverse event is clearly associated and predictive for improved outcomes.
So take home message, IO doublets target two major immune escape mechanisms, impaired antigen presentation and T cell apoptosis. Unprecedented response duration and survival if selected for the right patient. Not all patients benefit, but not all patients benefit from uh, IOTKIs. And this is the bionic study, actually, that very nicely demonstrated this. We have, based on a specific molecular gene, signature different subtypes of patients and tumors. And there are patients who have what we call an immune low signature. They only need one single agent nivolumab. We have patients who have the so-called immune, this immune low needs the doublet, immune high only pdl one inhibition. And if the patient has a pro-angiogenic signature, you may even not need any um, IO treatment. Second, IOTKI is a decision that is easy to make. Everyone can choose IOTKI, but you may miss this unique opportunity of a long-term response. If you choose, in contrast, an IO doublet, that means you have made this extra mile to closely look at the biology of the tumor to try to understand the individual tumor microenvironment behavior. It means that you have selected a treatment rather than just picked one out of this, of this box. You have made a step toward personalized medicine despite the lack of predictive markers. You spare the patient long-term TKI toxicity. You trust, in fact, in the beauty of the cancer immunity cycle and the power of the T lymphocyte. Your vision is long-term survival, and your vision is cure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Questions? Dr. Todd, I decide not to come to ask you something. Nobody is asking you here something. I think you're an authority here. Manuela, thank you, thank you. I will not ask you something. I will just tell you I'm really happy that you're working with us, that you brought us to a next level in the, in the kidney cancer. She's a urologist now, you know. Thank you. Thank you for everything, Manuela. <laughs> Maestro, I think you ordered us a coffee break now, or? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the speakers for the first two sessions, bladder cancer and kidney cancer and adrenal hot uh, topics, hot uh, debates, and interesting subject. Thank you very much to you all to being here, specifically those that I remember. I've seen you yesterday night at the bar, and you're still here this morning with open eyes despite two liters of coffee. Uh, thank you. We're going to have a coffee break, 15 minutes, sharp back on time. We are sure we have bad weather today, so you're going to be inside today. Uh, so you. let's meet back again at uh, 10.45, because we're going to have at 10.45 the ESU course with Gert de Miller and Arnold Stenzel. Please be, be, uh, be back.
Dear friends and colleagues, I know that you love the breaks. Thank you so much uh, uh, for the first two sessions. They were really amazing and uh, entertaining and enriching. Um, as you know, the Central European meeting was uh, really started as part of the regional office. Regional office was an idea to really uh, enchant and involve and engage what was back in time considered the new world for Western Europe that was Eastern Europe uh, and Eastern uh, Europe, including the Central European uh, meeting part of that. As time has evolved, it's, it's been clear to the EAU that this region has really achieved and gained what it needed to prosper and become equal partners. And so the Central European meeting has evolved in a wonderful partnership that is the second stage in a relationship where we are uh, in a partnership with the EAU, organizing through the regional partners, the national societies, this meeting, but keeping a close contact and close partnership and interaction with our mother association that we are all member in, that is the European Association of Urology. So um, this, in this new version, we have the ESU course, uh, and we are more than lucky that not only to have a prostate cancer session as part in, integrated into the ESU course, but having two of the most wonderful uh, uh, people in European urology and worldwide urology being their lecturers. One of them, Gerda Miller, is a, a guy that has really reached out from the radiation world to the urology world and has been such a wonderful partner and, and colleague um, teaching us um, and being not only in an education world, but in a scientific world, but also in a partnership world um, between radiation oncologists and urologists. And you know, this interdisciplinarity is very important. Um, Gert is wonderful that he came. And uh, um, the head of the course is uh, Arnold Stenson, who is, you know, uh, somebody nobody needs to introduce, has had many positions, not only the meeting, uh, the EAU meeting in itself that he organized, uh, chairman in, in Tübingen. I personally, met Arnold Schenzer the first time when I was a little student in uh, Baylor College of Medicine. And everybody, when I was a little student, was exciting because Arnold Stenzel is coming to Baylor, and that was over 25 years ago, and he gave a wonderful talk. And since then, I've been a, a, not only an aficionado, a groupie, I would say, of Arnold, and uh, stay remain a groupie of him. So I'm very excited because Arnold has the capacity, you know, as an oncologist, not only a, a very knowledgeable in bladder cancer, which is the area he's the most known with, for, but he's also in prostate cancer and other cancers. And he's really gonna give us not only the lecture part with Gert on the ESU course, but he's gonna give also the EAU lecture at the end of the day and give us a vision of the future. Thank you very much for being with us and sharing this afternoon with us. Thank you. Uh, that's, <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Sharok, for being uh, giving such a nice introduction. It's always very nice, you know, it feels so well when you hear somebody else talk about you and miss all the bad points. Uh, but uh, it's a really pleasure to be here. Um, you could see, actually, I'm a child of this area, uh, raised and born in Austria. That's what my bike says. And that's what uh, is actually, they put it up for me, I guess. Uh, but um, I uh, uh, did move north with regards to my current job, and I moved south with the topic today. So, uh, Gert uh, uh, is going to join, or not going to join, we're going to chair this session, and we'll start right away. Okay. And uh, I'll give a little bit of a PR yeah. of the European School of Urology, and then I'll do a little bit about the, the uh, guidelines, yeah. and then you come in and okay. we switch okay. one after the other, yep. okay? Um, now, uh, my uh, first uh, aim is a little bit to talk a little bit about the European School of Rheology. It will be short, but just uh, we, we need in these times, uh, we need to uh, really see what uh, we do have in Europe that we have, that we are as a urologist, uh, not only organized in a national way, but also in a European way. This is important. It's getting more and more important, especially when Brussels uh, starts uh, deciding about 
certain things, which also affects urology. So one of the things is, you know, we are 19 or 18,000 plus. That goes fast. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, that um, we uh, do uh, actually form a, a group, a sizable group within the European Cancer Organization. I'm in the board of the Cancer Organization, which is based in Brussels, and the European Association of Urology, and thus the urologists are a very strong uh, uh, group within this uh, European Cancer Organization. Now, um, what shall I do? I... <laughs> Okay, yeah, but it's uh, it should be yeah. I'll... Okay, now two hundred uh, faculty tutors uh, uh, experts are actually part of the European School of Urology. Uh, we are all evaluated every year. We do online education within this uh, the School of Urology e courses, webinars, as you can see here. Uh, you, these are free webinars. Make uh, use of that. Take part in them, and uh, you can also, uh, when you become a member, you can also download the guidelines. You can take, but not only part, you can take part in hands-on training. And we do have, for example, in Berlin, the Berlin Skills Teaching Group. You can do that. We are doing national societies like Czech, Serbia, Romania, Slovakia, uh, many countries uh, uh, where you come from. We have done our courses. Uh, we come when you uh, invite us. And and uh, we do have the scholarship program. I think that's very important. Yeah? We need to exchange people between uh, the uh, your countries and countries uh, in other parts of Europe where they may be more advanced. And you have the advantage of being very knowledgeable in surgery, for example, uh, open surgery. So there is a possibility to interconnect. And that's uh, how you can, uh, that was really fast. I know I only had five minutes, but uh, really what, what I want, want to tell you, the school is something where we focus within the European Association of Urology in education. Make use of it. It's, most of it is free. And it's, uh, most of it is really valuable, the latest you can get. I know we all fed up with, uh, with uh, webinars and, and, and online uh, teaching. But on the other hand, you know, instead of going somewhere which costs money, sometimes this is where you get free. You can do it in the evening. Yeah? And uh, if it's an hour or two, that's makeable. It's like Netflix, you know, 90 minutes per series. Yeah, So you can make instead of after three Netflix series, you can have one series of European School of Urology. Just uh, make use of that. Then um, thank you very much uh, for allowing me to uh, address a little bit upon the European School of Urology. Now let's go now to why you're here. And that is the first lecture. The first... Ah, super. OK. Um, that's the, the EAU guidelines, recommendations, you know, the guidelines, the EAU guidelines, contrary to many other guidelines, including uh, our North American colleagues and friends, we update them much more often, uh, which is still sometimes too slow. We'll get over it. There are, there are trends to do that. Uh, but um, we are really, uh, really make an update uh, every 12 months on that. And you'll see there is necess necessity. Sometimes... You don't have to be that fast because you know the the new uh, stuff that is coming up is not always uh, found in guidelines. Let's say five years later, so it's the evanescent stars. It's uh, uh, Fancon was one saying, yeah? and uh, so we do have sometimes stars that uh, look great, and after two years, uh, you never hear anything about uh, anymore. So. Uh, these are my uh, conflict of interest disclosures. Um, now, the, uh, the uh, uh, risk groups, what is it? Is it um, this was the first talk? Guidelines. The guidelines, right? Okay. Okay. Thanks, Lord. 
So um, we, what we, what we uh, uh, first of all have to look at. Okay. Uh, first of all, what we have to look at is uh, the the definition of uh, low, intermediate, and high risk that stays the same that has been there for actually many years. And when you look at that, uh, one thing is still missing here is actually the imaging part. Yeah? We are not having in the risk assessment uh, the, the the real a real good imaging uh, um, uh, uh, inclusion. Anyhow, so uh, these are the uh, three. I will go through a little bit faster because I think a lot of you can look into the uh, 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 guidelines on the Eurovap uh, and uh, get this information, and then you can digest that uh, through that uh, uh, much much easier. Now. Now we have low, intermediate, high risk, and then we have different ways of treatment or non-treatment, which is deferred treatment and then active surveillance versus watchful waiting. Then we go to the surgery, then we go to radiotherapy. Gert is going to, Gert de is uh, going to talk about uh, this more in more detail. And then we have investigational uh, therapies. Now, the active surveillance, now for the active surveillance, uh, that is classically, as you know, it's uh, less uh, PSA less than 10, it's at least in 3 plus 3 is 6, and uh, it is definitely not only organ confined, but it's organ confined to more or less one focus, one quarter, but that is in a small prostate, pretty much uh, one focus. And uh, it is important always to correlate the PSA to the volume. And that is the PSA density. There's more and more data now that uh, we need to take into account the volume and the uh, density really with the PSA divided by the volume really gives us a very good idea. Now, active surveillance, and we'll come back to that in a minute, uh, versus watchful waiting, active surveillance, you think you might cure the patient, but just not now maybe later. And so that is the difference to watchful waiting where you never think about curing the patient. We just want to keep the, the prostate cancer down. And for the active surveillance, um, therefore, we need to re-biopsy the patient and see whether this tumor uh, is the tumor we think by PSA and uh, um, volume and maybe also imaging, although it's not in there, um, and maybe also uh, in uh, uh, PSA kinetics. So here we need to rebiopsy because we are not sure PSA is not a tumor marker. Imaging is not sufficient to tell us the whole picture for the moment, at least for the data which we have for the moment. So real biopsy is mandatory up to a year, depending on the PSA cause, depending on clinical pictures, and maybe also depending on imaging. But that is uh, something which still needs to be uh, debated. And the um, the uh, the low risk disease means therefore active surveillance should be uh, 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 recommended to all patients. But one thing I missed, and that is of course life expectancy. Of course, you know if the 80 year old man comes in with his parents, then you may think about uh, doing something curative. Huh? But of course, in the, May, the most of the 80 years old, at least in my region, are not that. I mean, uh, some of them, you know, are coming from Tübingen, they all bike, you know, because it's a green city. Uh, and uh, But most of them have an e-bike. And uh, most of them uh, put the e-bike on the bus and then uh, get out of the, in front of the hospital with the e-bike and then uh, move it over to the parking space there. So, I mean, there is a difference, of course, all the time. Huh? And you cannot say 70 finish or 75 finish because there's, there's a difference. It's very, very difficult. Frailty comes in here. And there's another on the guidelines. I recommend that. Look at the frailty. Uh, regarding uh, 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 patients, especially in oncology, which is a very important part. Anyhow, so uh, active surveillance, if there is more than 10 years uh, uh, and if it's a low-risk disease. That is, I think, that is uh, the most important recommendation. And um, 
The, the other thing is uh, biopsies. Should you only take a targeted biopsy or should you make a systematic biopsy? We could talk about an hour about that. I don't want to go into that. Usually, uh, for the moment being, I would recommend both, and so does the, uh, the guidelines. Well, I'll put it the other way. The guidelines recommend it, and I agree with that. So, um, and uh, the, uh, the repeat biopsies, that is weak. Um, how long should you do it? Uh, because it can get quite uh, cumbersome and can get also a little bit expensive, can also go a little bit uh, difficult for the patients to do a re-biopsy every year for 10 years. Ooh, yeah, And uh, should it be then longer? Because as we know from uh, some uh, studies, the, the prostate cancer develops uh, beyond 10 years sometimes. And so uh, there's no real reason to stop at 10 years, but maybe then you don't have to repeat the biopsy, but think about the, the PSA. And because of all the biopsies you have done and you have correlated during a couple of years with a PSA, you can then trust that the PSA is giving you the right information. That's what it's all about. You don't trust uh, PSA, and that's why you do the repeat biopsies. Now, the difference, again, between active surveillance and watchful waiting, I told you, yeah, active surveillance, we want to cure the patient, but just not now. Watchful waiting, we don't think about curing the patient. We just want to keep uh, the, the, the prostate cancer down, and we think that uh, he should not die from prostate cancer. And if he does, then uh, with the least symptoms and the least problems. And that is, uh, again, some literature. I invite you to read it up on the, uh, on the, on the guidelines. Yeah? Watch for waiting. Uh, again, you know, there have been uh, the, the Scandinavians, very robust people. You know, they had the prospective randomized study, you know, doing nothing versus uh, radical prostatectomy. You couldn't uh, do that anywhere else in the world, I guess. Yeah? Uh, definitely not in Germany. Uh, and uh, definitely, I guess, not in Austria. It would be something. There would be ways to do it. But the way they did it, you know, just you go uh, to watch for waiting, you go to radical prostatectomy. It's a pretty, pretty tough way. And we had the Prefair study in Germany, you know, the big disaster, uh, which we are still suffering uh, in urology from the disaster um, because it had to be stopped for... Uh, none for a bad accrual. Uh, anyhow, so it looks that the, the, uh, still the, uh, the patients, especially after eight, 10 years and more, you know, every two or three years, you can find a publication on that. And it, every time it gets more, the, the curves go apart more. So the longer the patients live, the more they have a benefit from a, uh, a surgical treatment. And so that is something which we have to think about. Uh, of course, you know, there are studies now that have shown, uh, for example, I, Freddie Hemd is a very good friend and I, he's a very, very smart guy and I, really. Um, but if you look at the PROTECT study, you can see that after, uh, I think it was like six or seven years, 50% of the patient uh, actually did have active treatment in his group. And so there is, you know, over time, a bigger amount of patients that is uh, going into uh, some form of treatment. Whether that is psychological because patients want it or not, that's another thing. And um, the uh, the, the, the question is, when you do uh, surgery, uh, is it better to do it uh, robotic? Uh, is it better to do it minimal invasive? If you ask the patients, most of my patients, they always say, okay, minimal invasive. Just the word minimal makes it. Yeah? And if there would be laser in there, it would be great. Yeah? Then they would be cured by just hearing it. Um, but um, yeah, definitely what we can see is that uh, there is a difference in some of the complications. Yeah? Um, and uh, that is, I think, a very strong argument, especially uh, also when it comes to blood loss and stay, uh, stay in the hospital. I don't know how you do it. Uh, we remove the catheter on day five, but let the patient home on day three. But we only let him home because uh, not any earlier, you know, like in New York, they would not stay more than 24 hours huh? in the, uh, what is it, Robinson Center or something. Um, and, uh, but, you know, if we do it in, in Germany, we would get less money. Yeah? The, if, you go be, if you go underneath a minimal uh, stay, uh, they take money away, which, of course, why should you do that? Huh? 
but that's uh, I mean minimally invasive in that case really does help uh, in the recovery of the patient. And uh, also in the, uh, the uh, uh, of course, in the uh, other complications. But again, complications is something that has to do with the experience. I know some of you have done thousands of radical prostatectomies. I usually count and I come to 3,000 uh, radical prostatectomy open. That it means, you know, you get a certain experience. I'm not boasting. I'm just trying, you know, you get an experience and, and you just, some things you can do verbally. You just do it. Um, you don't even know why you do it. Huh? Uh, and that is a difference then uh, if you have somebody uh, like uh, Vip Patel, uh, who has done, uh, who has six uh, Da Vinci machines uh, parallel. Huh? And, you know, just goes from one to the other. And, and he does nothing else than the radical prostatectomies. Of course, you compare, you have to compare those with uh, experience in both parts, and then you may get uh, into uh, better results. But anyhow, um, it makes sense that, especially at the beginning of the learning curve, the learning curve with a minimal invasive uh, is definitely uh, uh, steeper. Uh, you see everything. We have a double console. There's uh, one guy next sitting next uh, to me, and I can uh, push a button, and he gets one of the arms, and then he gets a second arm, and then eventually he has all arms. Yeah, and um, that is something where we have much better way than uh, doing a small, uh, an open teaching an open uh, radical with a small incision, which is about eight to ten centimeters. So you just can you get your hand in. So. Intermediate risk, uh, uh, yes, that is something where we think that uh, radical prostatectomy, and I think, uh, Gert, you're going to talk about uh, radiotherapy in, in that case uh, as well, but it is that is the strongest for radical prostatectomy. I skip that. Gert, you're going to talk about radiotherapy uh, again. Yeah, that is uh, the option for that. Uh, uh, then, uh, of course, there is always the question uh, how long, if and how long, if I wouldn't say is a question, but how long you do the hormonal therapy. Yeah, The question is low dose rate brachytherapy. I must say we have given it up a couple of years ago. Yeah, it was um, We didn't like uh, the things migrating out and the patients coming with a couple of seeds uh, when they peed it out. Uh, but uh, this may have also to do with the question, with the, the reason that, for example, we have the MRI guided uh, radiotherapy now, the MR Linac, and, and others in other ways. And um, so the question is again, how long and 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 uh, what type of uh, uh, hormonal therapy? And I think that is very very important. Now. Um, in the um, investigational therapies, and that is important. HIFU, cryotherapy, interstitial laser therapy, electroporation, what else? Yeah, a couple of others, yeah. That's, uh, uh, in Germany, that's, you know, you have different uh, areas where, where one or the other is offered. They're all considered investigational. The only one, there is a prospective, the only prospective randomized study in a focal therapy was actually done with the uh, photodynamic therapy, yeah, because, but that was only done in Gleason 6. So we don't have a Gleason 7 for that, yeah. That's the only prospective randomized uh, study. When I was still working in, in, in Austria, we were working on HIFU. And what I do not understand is how that after many decades, we do not still have a prospective randomized study. I mean, if, my, if, if these people, sorry if, if they're sponsoring here, but uh, if they make money out of it, why cannot, why do they not spend some of the money in a prospective randomized study? That's the way to do it. And I think that's the way we should uh, uh, do it. There may be nice, uh, nice data, but we still uh, need uh, these, uh, these results in, in order to be able uh, to uh, 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 think about uh, ablative technologies for a certain certain segment uh, of uh, therapy. So uh, general uh, guidelines, yeah, we do have to have a good uh, information on the patient. And I think that is also very important, you know, and abstain from what you have in your department, abstain from what you think because you have to inform the patient. I think that is important. And if you would be the patient or if your father would be the patient or whoever, yeah, 
that is what you should recommend the patient. Not recommend, you should not recommend it. You should inform him about it. You can say your personal uh, opinion, but you should inform him about everything, including focal therapy, including brachytherapy, including uh, uh, other forms uh, that uh, you may not doing uh, uh, strongly. Yeah? And um, the, the, the question is, um, the, the, the lymph node dissection is one still. We do not have any real data about the benefit apart from staging. There is hints there. I do it. I do it in every patient. But I must say, again, the same as with focal therapy, where are prospective randomized data? We have them, we try to get them in bladder cancer, but we have not really got them. And if what we got is not uh, persuasive, because, you know, what is uh, obturator? You know, there is a definition which is a little bit murky. You can have a little bit more, you can have a little bit less. Uh, is it the amount of uh, lymph nodes? Is it the area? Is it the pathology that, that is trained in, in things like that? Yeah. And um, so, um, the uh, radiotherapy, I would leave it out again. You can read it, and I think uh, there's a better uh, guy here, a better colleague uh, to talk about that than, uh, than me here. Uh, and um, is there anything uh, uh, outside surgery or radiotherapy? Of course, we talked about it. Uh, it's uh, the HIFU and cryotherapy only within the clinical trial. Uh, and uh, only with a clinical trial uh, setting. So it is considered still experimental. I'm sorry about that, yeah, uh, but that's what the data are and that's what the recommendations have to come out with in the guidelines. Yeah? And um, the, uh, 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 the, the locally advanced prostate cancer, we will get that in a minute because the locally advanced is the one when we talk about a uh, little bit about uh, with, uh, we, uh, the direction to locally advanced and oligometastatic disease that I will come back in a minute. So I'll uh, love to uh, stop here and ask uh, Gert uh, de Merler. Is it der Mel de Merler or is it better? De Merler. Uh, de Merler. De Mir Miller. Yeah. Okay, Gert yeah. is easier. Yes, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Okay, the floor is yours. Hi, um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you also, Professor Chardin, for inviting me. My first talk is on imaging in the recurrent setting. Uh, maybe I heard that you have danced a lot, so maybe we could call it the hangover session. So um, this is my first slide. Should be my... Yeah, so I'm working at the University Hospitals in Leuven together with uh, Stephen Jognot. Uh, I have the traditional conflict of interest. And so this is the question um, what we have to ask, what is the optimal imaging in case of uh, biochemical relapse after surgery? I think most of you are surgeons here, uh, but also after radiotherapy. Okay. Um, I'm also a big music fan, so I will try to guide you through this talk using some very famous music albums too. If, if you have biochemical relapse after prostate cancer, the most optimal but not perfect. There's a difference between optimal and perfect imaging tool is what we call PSMA PET CT. PSMA is a, a glycoprotein which is located through the membrane, so it has an extra membranous and intracellular component, and it works as a carboxypeptidase. Just some theory about it. It's the best we have, but once again, it's not optimal. But why do we do it? And if you if you do a PSMA PET CT, but you are considering that you will never change the treatment, you do, don't have to do it. And this is also what the guidelines say, and we'll come back to that later. So why do you do it? You want to do it to check whether you see a reason of your PSA relapse. Okay, that is the main issue. On the other hand, if you don't do your PSMA PET CT and your PSA is leave, uh, rising after surgery, then salvage radiotherapy, which is the uh, topic of my second talk, is the, uh, is the uh, key therapy. But you do it to check whether you see something 
that might change your um, uh, therapy. And this is important because I, I only focused on very recent publications. And here you have uh, this publication, which was published uh, only a few months ago in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine. And these patients had a, a, a medium PSA of 0.78, uh, three and a half years after uh, surgery. And most importantly, one out of five, more or less, at a Gleason uh, score group of five. And here you see the locations of the relapses. Two very important points. Point one is that the majority, one out of three, will relapse in the prostate bed after prostatectomy. So still keeping the possibility of salvage trade therapy to the prostate bed alone. And secondly, is that the, ma the, the second majority will relapse in the pelvic lymph nodes, as you can see over here. At the PSA level of 0.8, that's not too much bone metastatic, bone metastatic disease already present, nor metastatic spots in the lungs and the liver. So the majority of patients that you will, uh, that you will send to PSMA PET CT at the PSA level of 0.8 will have uh, visible recurrence in the prostate bed and or pelvic lymph nodes. And these patients should be considered as curable. I think it's really a, a very bad thing to see also in my country, uh, also in other countries around us, that patients having lymph nodes at PSMA PET CT are considered to have systematic systemic disease and treated with ADT, plus or minus ARTA, plus or minus chemotherapy without radiotherapy. I think this is something we really should avoid. Now, here you see that, and I think you know it, that depending on the PSA level after prostatectomy, the chance of uh, having a positive PSMA PET CT rises, which is logic. For logistic reasons, and this is something that we don't always hear at Congresses, in my department, we have decided to, to only perform a PSMA PET CT when the PSA rises above 0.4, unless the primary Gleason score is 9 or 10 then we do it immediately. But this is for logistic reasons. We only have one PSMA PET CT in Leuven. We have only one in Brussels, so we, we can do more than that. But it's also important for people speaking or attending congresses that logistics are from time to time also uh, uh, presented. But here you see that, uh, that, that the, the, the higher the PSA, the more chance you have that you find something. I will come back to that later because you should not wait to the moment that the PSA is high enough to have a positive PSB PET CT. We come back to that later, but please keep this uh, in mind. Now, some, some uh, also very recent work, again, 2021, a few months ago, published in Frontier of Oncology, 76 patients with a median PSA of 0.25, which is, I think, I think, a very defendable level to send somebody over to the radiation oncology department. And the next slide, I think, is a, a very important one. Here you see, here you see the, the initial uh, decision what to treat. So prostate bed and some of the vesicle bed combined with lymph nodes or lymph nodes only because the prostate bed was already irradiated. And then the PSMA PET CT was performed. And here you see the changes. And I will come to the, come to the summary. Uh, almost one out of three of the treatment plans changed. So once again, if you do a PSMA PET CT in this setting, even at the low PSA vol level of 0.25, only do it when you know if I have to change my treatment plan, I will. If you don't want to change anything, you don't have to perform a PSMA PET CT. But one out of three is quite important because it 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 like here, for instance, you, you see that that prostate but only often goes to prostate but plus lymph nodes which is also still a curable disease okay now this is what I, uh, I'm said and uh, I, I think that my colleague will agree upon this is also what the guidelines say only perform a PSMA PET CT if it changes your treatment and I'm not I do not know in your countries whether PSMA PET CT is widely available already but I think pretty I'm pretty sure that in the upcoming two to three years the 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 presence of PSME PET CT worldwide will increase, except, for instance, in the United States, they have still the, this, I don't understand, this, this visceral aversion of PSME PET CT. I, I don't know why, but that stick to Europe. I think in Europe it will, it will become widely available very, very soon. So when we look at, at changes, a song by David Bowie, which changes can occur? And now I will go through some practical uh, examples with you. 
At first, suppose that you do a PSMA PET CT, which shows the local relapse in the prosthetic PET fossa after prostatectomy. Then we have clear evidence that if you perform then a PSMA PET-based dose escalation to this uh, to this lesion that you see, compared with conventional uh, conventional radiotherapy and salvage setting, that you have some important difference. This study uh, was published once again very recently. Uh, we tried to, to keep up with the very recent data. Uh, it compared 69 with 76 gray, and this is this boost to this, in, to this visible lesion with image-guided radiotherapy, or one out of five ADT, which is debatable, and a medium follow-up of 14 months, which is short. But this is logic, but because PSMA PET-CT in this setting has only been used for a, a couple of years. But very interesting is, you see, if you, just like in the primary prostate cancer setting, if you perform a higher dose delivered to the, the, the visible lesion PSMA PET-CT, you have a very significantly higher chance of disease-free survival with a p-value of 0 0.02 and a hazard ratio of more than 6. This has become state-of-the-art in, in our department and also in our country. When you see something on PSME PET CT at the prosthetic bed, you go for a higher dose. Suppose that you see something in the pelvic lymph nodes. For instance, here you have the left side, a presacral lymph node. This is my main, my main message to all of you. These patients should be considered curable. And you cure them by using... Uh, ADT, whether or not combined with ARTA, which is now a discussion in the new guidelines at EAU, whether we should already add ARTA to these patients, but this is outside the scope of this talk. You can cure these patients and you can do it surgically. You go for a, a salvage lymphadenectomy. I will not go uh, further into detail. And then you can combine it with pelvic radiotherapy with ADT. And this is uh, what you can achieve with modern radiotherapy. You can spare the small intestinal loops at a very good level while maintaining a sufficiently high dose to the pelvic lymph nodes. And we call this the full Monty. We don't have, we don't have the results yet of this full Monty treatment, but it is based <coughs> excuse me, on several non-randomized but huge trials by Gupta, by Jagadish, by the group of Alberto Briganti, who clearly showed that in case of PN plus disease, adding radiotherapy to ADT significantly improved cost-specific survival and overall survival. This is not completely the same setting, but the idea is based on these publications. What I would suggest is if you have a patient with on PSMA PET CT pelvic lymph nodes, you can do nothing, but never, never start ADT alone. If you start ADT, you have to combine it with some form of local regional treatment. Now, what if we have oligometastatic disease? This is a talk of my colleague uh, the next talks. So I won't go into detail, but one thing, very important, and I'm sorry for the pharmaceutical companies who are present here, but in a re recent publication by my group, we could, we could see that by offering metastasis-directed treatment to these patients, we could defer the need for palliative systemic treatment with over five years. I think this is substantial because the median time that, uh, that systemic treatment works is only three and a half to four years, not forgetting the enormous uh, cost gain you have. Okay, so this is also important, but I won't go into detail, but cancer-specific survival after eight years is more than 90%. So you can tell this to your patient. If you follow this treatment, this is a chance that you will be alive within eight years. Now, a very old album, everything that glutters, uh, uh, is it gold? No. And this is, this is some, also a take-home message. So please try to be attentious for two more minutes. I said that PSMA is the best we have, but it's not perfect. Never forget that. And I will go with some uh, uh, examples. This is a, a publication in the British Journal of Urological International. Uh, stating what is the risk of having metastatic disease on gallium prostates, PSMA, PET CT, and so on, depending on the PSA level, okay? What, what it is see is that not all, all, all things that, you, that, that were visible on PSMA, PET CT, like this one, turned out to be malignant. This was a completely benign lung disease. So they, they, they went through more than 300 patients, and then this, this one, for instance, having a, a, a retroclavicular lymph node rising PSA, 
patient was already scheduled for docetaxel and ADT. Just remember this, scheduled for docetaxel and ADT, it's not without risk. It was taken out and it just shown granulomatosis. So not everything you see on PSMA is malignant. So be very careful when you see something in a location that you don't expect. And this publication, they, they, they studied more than 300 patients. And out of 300 patients, almost one out of three showed at pathology non-malignant disease or other malignancies who had nothing to do with prostate cancer. So my main message is, if you see something on a location on PSMA PET CT, which is strange, try to go for pathology. And if you see something on PSMA only, which is not covered by CT, don't consider it malignant and just wait. Otherwise, you will treat patients without cancer with very severe toxic systemic treatment, also very, very expensive. This is another one, and this is a pictorial review. And I, for people who are interested in it, I, I, I suggest to read it because these guys have, have also some examples. This man was considered to have a lung metastatic disease in prostate cancer, took it out completely benign. So they said, look, you have other malignancies then that can also give PSMA expression. For instance, this one's, but certainly for the urologist in here, renal cell carcinoma is known to be PSMA productive. Okay, it's not only prostate cancer. And then this is another pictorial view, and it shows that a lot of benign disease also can produce PSMA. Here you have some examples. Certainly this one is important. Because often you have PSMA PET CT, which is positive in the bone. If you're doubting, perform an MRI, please. And you will see that hemangioma and Paget disease often comes out as the origin. So my main message is, please try to avoid to make your patient more sick than he is. I think this is a much major error than making your patient less sick than he is. And I think we have been treating with very toxic systemic treatments patients with benign PSMA lesions more than we think. So to stop, I don't think that we should say metastatic, but the risk of lesion detection on gallium uh, prostate PSMA. So uh, to end with, also after external beam radiotherapy, we can have local relapse. It occurs in more or less 10% of the cases. And uh, also after brachytherapy. And then I think it's important to perform a multi-parametric magnetic resonance imaging, as you see over here. Not forgetting that the location of local relapse is almost every time located at the location of the original tumor. Why you have to do this? Because it has therapeutic consequences. You can also add PSMA PET CT. You can see here the very nice images. And as a treatment, then you can go for salvage age high dose rate brachytherapy, depicted over here, with very nice coverage of the only of the location where the relapse is while leaving the rest of the prostate spared. Or of course, you can go for salvage prostatectomy, which I think is still a valid option. I hope that you enjoyed it. I thank you for your attention. And I think that questions will become afterwards. <coughs> we should do it afterwards okay. with the cases. Yeah? Thank because you. Because we already have a little late for that. Yeah? Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Gert. Uh, now let's move on to the uh, the question: What to do with the oligometastatic disease? Okay. Thank you very much. First of all. Uh, Thank you very much uh, again, Sharok, for organizing the uh, Central European meeting. I didn't do it at the very beginning, but uh, you've done a terrific job. And I think it's so important because uh, Central Europe and the countries you represent do not have a very, very strong and very impressive cultural background, but also a very strong urological background. And uh, traditionally, this has been a very, very fertile area for treating patients with uh, uh, in a very effective, and a uh, very progressive way uh, in the past, and I will hope we'll do, uh, you will do that in the future, or we all will do it in the future. 
Okay, now let's talk about uh, oligometastatic disease. That's uh, something that is uh, very uh, important uh, because, um, you know, in, during the, uh, the progression of a disease and we, we do not always uh, have uh, know this area. Sometimes we only find the patient when he's oligometastatic uh, before he's getting uh, polymetastatic. Uh, and then um, that is something where we don't know. Is this a very special disease? What, what it seems that it is something because we find it uh, quite often that has a maybe genetic, but maybe in the course of the disease that has a special course because it may be the one that is slower in its onset. It may be that it has uh, some features where the immune system catches in partially and allows uh, the patient to stay with a low burden of uh, disease at least for a while. The definition is a little bit difficult. Yeah? I don't know what your definition, uh, what what your definition is, uh, Gerd, but uh, most in the literature says it's uh, less four or less or five or less. Uh, we must go most of the time. We go with five or less. Uh, you go with four or less. I've seen that on your slide. Yeah? To five or less. Five or less. Okay. Well, I think this this is something you know we have to have a certain consensus. Uh, there is nothing in the guidelines anywhere uh, with that regard. But it also depends on the type of imaging. Yeah. If you do it a bone scan, then you you miss out on all the soft tissue, and that's most of the studies have actually looked at bone scan and CT, and CT doesn't always catch uh, the, the 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 soft tissue, and then uh, so you you're uh, stuck with the amount of metastasis found on bone scan. Um, anyhow, that um, is something that is uh, what, what we're working with. Uh, what is also important is it's not only the amount of metastasis, but it's about the amount of tumor cells in each metastasis. Because, you know, we may have uh, five little ones and we have, may have one big one. And the, the amount of cell uh, is, is maybe in the one big one, maybe... Uh, more than in the five little ones. So if we want to do something cytoreductive, uh, it is something where, which we have to always uh, think about as well. And then there is the high risk, of course, you know, you may have, and we have seen in the literature, even Gleason 6 that eventually metastasized and uh, both bone and soft tissue. And then uh, you have, of course, those with a high risk, ESUP uh, 4, 5 uh, that have at least an uh, 8, 9, 10 or 7B, 9, 8, 9, 10. And that, uh, of course, uh, is also a difference uh, than a Gleason, uh, let's say, 7 an A that had eventually metastasizes. And so I think it's not, it's still work in progress, but that is something where we have to think about is that do we get into, uh, into the amount of uh, tumor uh, that we see behind a scan. And I think that is something where we have to focus in the future. Now, the other thing is synchronous or metachronous. Yeah? Is it did we find it as an oligometastatic disease? Yeah, that means that is within six months. Uh, or is it something where we uh, eventually, you know, we did a radical, then he had a biochemical recurrence, then he was treated, and then eventually he developed metastasis and so on. Uh, that is uh, metachronous uh, if it's going more than, 10, uh, more than six months. Yeah? And... <clears throat> The treatment of the primary is the other thing, and I think that is what most of you think about at the beginning. We have a, 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 a synchronous oligometastatic disease. Now, what do we do with the primary? Should we treat it? Should we even treat it uh, by surgery? Yeah. And does it then improve uh, symptoms and or uh, disease-free survival and or uh, overall survival? Yeah. And of course, you know, I could stop here if I go according to the data, because the only data which we have uh, is uh, these data, Parker, uh, Stampede, which uh, clearly has shown disease-free survival and overall survival in a subgroup of oligometastatic disease. That means, you know, it's not that if you have a, um, a metastatic disease uh, uh, with a PSA of 200 and uh, 20 or something, uh, bone metastasis, soft tissue metastasis, and then do a radical. 
it has something, you know, from it, it, it is clear also that we have to think about it. What do we want to achieve with radiation and or surgery uh, in a oligometastatic disease? We, we are cytoreductive. And cytoreduction actually only makes sense if we get the majority of the tumor out. Of course, sometimes we don't know. Because uh, as uh, you've nicely shown that PSMA PET CD has its pitfalls and it may not only show wrongly, it may also not show uh, because there's no PSMA PET, seed, uh, PET uh, expression on the tumor cells, especially towards the later stage of this disease or the later development of the disease, then the PSMA PET uh, CT uh, may not be uh, uh, shown the, the entire picture. But um, again, oligometastatic disease, radiation of the primary, uh, in uh, also for overall survival. I don't know if you come back to that later on. No, yeah. But I think this is this is what we have. This is the data. Now we are surgeons, as you said. You know, and then you know, as a surgeon, we think you know, should we uh, do surgery or just grill the whole thing? Yeah. And so that is the question: Can we extrapolate the data from radiotherapy to surgery? We think, okay, what the radiotherapist can do, or the radio oncologist can do, oh, we can do easily. Oh, we just take it out. Now, is it true? Is there something more than radiation and uh, maybe also immunostimulation with the radiation? Do we get more with the radiation than we can get with the surgery? And that is uh, the question. So it's not easy yeah, to say, um, is it possible? Now, the best way would be, of course, to do a prospective randomized study. Prefer in Germany, I just mentioned it, disaster. Yeah? And if you talk about uh, prospective randomized study uh, in localized disease, they will kill you. Yeah, in Germany, both the urologist, the oncologist, uh, the Deutsche Krebshilfe, uh, and so on. Yeah, they will, poof, yeah, it's uh, verbrannte Erde, you know, it's burned, you know, it's just like, uh, it's nothing. Uh, but, you know, the uh, again, uh, the British have really shown us there is a way, there is, uh, the PROTECT study has uh, used that uh, method. Anyhow, there is a way, there's a two-phase way of doing a prospective randomized study. First of all, you have to teach in phase one, one, uh, the, 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 those that are doing the study, uh, and then uh, take the results of the phase one, which shows you also it's possible or not possible, or where are the problems, and then go into phase two. And not like we did in the prefer. I'm not taking myself out, you know, just, okay, we'll do a study and we do it. And uh, uh, next month, phew, yeah, we got the money and we do it. That's not the way. Yeah? You have to be really, really thinking about, really thinking about who is performing, who is teaching to the, uh, not teaching, who has to be teached or taught um, uh, before he talks to the uh, possible uh, patients or the possible uh, um, uh, people that go into a study like that. And we do have only poor results uh, in a way that we do not have prospective randomized study with regards to overall survival. We only have the registry study. Uh, Christian Gratzke, for example, has uh, shown the Munich tumor registry study where it showed that these patients uh, that were actually uh, advanced metastatic and had a... Uh, 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 a you could say cytoreductive, or you could say uh, a uh, radical prostatectomy. Most of them in a multi uh, um, uh, 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 study with uh, uh, additional systemic uh, treatment and or radiation. Uh, and then we have the SEER data that showed that uh, the the best uh, is always the patients that had a radical prostatectomy. Okay, fine, let's do it. But the only problem is, of course, who gets a radical prostatectomy? the better patients, the younger patients, the one that, you know, he has a younger wife or and or he is very fit and he doesn't believe in, in just uh, having a, a, a hormonal therapy. So there is, of course, always a selection. That's why we need uh, these randomized studies to get that bias at least partially out. Oh, <clears throat> and you have uh, uh, already uh, shown that the uh, the primary treatment uh, um, uh, of patients and then uh, which which ones actually uh, if, how long does it take to get into the uh, uh, palliative or into the homo treatment palliative treatment and then uh, it seems that these patients that uh, had the primary prostate 
treated or um, which could be either radiation or radical prostatectomy. Uh, and then uh, uh, does it make a difference? And it does apparently a difference and I can uh, contribute, uh, no. And then uh, the problem is of course, what is uh, given in addition? Is it chemotherapy because it's uh, the patent went out, it's cheaper? Or do you take any of the new drugs, which are quite some, uh, quite expensive? And you can see that the new hormonal ablation uh, drugs apparently do uh, work better than uh, chemotherapy, uh, at least in a uh, in an, a multi um, uh, drug or multi uh, uh, treatment and and and, and extens extended treatment. Uh, now. Let's move from uh, the uh, uh, synchronous to the metagenous uh, disease. And I'm showing this uh, in addition to what I showed you, what does the primary treatment uh, sometimes mean? In the ARCHES study, we did, we looked, uh, of course, in enzalutamide uh, in the hormone sensitive, in addition to ADT versus placebo. But there was a subgroup of those 1,150 patients, which uh, was a, roughly 180 patients, which did have local treatment. They were metachronous. They did have a local treatment uh, before. They were thought to be curative and then later on uh, developed metastasis. And as you can see here, not only uh, the prior local therapy yeah, did better than the no prior local therapy. And if you look at the radical prostatectomy yeah, uh, and no radical prostatectomy, then you can see here there was, of course, both responded to enzalutamide in the hormone-sensitive metastatic disease. But the ones that did have a primary local therapy apparently fared better. This study was not, this is a post hoc, of course, analysis, but it's just something where, which might give you uh, some thoughts. We have the same in renal cell cancer, you know, in some studies where we found out that if you take out the primate tumor, these patients fared better. Uh, and then uh, uh, very nicely, you talked about PSMA PET uh, uh, CT and the management. Uh, the imaging is so important. The imaging, because PSMA PET CT really does not only give you the bone metastasis, uh, but it also gives you an information, not perfect, but it gives you an information about the soft tissue metastasis. And in the current studies, we do not take into consideration that soft tissue, because it was in the initial studies, it was not done. So if we only had CT, and we only had bone scan, which we were happy with it, but it does not give you the same information as a functional imaging, such as PSMA PET CT, coline, FDG, uh, uh, and, and PSMA PET CT. Uh, and so uh, we can see that uh, very nice study from um, what was uh, uh, from uh, Germany, where you could see that how PSMA PET CT did not only show you something, but it also changed your course of the disease. And I think this is very important because those uh, in all, all the countries where you come from, uh, the authorities will want to know, uh, we pay that much for PSMA PET CT, but what does it give to the patient? And even worse, how much money can we save? Uh, and so that these studies uh, become very important. For imaging, we do not have that many. How many, how many stud randomized studies have we done with an MRI of the prostate? Showing that not only we get a better biopsy, but how many patients will live longer after 5, 10, 15 years? Yeah? And if it comes up now, next year or the year after, we'll say, okay, that was 15 years ago when the MRI was really in its early stages. So, you know, imaging does not really give you an overall survival benefit most of the time. Uh, um, there is uh, the, the, um, uh, a, a very nice study in, in European Urology Oncology, which actually shows the, uh, uh, the, the reason uh, or the, the metastasis-directed therapy and how much uh, is it uh, really uh, it, based on, on imaging. And it shows, again, not surprising, PSMA PET CT is the most accurate imaging technique into finding the oligometastatic disease. And that, on the other hand, means, you know, the older studies that didn't use it may only be partially valuable. 
It's like that, you know. It will take a couple of years when when we see whether the PSMA PET CT is really not only showing you the best uh, definition of oligometastatic disease, but it also changes the patient's course with regards to at least metastasis free. Not talking about overall survival. Uh, just showing you a little bit about um, uh, personal experience with the uh, PSMA PET CT um, uh, uh, and the result. What what happened? I this is a patient where uh, PSA where he did have a, uh, um, a PSA uh, biochemical recurrence after radical prostatectomy, point uh, four uh, nanograms per milliliter, and two actually metastases thought to be in the skin. Already a little bit strange, yeah, but yeah. And the other one uh, here in the pelvic lymph node. We all agree on that. Well, um, radiation, uh, our uh, radiation oncologist uh, uh, talked to him and he said, oh, I don't like it that much. You know, I'll, I'll probably get too much dose on the ureter. And, um, uh, and you're going to take out the skin anyhow, the skin metastasis. So take about both. Huh? Well, did, yeah. This was a, a, a metastasis uh, and uh, different uh, to you, uh, Gert, uh, it was a metastasis, but it was a metastasis of the distal ureter. It was not a lymph node. It was in the wall of the distal ureter. So what I want to point you at is, you know, we may find different locations now. Skin is already something, you know, a, a local uh, skin metastasis. I do have some other cases where we did uh, PRLT with that for skin metastasis. Yeah, it's not so uncommon. But the distal ureter, you know, that is something um, where uh, we'll find out more things. Whether we save the patient, we don't know. He was uh, PSA zero, but again, you know, is it now zero for a couple of months, years? Actually, it's years now. And we'll go up like this instead of uh, moving up like this and ending up at the same amount of uh, PSA rise and metastasis after five years. We don't know. Yeah? But anyhow, in this case, you know, different locations and uh, funny locations. Yeah? Took the, of course, we took, took it out and, and, and sutured everything together. And it's fine. And zero, PSA is zero. Yeah? Okay. Now, uh, we also have, when we talk about metachronous oligometastatic uh, bladder cancer or lung cancer, or uh, we also, in, in, in prostate cancer, we have to think about oligo recurrence, oligo progression, you know, he did get, he's actually, he's uh, uh, castration resistant and getting into oligometastasis. Is it the same? Is it, you know, depending on the, the, the time frame, yeah? Or is it oligopersistence, you know? He has hormone-sensitive, newly developed, uh, uh, and it may very well be, and I'm with you, Gerd, he may be an oligometastatic persistence, oligopersistent disease, but it may not even be uh, oligometastatic. It may just be a false oligometastatic. Yeah? So there is uh, something and we cannot take everything out which we which we do or we have the biopsy everything. Yeah? So we have to think about it. So it's more more into that. Yeah? And then, you know, of course, in the old days, you know, alpha adin because we only looked at the uh, the bones and well, we didn't look at the bones, but you know, you found something on the on the bones only. Uh, and that's uh, um, uh, we could do it uh, in a quite uh, nice way with alpha adin but um, uh, is it going to save the patient overall? So, overall, Olga metastatic prostate cancer, I think we should agree now less than five bone metastasis. We don't have that. We do not know uh, exactly what we do with the lymph node. Everything outside the pelvis actually is considered to be a, meta a metastasis, uh, but it's not in there. Uh, then the, the treatment of the primary uh, is uh, the, the, the treatment beneficial to oligometastatic disease. Um, radiation, yes. Surgery, uh, we hope, <laughs> I would say. Yeah? Uh, but we have to find out. Uh, multimodality treatment, yes, absolutely. Morbidity of the treatment, 
absolutely we have to consider the mobility of the treatment you know you don't want to save a patient uh, who is running around with uh, 10 diapers a day and uh, you know and, and having uh, symphysitis and, and stuff like that uh, and we also have uh, to give the uh, patient an information on personalized treatment which i'm not going to do that you know and that is something uh, could you run that slide we have to have the f the right patient yeah for the right and if we are doing the wrong thing, then it's happening like here. It smashes our patient. Thank you very much. And we move on to Gert uh, de Merler. Merler. <laughs> very, very nice talk and a very uh, interesting morning. Now we come to the most difficult part, adjuvant radiotherapy versus early salvage radiotherapy for post-prostatectomy PSE rise. Bon, you know this already. Now, this is a very nice album by the new radicals, and maybe you are aware of the uh, radicals trial, and the radicals trial, together with the Gatuk and Raves trial, they somehow have killed adjuvant radiotherapy. Because you see over here that, um, the, that that early salvage radiotherapy, which was compared to adjuvant radiotherapy in these trials, it didn't show to be inferior. And it led to the conclusion that adjuvant radiotherapy should be kicked out in the treatment paradigm of PSA, uh, of prostatectomy specimens with adverse pathologic features, and we should wait for early salvage radiotherapy. So well, I could close my talk over here, but now there are some little problems with this. Second thing that the, uh, that the opponents of early salvage radiotherapy stated, and I think they are right, is that early salvage radiotherapy, you can see it in red, causes more cystitis, hematuria, and strictures within two years and after two years when compared in blue to early salvage radiotherapy. So adjuvant radiotherapy has more problems. Not forgetting that the, 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 the technologies used in these trials were rather, rather old-fashioned, but bon, it causes more problems. So two times adjuvant radiotherapy has been, let's say, smashed out of the treatment paradigm in prostate cancer patients with adverse pathologic features on radical prostatectomy specimen. So, the, the uh, newspapers in UK, they show this adjuvant radiotherapy is that long live adjuvant radiotherapy. But is this really the case? Let's, let's have a look at the baseline characteristics of, uh, of the trials. Most of the tumors, more than 80%, had Gleason scores of 7 or less. Only 20% of the patients had seminal some, some vesicle involvement. Okay, so these are in fact patients that may not reflect the daily clinical routine, uh, certainly not in my country. That's that's point to, to remember. And then I was very lucky, again, 2021 was a very good year for radiation oncologists, apparently. I was very lucky that, that I was not the only one, or we were not the only one that saying, look, can we extrapolate the data from CAP, the data from the radicals trials, from the race trials? They are quite good or intermediate risk patients. Can we extrapolate those data to the high risk patient population? And then you had this publication, like I said, by uh, Derial Tilki, which is a brilliant colleague published in GCO, which is not the, the worst magazine in, in life. And they looked at adjuvant versus early salvage radiotherapy in patients with high risk features. Okay, so totally different population. And please go with me through these uh, slides. Here you see they had 26,000 patients with PT2, PT4, or N1 disease, and they were treated with radical prostatec and with lymph node dissection. Of those 26,000, almost 2,500 had adverse pathologic features, and those were treated without radiotherapy, with adjuvant radiotherapy, or with early salvage radiotherapy. And adverse pathologic features were defined as PT3AB, PT4, PN1, and Gleason 8 to 10. These are the patients who are very poorly represented 
in the multivariate analysis of radicals, waves, and so on. And now look at the day, look at the results. If you have adverse pathologic features, including PN1 disease, adjuvant radiotherapy, which is depicted in green, leads to significantly lower all-cause mortality when compared to early salvage or doing nothing. If you have adverse pathologic features with PN1, the difference is even bigger. It's only if you don't have uh, pathologic features at, uh, at EPO that early salvage is as good as adjuvant radiotherapy, leading me to the conclusion that we should not skip post-prostatectomy radiotherapy. Uh, this is the, the, the book that uh, you can buy. We, we shouldn't skip adjuvant radiotherapy too early. I fully agree that in the intermediate and low-risk patients, you can wait for early salvage, but in the high-risk patients, and certainly those ones with pelvic lymph nodes and pathology, I'm really reluctant to wait. This is my personal opinion, supported by this beautiful paper of uh, Tilke. So, going to the salvage setting, we have two scenarios. We have the rising PSA after prostatectomy, and uh, far worse, the persistently elevated PSA after prostatectomy. And let's go to some general principles very quickly. This is a publication by the group of uh, F. Statsio showing that, just as in case with the primary setting, the Gleason score 8 to 10, presence of seminal vesicle invasion, and very importantly, the level of the PSA, all impacted on endpoint disease progression. And here you see that even less than 0.3 compared to more than 0.3, but less than 0.5 already has a difference which is significant. We say as a radiation oncologist, every PSA level matters. And this was confirmed by another publication where the endpoint was distant metastasis. And I think if you're free of distant metastasis, then you're happy. Uh, with the group of Alberto Briganti and Nicola Fossati from Milano, once again, PT3B disease, Gleason 8 or more, but this is very interesting. And please keep this in mind. If a PSA rises per 0.1 nanogram per milliliter, the chance of being free of metastatic disease eight years later significantly drops. So it really plays a role. And now we come to the, to the, the right thing. This is Lorne Hill, the miseducation of Lorne Hill. Don't get yourself miseducated as a urologist by the presence of PSMA PET CT. You should not wait till a PSMA PET CT is positive. If you perform a PSMA PET CT after prostatectomy for a rising PSA and this is negative, you should refer your patient, unless he refuses, of course, to the radiation oncology department. And don't wait, because if you wait, you lose a level of cure. I'm not taking, talking about overall survival, because this is what I call the overall mortality dogma. I'm talking about definitive cure. So a negative PSMA PET CT is not a reason not to refer your patient. This is my main message. Something about the dose. We have this uh, uh, Swiss trial, the SAC trial, which was published very recently and uh, led to a lot of uh, aggressive uh, quotes on Twitter, to be honest, which I don't think is the way we should go. Uh, because this, this study, they compared two dose schedules, 64 and 70 gray, uh, in the early salvage setting. And as you see, uh, when you look at the biochemical relapse-free survival after five years and after seven years, there's totally no difference. P-value almost 0 0.5. Voila. So a higher dose in the salvage setting is also kicked out. Now, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the, day, the patient inclusion of the SAC trial, once again, most of them had a low Gleason score. And more than 80% had absence of PT3B disease. So once again, quite good patients. And then this paper came out one and a half year ago. And this paper, they, they, they studied um, in, in patients with, with um, high-risk disease, whether a higher dose could not be beneficial. While the SAC trial completely showed that 64 gray is enough, these colleagues they tried to also randomize phase two trial. They tried to check whether this also is the case in patients with adverse pathologic features, like Gleason 8 or more, for instance, PT3B. And there they compared 66 to 72 gray, RGRT, no EDT, which is a bit uh, strange, but bon, and median follow-up of 48 months. And these are the results. 
So in patients with a uh, with a uh, with with uh, treated with higher doses, 72 versus 66, there was no increase in toxicity. Why it was the case in the SAC trial? Reason is these patients were treated with image-guided radiotherapy, so much more modern technology. While the SAC trial used conventionally uh, treated patients, so this is a big uh, difference. And this is a difference in biochemical relapse-free survival. This is huge. This is an, an absolute difference of more than 20 percent. P-value is a little bit significant. Of course, the number of patients was not too high. But I think that we should not extrapolate the data of the SAC trial to the real high-risk population. And therefore, in my center, it's still standard of care to use 70 gray when patients have high-risk features, a prostatectomy. prostatectum. And this is then uh, the one I showed already, that if you go for, I showed it in the former talk, if you go for a boost at the PSMA PET positive lesion, you might increase the chance of cure. So what I would say is that we should stop even using data of randomized trials, I fully agree, to this one-size-fits-it-all principle. I, I think it's dangerous. It does not. You cannot extrapolate the data of the SAC trial to a very high-risk population. Okay? So one-size-fits-it-all is not correct. Something on adjuvant radiotherapy, uh, salvage rate, just adjuvant ADT, sorry, when using salvage radiotherapy, I will only show one slide or one present uh, one study by the Gatuk, the French people, who randomized radiotherapy at early salvage alone versus radiotherapy with six months of gosedalin, which is an, uh, an uh, androgen deprivation therapy, you all know. And these are the differences. Progression-free survival is sig significantly better at five years and at seven years when adding ADT to salvage radiotherapy. Uh, six months is state of the art in a lot of departments throughout Europe and also in my country. And then I come to a more philosophical thing. This is uh, OMD, or Castle Maneuvers in the Dark, a quite famous band in the 80s and the 90s. I would call it the overall mortality dogma, also OMD, because opponents of ADT, they say, well, you didn't show any overall survival benefit yet in the GATUC trial. True, but who cares? This is the cure, my favorite band. And patients having ADT for six months plus salvage radiotherapy have much more chance to being definitively cured forever. And maybe they won't live one day longer. Huh? They will may die of a cardiac disease 20 years later. But at least there are these that they are cured. They should not care about their prostate cancer anymore. Therefore, and I think that nobody, no, not everybody will agree, and that's good. I, I love that democratic discussions, but the overall mortality dogma is used much too often. Definitive cure in this setting is much more important, according to me. Above that, there's no totally no difference between radiotherapy and the combination concerning quality of life scores. You see here the quality of life scores that have been used. I will not go into detail, but there's no difference uh, at all. And now something more from the lab. We study this. It's a very strange thing, and you, you all prostate cancer specialists. If you go for androgen deprivation therapy, something very strange happens. M namely, testosterone, when it binds to the testosterone receptor, it will send a message to the prostate cancer cell, hey, watch out, you're going to be irradiated. Please, excuse me, please produce what we call DNA repair enzymes who will, who will restore the DNA damage. If you go for castration, the receptor is blocked and the signal is not going to the nucleus of the prostate cancer cell. So the prostate cancer cell does not know that he will be irradiated. It took us till 2016 to, to discover this uh, mechanism, but this is a real mechanism. It has nothing to do with micrometastatic disease avoidance. No, it's just protection from DNA damage that is avoided by ADT. Because it's, it's the testosterone receptor itself who will say to the prostate cancer cell, make DNA repair enzymes, you will be irradiated. Very strange, but it's the truth. So my main message here is you, you might need to eat six, six months of bad apples served by ugly woman to eat a lot of nice apples served by beautiful woman afterwards by adding six months of ADT. It is the standard of care in my country. I think it should be the standard of care everywhere. 
So I thank you for your attention. And my main messages are, are do not extrapolate the data from patients with low and intermediate risk disease to the high risk population. There you can still use higher doses. Whether or not combined with whole pelvis radiotherapy, we still await the publication of the sport trial data. And I think that six months of ADT should be considered the standard of care um, when cure is important. Okay. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. <clears throat> Oops. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Hayat, uh, the way we, we wanted to do it, because we are a little bit progressing on time and I see a lot of hungry faces, uh, we uh, have uh, Stefan Korn here now with his case. And during the case, you can uh, uh, ask questions and make remarks and make uh, comments. Stefan, the floor is yours. Now we are both grilled. Yep. <laughs> so, thank you. Dear German, dear audience, um, it's great to have the possibility to present a case and I hope that we'll have a lively discussion, but I'm sure after those excellent talks, there won't be any question being open for now. So I will start with my case. It's a 62-year-old patient uh, coming to our department first at uh, the end of 2018. He's suspicious for prostate cancer. His urologist performed PSA and a digital rectal examination. And to give you a picture of this patient, he came to our patient and said, I'm, I have prostate cancer. Uh, you can do biopsy, but uh, I heard you perform, performing um, nerve sparing, robotic assisted prostatectomy. So this is what I want. So you see the patient really knows what he wants. He's really successful. Uh, being an entrepreneur, travels a lot and got divorced recently for the third time. He's an overall uh, healthy patient and has no family history of prostate cancer. So the workup, in the, at the initial presentation, he had PSA of 12. Uh, the prostate MRI showed Pirates 4 lesion of one centimeter in the right peripheral zone. And we performed targeted biopsy showing one core in the region of interest being Gleason 8 ISOP4. The other course in the region of interest, ISOP3, and then a systematic uh, biopsy, two cores uh, of five on the right side, being positive for ISOP3 patients. So my first question would be, we had a lot uh, of uh, PSMA in the biochemical recurrent setting, in the oligometastatic setting. Do you perform PSMA PET imaging for primary imaging uh, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, uh, only in high-risk disease. <laughs> this is, of course, a very in-between because he has one out of four cleans on eight, but it's only one bad feature, so no, we wouldn't. Okay. The, the, the problem is, you know, I, I hate to say that, if he's privately insured. Mm. <laughs> now, the question, the problem is it costs about 1,100 or 1,200 euros, and uh, those, uh, if the insurance doesn't pay it, and they do not usually pay it uh, for the regular patients, Gebietskrankenkasse here in Austria, uh, uh, AOK in, in Germany or whatever it's in your country, the patients will have to pay it for we, themselves. We, we yeah. base ourselves on the pro PSMA study, which was published in Lancet Oncology a year ago. And, uh, it has no use in intermediate risk disease. So. We, we, we tend to, we do not make a difference between intermediate and high risk because of the uh, possible false mm -hmm. uh, negative or positive uh, stay, uh, 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 assumptions. But um, in Tübingen, what we get around is uh, our hospital pays for every patient that we say we, uh, we want a PSMA PET CT. So it is not as crude as, as you may think. Uh, by the way, the guidelines say, yes, staging is, ne is necessary no. because it's going beyond Absolutely. 10. I think that's staging an important message, just to repeat, because I didn't mention that. No? So we performed PSMA PET CT. We had the MRI for local uh, staging. Uh, DRE was CT, CT2A, uh, MRI, no extrastatic distinction, um, and uh, PSMA was negative for metastatic disease. The, the volume was how much? I didn't. The oh, volume of the, the, of the prostate. The prostate volume was 30. Okay. 
approximately. Yeah. So it's quite uh, it's a higher density. Yeah, it is. So he's uh, potent. So my next question is, is there room for local therapy? As I told you, <coughs> patient is really straight for surgery. And if, do you prefer nerve sparing unilateral, for example, in this patient with one Gleason 8 or ISO 4 core in the biopsy? I may say the way it will work with us is the patient can come to the interdisciplinary uh, the interdisciplinary outpatient visit, mm -hmm. and there the two of us or our representatives, more or less, yeah, they would sit in front of the patient. Mm -hmm. So then, the same, you know, yeah. yeah, so that is, you know, it's, it's a difference whether the patient goes to you and you tell him, boo, yeah, you know, yeah, and we tell him, ooh, just out, and you'll be fine. Honest. Next day, you'll uh, go with your wife on vacation and stuff like that. Yeah? So it's, uh, you know, each one hears what the other says. Yeah. Yeah, but here, and it's like we send the patient to, yeah. the, to the. But the here, I, I think it, it's. Uh, if there are comments from the audience, please say so. But here, I think the guy really wants nerve sparing, uh, because I think he wants uh, being he wants to be sexually active at a lot of his uh, travels. Um, if we have to treat them with uh, with radiotherapy, it's also with twenty four months of ADT because of the Gleason eight. So, absolutely. So I mean. Um, of course, you know, it's not always uh, important to ask the patient whether he wants and is sexually active. It's also his wife who needs to be asked uh, and if she wants to be him active. But he's divorced for the third time. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't well, know the reason. For what reason? He's rich also, you know. <laughs> yeah. He has a big bank account. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't know what's, what is more important. Yeah. Uh, so um, I, with the way we handle it is, the yeah. way I handle it is, I do, if there is no obvious reason macroscopic, macroscopically, I do a nerve sparing on both sides, mm -hmm. and we have the two safe, two safe, tubing and safe, it's just like neuro safe, that um, I take it out, for example, in robotic surgery, I have the prostate taken out, and then uh, I get a complete uh, frozen section of all the rims uh, while I do the lymphadenectomy. Mm -hmm. So, yes. I do not, I do a nerve sparing, I do as much, I be pretty radical, but only if I have the, the net of having uh, the margins examined during the surgery. And I do not believe that a Gleason 8 should not have a nerve sparing at all, because um, we know that under overstaging, there's a 10% roughly that it will not be a Gleason 8. Yeah? And then, of course, um, will be also 30% that it's a Gleason 9 or something like that. But uh, again, you know, we do see uh, a growth pattern where the local extension or extra capsule extension is not the problem. Any comment of the audience? Who would do? A not a nerve sparing in this case. Okay, who would not do a nerve sparing on the MRI positive side? Okay, it's getting more. Who would not do any surgery at all? So, surgeons. I can, I can live with that perfectly. <laughs> My yeah. time has yet to come. <laughs> maybe, maybe we should also ask about the PSMA, if you allow me, uh, PSMA PET CT. Who would have done a PSMA PET CT for staging? Okay. Who would not have done it? Okay. I must say it's a majority. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There's no right or wrong here. <laughs> you don't get a prize. So uh, we performed robotic assisted radical prostatectomy. Uh, lymph node dissection, nerve sparing. Final pathology revealed ISO3, uh, was a PT2, PM0 of 22 lymph nodes. And there was uh, the surgical margin was positive with three millimeters of Gleason pattern for at the apex. So the patient has good function, needs one safety pad per day. After eight can, weeks. Can I ask, can I ask one question, which I uh, turned out to be quite important? Do the uh, <coughs> pathologist, when they, they mark it, they mark, they put uh, ink, they ink mm -hmm. the, the prostate, do they mark spe specifically ruptured areas? Uh, yes, with our department, they do. Yeah. Um, we have a great pathologist. Uh, we're really happy, and uh, yeah, they do. 
because I think this is a very important thing, especially in the in the robotic. You know, you tend to have the smallest incision possible. It's always the most painful one, by the way. And then you pull it out, yeah, with that uh, Billa Tüte, yeah, and then uh, pull it out, and it goes through a very narrow opening. And that may, especially in the area where the uh, where the tumor is, it may rupture. Because the tumor is like like a bad apple or a bad orange. It's the weakest point is where it's foul. Mm -hmm. yeah. So coming back to the patient, he's really eight weeks after surgery, needs one safety pad, uh, has erections, he's really happy about his functional outcome. And his PSA eight weeks afterwards was 0 0.02. So would you consider this patient as a true PSA persister? No, no, no. Uh, we, we, even, we even don't measure it anymore. For mm. us, it's less than uh, 0 0.1. You may not forget that yeah, you guidelines say that uh, relapse is only considered at 0 0.2, which for me, it's too high. I would go for 0 0.15. Mm. But you can have extra prostatic PSA production, so this is, uh, is okay. Depending, uh, I have to defend the guidelines a little bit. It says depending on the clinical picture, of as course, far as I know. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, again, with us, we don't. We say less than point zero four, less than. Zero. If that's there, because we don't, we don't. Uh, I don't think. Um, um, uh, zero four. Yeah. Zero four. No, yeah. no, no, not yeah. point four. Yeah, okay. Point zero four. <laughs> we say less than. Yeah. Uh, because everything else is maybe difficult. You know, there is the rush has a difficult then the, the Beckman Dickinson one, uh, the Roche tends to be not as precise in the very low areas. Mm -hmm. And I have patients, <clears throat> we have both in our hospital, and when one comes with a Roche, then he may have uh, something like 0 0.05. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then he's all worried and he wants, you know, everything. For, for the audience, I have not too much, but uh, a not neglectable amount of patients who have having a PSA of 0 0.12 for years after mm. prostatectomy without, yeah. so yeah. something benign is there, so this we is have, okay. Yeah, we have, we have those cases where we have done a radical prostatectomy twice. Okay. <laughs> Especially, you know, when there is a middle lobe and then uh, the surgeon cut off at the level of the middle lobe and as the middle lobe stays in there, you know, Nicely hidden, patient is nicely continent, maybe sometimes goes into urinary retention later on. Uh, and then uh, now you have to do a red, second radical. So I guess I know the answer for the next question, a positive surgical margin, PSA. And thanks again for a great talk on salvage versus adherent uh, treatment. Yeah. I think this is... Uh, <laughs> no, so no, does any, uh, would anybody go for uh, adherent therapy in this patient? Okay, so... But who would? Okay. <laughs> so, to close the case, in the follow-up, the patient uh, has mildly increase of uh, PSA with a doubling time of 16.4 months. He's very happy with his functional outcome, um, and he's pretty skeptic about any further treatment that um, uh, he was told right before. So, would you do anything with uh, a PSA of under 0 0.2 at this moment, two years after? Uh, uh, right up a second. Plus <laughs> info. <laughs> uh, look, this, this, yeah, well, it's a difficult one. This, this, this man will definitely end with the need of early salvage radiotherapy. And then we know that the sooner the better. So maybe at that point now, zero point, how much is it? Zero point 12 or something? Yes. You, you could wait, but I would certainly go for a control every three to four months because he has a fourth wife since one year. So I would go for an MR of the brain. It's kind <laughs> of the brain. It's because to be married four times. Yeah. I, I, I think you have to have him come in both, really. You know, him and his wife to yeah. get an idea. Uh, what, is the, uh, what is the situation? And the other thing is, I, I totally agree, you know, uh, it looks like you made that blue line, so we have to do it. it looks but there like. could be a green line that actually goes maybe uh, straight, as you said. Huh? Yeah, the, the reason that I'm reluctant yeah. is that, that you see one, two, three times that the, the measurement goes okay. back down, mm. you see? So I would wait a bit, but not, not one year, eh? three to four months and then come back. 
what, do, what would be your treatment level? 0.15. Yeah, 0.15. Not 0.3? Hmm? Not 0.3? 0.3. Yeah. That's too high for me. 15, you said. 1.5. Oh, 1.5. Okay. Yes, because you, we know that, that yeah. between 0.5... Well, you, you see the guy comes in at 0.15. Once we're ready, it might be 0 0.19. Yeah. And we know that everything between 0.20 and 0.30 yeah, yeah. is okay. Yeah. Well, there there is one thing which I would uh, consider still. It's 0.12 now, was it? Yes. 0.12. So roughly 10 to 15% uh, chance of seeing something on PSMA PET CD. Now he's which? <laughs> he is. <laughs> and uh, it's still. very important. So I, I would consider... You know, maybe wait three, four months. Maybe it reaches then 0.15, and then I would go for a, uh, a PSMA PET CT. I've done, uh, not on the short term, but I've done in one patient 12 years after radical, 12 years, a pararectal singular uh, PSMA positive metastasis at 0.2 nanogram. Mm -hmm. And I, the, the, uh, our radiation oncologist, very good friend, he said, I won't do it. It's uh, too much for the rectum. I, I took it out. Yeah, it's a little bit tricky, mm -hmm. but I took it out. Zero. Okay. Nice. It's another, it's another yeah, yeah. six years now. Six yeah. years. I, I would hear the, two things because we are living in different countries and our Department of Nuclear Medicine would refuse it. The PSMA PET CT. No. no in our yeah, country, yeah. they would say okay. no. For now. Bon. So the rules, okay. rules are different. Uh, and this guy had a positive surgical margin, whether or not it was at the place that the robot was, but he has a high chance of a local relapse. So, yes, see him back in three months. But the, the question is, what is the downside of radiation now? Down, well, you, you induce toxicity, certainly on the level of yeah. the urethra. Yeah, but that's not much. He's healed. The urethra, the contents is pretty good. Uh, Long-term effect on sexual function, okay, but now recovery of the nerves have happened. So I think... The downsides are not as much as if you would give it early on. Yeah. So, gonna, so I think that, and, and we, we would agree, has a high probability of getting an intervention, as you mentioned. Um, we may not lose the window, but look at this uh, curve, probably you will get an intervention. And then, as you said, I think it depends on the wife. She wants to have a insurance that he's not going to get a fifth wife. Maybe she wants to have him radiated. <laughs> or otherwise she wants him dead to get his money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Please on the microphone. No, no, no. You have to go to the microphone. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll serve. <laughs> I just remember very old studies from from, from Partin, you know, and they were observing men with biochemical recurrence. Of course, there was all definitions, all point two, and they said if there is a recurrence after two years, then it, you should pursue treatment. So, but once and you have all point all point twelve after four years, then the question is whether it will be really mean relevant for his survival that you will start treatment with 0.1. This is again what I meant for survival, most probably not. But for cure, most probably yes. And I would go for cure and not for survival. I want to die the same day without uh, having four years of palliative ADT. Because what you know is that the guy will have a high risk of developing metastatic disease. And even he, he, maybe he will die at the same day, but you will have a high risk of metastatic disease, and then you need palliative systemic treatment with all the toxicity. Survival is overrated. How, how, how big an NT? Excuse me? Uh, how much number needed to treat? For the unknown overall survival. For uh, what you're supposed to. I don't know by head, but I've shown the difference that eight years are 25%. If you compare that to, to breast cancer patients who have very severe uh, chemotherapy for a gain of one and a half percent, 20 percent is a lot to me. Yeah. This means if you were all men with prostate cancer, that side, 20 percent would, would relapse more than that side. What will you choose yourself, cure or not? Okay, I, I think uh, we have made made a point, yeah, and there are different uh, different uh, treat, treatments, uh, different treatments, and. Uh, um, I think it was a very, very good uh, discussion. Thank you very much, Stefan Korn. Yeah, very much. Yeah. I don't have your name. I think it was cool. We have five minutes. Five minutes. So you, you have to go fast. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Slides, Kuhal. Yes. Kuhal.
Sorry. Okay, so this is 72 years old gentleman. He presented November 17 with suspicious prostate cancer based on PSA and digital rectal examination. He's generally healthy, old history of seminoma, um, well-controlled hypertension and hypothyroidism, positive family history of prostate cancer. Uh, on his presentation, his PSA was 18. Uh, he had uh, period 5 on MRI and uh, on biopsy, region of interest was gleason 8, and he had 7 out of 10 systematic uh, of the systematic biopsy, also gleason 8. Now, 50 years ago, he, when he had his seminoma, he had radiation and no chemo. Is yeah. that correct? This is uh, not clear. I don't have uh, this information, but I don't I, uh, I don't. Okay. Care. Yeah. Hydration. Vi vital information. Vital information. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So, uh, what... Further work up would this, you recommend? I would, I would now go for PSMA PET CT and this guy without any doubt. Yeah, PSA 18. What was the volume of the, of the prostate? Uh, it, it, it was like 30, 30 35. Something. Four out of four course positive with Gleason 8. Yeah. Okay. So definitely. Um, if you have it available, I, uh, who has available a, a PSMA PET CT? Okay. Okay. Majority. At home. <laughs> hmm? At home or where? Yeah, <laughs> you at home. <laughs> okay, so he had PSMA uh, PET MRI and it showed no lymph nodes and only single bone metastasis of 1.6 centimeter. Um, no, not agree. He has a lesion on the PSMA PET CT. You cannot say this is a bone mat. You have to invest it uh, further. He, he with has MRI. a lesion. Yeah, yeah, I'm a bone. Yeah. This could be something benign. So go for MRI without any doubt. Especially his history. Does he have a car accident, bike accident, or something like that? You know, it sometimes breaks something. You can, or, yeah, you, yeah. Really, it's, um, um, this upsets me. <laughs> Nobody. You, 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 make, you make possibly a curable guy incurable. Nobody. Yeah. He, has a, he has a positive PET and MRI. It's a PET MRI. He didn't fusion. say it. Yeah, no, it's a <laughs> bad MRI. So okay. it has to have He's still in the dancing mode. We're down to five minutes. <laughs> then uh, Professor Shariat said five minutes. <laughs> so then I agree. <laughs> There's an MRI, okay. and, uh, yeah. um, and uh, obviously, as we said, uh, I think a key issue is that the imaging needs to confirm the PET yeah. okay. uh, lesion, right? Okay. Okay, so what treatment modalities would you? Offer to this patient, to this patient. Well, if he comes in again with his uh, third, fourth, fifth wife, uh, <laughs> and uh, if he is fit, and if he's motivated, then uh, uh, two things could be done. He could go for a local therapy. Of course, you have to inform him that the only data which we have would be radiation. But uh, a radical prostatectomy could be uh, a uh, under certain circumstances. <coughs> if you have a protocol running, I don't know. You, you have one. Mm -hmm. You have a protocol for radical in uh, oligometastatic disease. I would uh, take that for the oligometastatic disease. And then uh, two things could be done because I, I heard uh, Gerd de Müller. I would tell him I heard this nice lecture, and now I'm going to biopsy. The, uh, the the bone metastasis for two reasons. Yeah, because um, I would like to get more information. Yeah, about uh, the, the tumor. And that could be one option. The other one would be, if I would do that, then uh, definitely he would have a three-modality therapy. He would definitely have uh, radiation to the bone uh, with or without biopsy. And then, uh, of course, uh, at least and, and, so some time. And hmm? radiation to the prostate, too. And prostate. Because prostate. it's low-volume yeah. metastatic disease. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, just, but this is, of course, too particular. But if you would send him to me, I would yeah. ask, really, is the guy been radiated for his seminoma? Mm. Because this could be a therapy induced tumor. Mm. But, boom. but one question this guy, why has nobody considered him for genetic testing? That's what you would when do. When would you it. do, or where would you do it? I mean, I know it's not standard, it's not in the guidelines yet. He has a father, he died at age 75, right? That was the thing. 72. Uh, yeah, 72. He has metastatic disease, um, <clears throat> he has aggressive disease. Would this be somebody that would look, you would look at what genes would you test? BRCA1, BRCA2. Yeah, but, ATM, but we, we, ATM checked yeah. uh, 22 to... Well, ATM, we don't. But, it's, uh, yeah, it's, but not immediately. Yeah. I mean, I would first stimulate a guy for any form of local regional treatment. Mm. And that's why I would get the biopsy of the bone. Mm. If I'm in there, I would like to love to have that. And have it's, the question is, uh, you're talking about uh, somatic versus uh, genetic. Yeah. 
Now, you're talking about genetic because of his father. Mm -hmm. I would go for the somatic one, and then I would go for both. And then I would of get course. an information of the primary, and I would get it from the bone metastasis. I fully agree. Yeah, it's a little cheaper, too. Mm. Yeah. So, but the question is, how will it impact his family? If you do germline, you have an impact on his family and his children. We don't know if he has children. It's important. But, but you may scare them as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You could do that later on. But, uh, you know, to start out with that, yeah, mm -hmm. I definitely, you have a point. It's definitely uh, something important. Yeah. So, uh, we did not go for biopsy. The patient was eligible for uh, radical prosthetic to me, oligometastatic uh, trial. So, he underwent radical prosthetic to me and metastasis directed therapy with no systemic therapy. Uh, so, robotic prosthetic to me was done. Uh, pathology showed gleason 9. T3A, uh, N0 out of 56 nodes, and positive margin with the uh, gleason better at the positive margin of 4. Now he gets radiation, of course, of the prostatic bed. <laughs> but, but, but this metastasis directed treatment was this uh, stereotactic body. Yeah. 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 The issue now, and this is something from a practical point of view, and now we almost finished, you went for SBRT of that lesion. Yeah. Yeah. In the future, now you can have technical issues because suppose he relapses in the prostate bath, you cannot re irradiate anymore. So I would have waited uh, and check what the prostatectomy pathology specimen said. Uh, he, uh, yeah, we, he had the prostatectomy before the stereotactic. Ah, and this important. is the pathology? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> before, yeah. You mean the, if he gets the doses to the bone, he will not be able to get additional doses to the... At that location, it would be location. very difficult. Okay. I'm not saying it's necessary, mm -hmm. but... Uh, we have, I, we have I, a series where we actually have re-radiated, you know, lymph nodes in a field that has been pre-radiated a few years ago. And uh, it's incredible. You don't see any... This, yeah. this is a new area of research, right? But this is the urethra. Yeah. You're right. I have uh, uh, cases, especially you know, uh, doctors, uh, very special doctors and teachers, yeah. And uh, that is um, afterwards, the single PSMA um, did not show up anymore after uh, taking, and the PSA went down to zero after radical. Mm -hmm. So it could have been, if not biopsy, it could have been no no tumor at all, mm -hmm. yeah. But it mm -hmm. could have been some other factor. So, Surgery, uh, three months after surgery, his BSA was uh, 1.2, and at that time, he also received a stereotactic uh, for the bone lesion. And on follow up, two months later, his BSA was 0 0.4, and he had no suspicious lesion on a repeated PSMA bit. And uh, yeah, his BSA was increasing and no suspicious lesion. So, what would you offer? No, so he received the nothing. Uh, he was he he had all his radiation possible around here. No, not yet. Mm, no, not salvage no. radiotherapy of the prostate, but ah, okay. But so once again, had... it, normally I would do it, but it might be a technical issue. If it's let's say it this way, if it's not technically possible, then I would wait. I would I would make a strong effort to do that because as much as of a cytoreduction reduction which we could do at that phase could help him prolong the interval to yeah. the to uh, apalutamide and salutamide or whatever he needs in addition to ADT. I would do my utmost best, but yeah. we have to do the yeah. plan and check whether it's. It's funny that we want the radiation and you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Extended lymph node section. He had fifty six yeah. lymph yeah, nodes. He already, yeah, huh? yeah. yeah. So more extended. Okay, so. This was uh, what was done. So with uh, radiation oncology and uh, shared decision with the patient, patient went for salvage to the uh, prosthetic bed nice. on August 2018. And his BSA was uh, less than 0 .1, uh, 0.01. Six months after radiation, he was still on ADT. Patient moved to the States and lost follow-up at this stage. <laughs> I would advise to stop the ADT. Yeah. yeah. Six months, you said. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Fahad. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much to Arnolf and Gert. Really fantastic. Thank you for being with us. Not only bringing the ESU lecture here, but uh, the EOU and the spirit here. And it's fantastic. And as I, I didn't promise you too much, Gert and Arnolf are a fantastic team. And 
Gert is really a fantastic, incredible radiation oncologist that understands all the worlds, not only the urologist, but also the systemic world very well. And thank and you very music. much for that. And, and music. And music. <laughs> so we have now 30 minutes. Your lunch break has been cut by half an hour. That's good. That means you're not going to eat that much. You're not going to be too tired for the next sessions because the next session is going to be really exciting. It's going to be stones, voting dysfunction, and a potpourri. And then we're going to go to the country competition. I expect you in half an hour back. We will lock the doors so that you cannot leave the area back to the hotel rooms, OK? <laughs>
Hey, I'm from Graz, and um, this is Igor Tomaskovic. He is the president of the Zagreb Croatian Society, and we are very happy to be here and to share this session about Euro this year. This. So we would ask the first, so like the first lecturer, Dr. Perecinski, to give us a speech on intelligent deployment of single-use flexible scopes. Thank you very okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. Okay, uh-huh. Okay, this right. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's really an honor for me to be here. This lecture is about intelligent deployment of single use flexible scopes. I have nothing to declare. Ureter scopes are essential instrument for uro urologists as stethoscope for internists. Endoscopic, of tre endoscopic treatment of urolithiasis is now currently the most preferable method. There is a trend of minimally invasive uh, treatment for upper tract urotelial cancer. We have reusable flexible scopes and also single use flexible scopes. Reusable scopes have great optical capabilities. Mm, they have better, um, they are better for diagnosis and also treatment of upper tract urotelial cancer and in hands of skilled surgeon, these devices may have really uh, good durability but they are expensive and all, uh, often um, required uh, capital investment budget. Um, uh, they have only a limited number of performances uh, we can do with them. Um, and there is a great risk of damage. If you will break it, you will have a headache, headache for three days, I think. They are expensive and have expensive service and also time consuming service that we have to wait for a uh, new uh, uh, device. Uh, Department of Urology um, have only limited number of these devices. Reprocessing is timely and costly, and there's great risk of transcontamination uh, with inflammation com uh, complication. Look on this graph. Mm. We can see that the reprocessing time is really time consuming. The mistake on of, on any of these steps, pre-cleaning, manual cleaning, drying, sterilization, storage, can cause that the scopes will remain dirty and contaminated. What is reality? On the endoscope surface may persist biofilm, which can protect uh, microbes and uh, against disinfection and sterilization. This is a very interesting study. We can see here there is dirty uh, ureteroscopes after procedure. We can see uh, the protein level uh, which was found um, on, on, on its surface after procedure. And all these, they are uh, fully reprocessed, reprocessed uh, ureteroscopes. And we can see that the protein level found uh, on its surface is really similar, it's horrible. Protein on the surface of the scopes can cause inflammation. Pseudomonas aeruginosa can persist thanks to biofilm inside the scopes and persist for a long time, for many minutes, um, in high concentrated parasitic acid for disinfection. Treatment of sepsis in the United States um, it's uh, really expensive. It's about $24 billion uh, for hospital events. In almost one million cases of sepsis, uh, they, they, were, they, uh, they was annually. Um, about 25 percent um, was, um, was urosepsis. And four percent of urosepsis is due to postoperative complications. So we can see that we need some device which is single used and, uh, and isn't contaminated. This table shows comparison between uh, time-consuming cycle of uh, reusable scopes uh, versus uh, simple uh, step when we should uh, only make storage uh, of this single-use uh, device. 
To date, more than 10 different single-use flexible scopes are available on the market, but clinical evidence is mainly available only for two models. It's literally from Boston Scientific and new scopes uh, from Chinese Parson. Parson is a thin device. Um, we can uh, have great outflow of fluid also through uh, ureteral excess sheet with small diameters. And uh, now um, there is a trend of miniaturization uh, of retrograde intranal surgery especially uh, when uh, we will use a uh, new tulium fiber laser, um, which, can offer, um, which can offer very thin laser fiber with, uh, with only 150 microns of diameter. Thanks to small diameter of the device, um, it has the potential for easy access into ureter for non prostated patients and is also useful for pediatric population. Litoview from Boston Scientific is well designed, is really lightweight, uh, which reduces fatigue of surgeon's hands. It has uh, good ergonomy, and we can use adapter with the possibility of simultaneous basketing of the stones for only one surgeon. Uh, Litoview has comparable optical capabilities, deflection and flow, making uh, it's alternative to standard reusable uh, digital or uh, fiber optic uh, scopes. These tables show a comparison between uh, reusable Carl Stortz Flexix C uh, scopes and the single use Boston Scientific and Passan. We can see the here that the differences between these devices aren't uh, really significant, and the results uh, were pretty similar. Dornier Axis single-use uh, digital flexible scopes is unfortunately uh, currently available in only a few states uh, in the world. It seems that it has great optical properties, uh, made in flow rate uh, through an empty channel is really great. Um, and is, it also has a very good uh, flexion in both directions. I haven't uh, on, uh, this uh, information on, this, on the slides, but uh, there is very first company um, uh, it, uh, it, it, it's called uh, CGEN from China. Uh, this company offers um, single-use flexible scopes when, uh, where we can um, choose if we want to um, single-use flexible scopes with working channel on 3 o'clock position or 9 o'clock position because 3 o'clock position of working channel is better for treatment in the right kidney and 9 o'clock position is better for treatment for left kidney and much company, many uh, of these companies offer single use scopes with only working channel on three o'clock company, uh, three o'clock position, I sorry. Last year on EAU annual Congress, um, Professor Traxer demonstrated his first clinical experience with new single use digital flexible scopes, uh, Flex XC1 from Karl Storz. This device uses the same chip uh, and processor as a reusable Stortz uh, Flex XC. It has optical uh, properties uh, which are comparable to reusable Flex XC, uh, which is now uh, gold standard for endoscopic diagnosis of upper tract urotelial cancer. Uh, it is also this new device compatible with, which, uh, uh, with Image One as uh, camera systems. Um, and this camera system has SPIES technology. What is it? This is novel endoscopic imaging uh, technique with the different modalities. Uh, uh, there is modification of contrast, brightness, and sharpness. And there are modalities um, called Spectra A, Spectra B, Clara, Chroma. Uh, you can see here some examples uh, of, uh, of it. There's uh, Clara, Clara plus Chroma. There is Spectra A. Mm, I think it seems uh, really similar as NBI, NBI mode from Olympus. Endoscopic treatment of lower pole stones. Uh, what is better for single use or for reusable scopes? Uh, this study published in Central European Journal of Urology shows that better stone free rate um, have single use flexible scopes. We can work Till, sing, till single use flexible scopes limit. So without the fear of damaging, we can work more precisely. When we use 
reusable scopes, we can't insert laser fiber into flected scopes. We can, uh, we can do it only with laser fiber, uh, bolted laser fiber, because when, when, if we use uh, standard laser fiber, we can perforate, perforate uh, these scopes and uh, we can damage it. But uh, this bolted fiber has uh, its advantage only for the first use. After first lasering, this bolt tip is destructed and you can't never uh, use it anymore. But in special cases of, of um, difficult anatomy, for example, you can try insert classic laser fiber uh, through flected scopes. This is the safety distance for scope. Um, the tip of laser fiber is in approximately one quarter uh, of the screen. With single-use flexible scopes, um, safety distance is not absolutely essential in critical situation in difficult anatomy. Single-use scopes are expensive and have a negative impact on environment uh, because they make too much trash. In conclusion, single-use flexible scopes have gained widespread popularity and have great impact on popularization of retrograde intranal surgery, especially in our country, in Slovakia. They have benefits for all censures, especially for low-volume censures, and for high-volume censures, it's very good to have also um, single-use with reusable scopes. With these scopes, we can push down the risk of sepsis. They may have better flexion with instruments inside working channel, and overall quality is nearly equal to reusable scopes, but high cost and substantial lack of evidence are still limiting uh, of their routine usage. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? I would have a question, if you don't mind. Um, is there a randomized study comparing single use and um, multiple use uh, ureterinoscopes um, concerning infection rate? You showed us the protein, everything fine, but is there evidence that we have more infection? Um, I didn't find, um, uh, there is lack of data. Um, single use scopes um, aren't uh, used in Europe, for example, for a long period. And I, unfortunately, I didn't find um, quali uh, quality uh, okay. study. I think this is very important that we have this data. And since we are producing a lot of trash, which you mentioned at the end, um, we have to weigh it against. Maybe. Any other questions? Okay. okay, then we proceed. I'm happy to announce Christian Seitz. <laughs> Technologic advances in advances advances in endourology, Christian. Yeah. Dear colleagues, thank you very much for the invitation and for being here. I'm talking about technologic adventures in endourology. I just picked the, um, in my eyes, most important, maybe you can help me with the, um, uh, I picked the, the most important aspects. There are many, there's a lot of things are going on. They're not really new things, but um, there are a lot of aspects that are developed further. So we have in, give me, yeah? Yeah, thank you, thank you. So it's my turn? Okay, so um, I just um, uh, come to the, to my, my uh, the, the previous, um, the previous presenter. He was talking about miniaturization. Miniaturization takes place. It will probably further take place. We don't know really where the limit is. I think um, with the old seeing needle, PNL, we have reached a limit in, in that respect. I think uh, PNL will not go into this direction. But with the flexible ureteroscopy, we have increasing small diameters. And as we have heard just before, the smallest one on the market right now of the single use instruments has about 7 or 7.5 French. 
diameter. So we will reduce the diameter of the urethral excess sheets. And this has some impact for our daily practice because as it was said before, we don't have to pre-stand patients, yes, but we probably don't have to stand patients after the procedure because we don't need to dilate the ureter. We don't need to put larger ureteral excess sheets in. We know when we have a 12 to 14 French sheet, we have 30% colics in those patients. So they probably need a stand maybe for one day, maybe longer. So this is an impact. Another aspect is that we will probably or that we will not need anymore to dilate the ureter with a, with a rigid scope. So we use less instruments. We have also less um, sterilization in that regard. We might not need a cystoscope. We just go in with a flexible. It is uh, rigid. It has a stiff shaft. So we go in and can do directly the procedure. We might save uh, the cost of a ureteral excess sheet as the ureter is maybe patent enough for such a small instrument for getting rid of the irrigation fluid. So it has a lot of impact on our, I think, daily practice and uh, in the OR, uh, besides the other aspects mentioned. Coming to the lasers, techniques, and systems, I think this is at the moment an important development. Um, the first study I found is about 34 years old. It's from 1988, where they had already 120 patients treated with a laser for urethral stones in 88, where SWL and PNL were the um, treatments of choice for, for stones. And uh, they used a green light laser with a 504 nanometer um, and uh, um, 200 micron fiber, similar to what we know for today. The procedure time was long, 1.3 hours, but the laser time was only 50 seconds in those patients. So at that time, ureteroscopy wasn't really established. So it was the procedure time. There was, I think, the problem, but lasering was not a problem. When you look at it, they had an anterograde. They had a good, good rates, stone free rates, anterograde 100%, 83% retrograde but they also perform blind laser lithotripsy. And we cannot even imagine how can you do that, but they did it. A, they argumented or argued that with a 504 a nanometer laser that has only very little tissue damage. So you can do that. And they did it at 23% stone-free case. It's interesting. I wasn't there. I don't know about the complication rates. They were not really reported that there were any, but however, that were the data, BJU, 120 patients. So, Nowadays, the Holmium laser lithotripsy is so far the gold standard because most of the hospitals for the last 20 years um, have, the, have this laser and, and use it. And um, we have here the Holmium-Yak laser. We have the, the Tullium fiber laser. I come to this later, of course, and the Tullium-Yak laser. This is not the same. Um, and when uh, we look at the Holmium-Yak laser and the Tullium-Yak laser, both have uh, similar dusting performances in uh, at similar settings. The tulium yak laser generates its lower energy pulses and has longer pulse durations to produce lower retroprosion than the whole yak laser at similar settings. But this also might lead to less fragmentation. There's a recent publication from Yannick a German publication demonstrating that this is probably the reason why the holmium yak laser has, a, has better uh, fragmentation capacities. However, um, there are still several limitations uh, that lead to prolonged operation time. So we still face the problem of worsening endoscopic view during laser operations um, because of a snowstorm effect and bleeding and stone fragments. Uh, lower energy could be passed uh, through the smallest fiber, which results in prolonged operation time, limited efficacy. So the fiber diameter is also a limitation. And we still have uh, to deal with um, retropulsion, which also becomes clinically significant. So taking all these obstacles together, um, there is a, oops, okay, I'm sorry. Taking all those obstacles together, there is a need to go on further uh, research on laser technology um, and to have newer innovations in the field of endovirology to improve the results. So what do we have, what do we see here? Um, the, we have on the, on the top, you see a normal Holmium yak laser. And here you have the Moses technology, which is an innovation that has been patented already in 1994, but it came into 
um, in the market with Luminous in 2017. There you have the, the difference is that you have two pulses in the in the Moses technology. That means the the first pulse, which you see on the on the lower image, that delivers a part to the energy to form this vapor bubble. And when you have the vapor bubble, once it is formed. Um, the second pulse delivers the rest of the energy through the already formed vapor channel. So a lot of energy comes to the stone and that is able to fragment the stone in a, in a, in a better, more effective way. And the, the data so far mentioned that there is 50% less retropulsion, about 20% faster procedure and 30% uh, more effective fragmentation. So with this new version, the ablation rate is higher and large clinical trials are, however, lacking as um, this is a relative novel um, system. And this is again a still image where you can see the, the primary bubble and then through this primary vapor bubble, the beam is going, the energy is going through and hits the stone with more energy and another area. If we compare those through lasers, uh, these three lasers I've demonstrated to you, you see these are the wavelengths for the tulium fiber laser, the tulium yak laser, holmium yak laser, and we see that the, um, the wavelength here for the tulium fiber laser is more absorbed in the water, and this leads to a more efficient breaking up of the stones. And if we compare the beam profile of the tulium fiber laser and the holmium yak laser, you have seen here the homium yak laser. There are a lot of that is a system. You have a lot of mirrors in the laser machine, and this leads to a less uniform beam profile, and it is less compatible with small fibers, uh, which results in energy and functioning limitations. And on the other side, when you see the tritium fiber laser, um, you can see the difference. It is highly organized there, uh, highly collaminated. It is more uniform. And you can use smaller fibers. You can go down to 50, 50 micro um, fiber with the tulium fiber laser. The tulium fiber laser, you see it here. Uh, it is a relatively small machine. We have it now also in our department. And if you compare it here, this is a, uh, work from Cronenberg. If here it's compared with the whole yak laser. And you see, for example, that you have the pulse energy. The pulse energy, you can go very, very low. This is not really practical in, in daily practice, but you can very low. You can do a very good dusting. And also the frequency going can go up to 2,200 hertz. You will not use it. You use about maybe 200, 300, maybe 400. But still, this is a lot of frequency. And you can, this is very effective in disintegrating the stone. And the pulse duration is also much longer, again, a factor for dusting. So you can really have a dusting, dusting defined that the, the dust is floating. It has below 500 microns, ideally 250 microns in diameter. So that is something you can really achieve with this machine. Um, it also results in uh, clinically in up to four times, but at least two times uh, faster ablation. Um, you have, as I said, smaller dust particles. Um, you have less retropulsion with the tulium fiber laser because the energy is so low, because the energy is the factor that um, gives you the retropulsion. Yeah. So, and altogether you have, uh, with a smaller fiber size, you have also, you might have a better irrigation, you might have a better vision um, because of the better irrigation. And this is something that has been demonstrated in vitro and is now also seen in vivo. On the other hand, there are several other aspects that are not directly translated into clinical results, but this is also for our daily life. You have a much smaller machine, it's lighter, it uses less energy. I think this is for us not so important, but I think it's interesting that it comes with 1000 watts. It can work with 1000 watts compared to 9000 or sometimes 12,000 watts with other machines. And um, you can use a normal uh, faucet for it, 220 volt in order to have the laser working, you don't need an extra 46 ampere faucet in your OR. There are some data I mentioned, basically all those advantages or differences between those lasers. Um, 
Uh, another aspect is the temperature difference. If you go high with fr the frequency, we have also to think about temperature. Um, and also the was the case with the high power holmium lasers. We also had to had to think about with longer procedural durations with the temperature and the the um, problem they might cause within the ureter or the, the kidney. And they didn't see any real differences between the tulium fiber laser and the holmium yak laser. But uh, we have to know that increasing the power proportionally increases the fluid temperature. And when we have 43 degrees of Celsius, we know that after 120 minutes, cell death can result. There is a study for that. Um, if we have 50 degrees Celsius for one minute or 56 for one second, it can also result in thermal damage. And we are coming to that area. So we have to be careful with our um, settings. So these are just recommendations. There are not really data on that so far, but these are recommendations from Taxes Group that in the ureteral stone, you should not use more than 50 of a watt. There was also an FDA warning uh, two years ago that they had some damages within the ureter, so you have to use uh, below 20 watt, and the new machines are preset for that. If you have, it depends also if you have irrigation or not. Yeah, so you use less watt if you have no good irrigation in the kidney, and of course you go higher if you have more irrigation. There's also a comparison now of holmium yak and tulium fiber lasers in a recent publication and prior studies demonstrated that the fibers, um, they do not fail with a mechanical stress. So if you bend them to a certain point, they don't really break, but rather they fail when the laser is activated. And this is also the reason why we have those, those instrument damages when we laser, for example, the, the lower calyx. Because in a, um, the, the consequence of this uh, fiber failures is that the working channel perforates because through the cladding and the jacket of the laser, some laser energy is going through. And that then can um, damage um, the, the flexible instrument. So this means that the failure is a consequence of a loss of actually total internal reflection during the laser activation in a bent fiber. And um, although 200 micrometer fibers are more flexible and maybe more suitable for the treatment of lower pole stones during flexible ureteroscopy, they're also more prone to failure when uh, there's a lasering. And so for the holmium yak laser, the 270 micron fibers seem to be a safer option for lower pole stones. And this was the first study that evaluated the risk of laser fiber fracture also with a tulium fiber laser. And um, of interest, uh, irrespective of the laser fiber diameter, laser settings, and also the bending radius, uh, no fiber fracture occurred in the tulium fiber laser. Thus, the treatment of lower pole stones uh, with the tulium fiber laser may be safer than with the holmium yak laser, uh, regardless of the fiber diameter. I think this is an interesting finding. And um, there is one randomized controlled trial from Martov et al. who compared um, the super the tulium fiber laser and the high power holmium laser for ureteral stone management. And um, in this first randomized clinical study, um, they looked at the laser time fragmentation and perioperative complications. And what they found is um, in a, this number of patients, 87 in each group, the total operation time was lower in the tulium fiber laser group, but especially the lasering time was lower, eight versus 15 minutes. So this is a, a significant difference. There was no retropulsion in 96% and only a mild retropulsion in 4% yeah, compared to higher numbers in the holmium yak laser group. Um, the visibility was much better. So clear view was in 87% compared to 64% in the holmium laser group. And um, standing was the same in both groups. But so the, the efficacy is much better. The complications were, let's say, similar. There was not a, a real significant difference. The numbers were really too low. But there was at least um, not any disadvantage regarding the tulium fiber laser. So at the end, the author stated that the efficiency of stone fragmentation is primarily due to lower retropulsion and also a better view. However, the settings of the laser are not established yet. 
for the home and yak laser, we have a lot of settings, a lot of publications, but for the thorium fiber laser, we do not have that. And in the previous study I just presented, they used the same settings for both, for the Hohenium laser and for the thorium fiber laser. So I found this interesting. Also, Traxair's group um, uh, just recently uh, presented that there is no consensus on those presettings. And um, this is just, is, is, there are many more people here who were presented in the study and all their settings. And so at the end, we can say at the moment, the settings are personal and depend on several factors. But we can say that when we start with a, with a lasering, especially in the ureter, but also in the kidney, or we should go with a very low frequency and low energy, as low as possible, and then gradually uh, start to rise it to see how the disintegration capacity is in order not to bring the ureter or the, the tissue at, damage, at, at danger. Another aspect is the suctioning during endoscopic stone disintegration procedures. Um, there's a study from Zhu with China. They're all from China, those studies at the moment, with 512 patients and in a one-to-one -one match pair analysis. And the use of suctioning in mini PCNL provided a higher stone free rate after a single procedure and fewer postoperative infectious complications. And that is something we would feel that if you have less pressure within the kidney, if you have a better turnover, a better suction of the fluid, that you have first better visibility, that probably is a reason also for the good results. You get all the small fragments, the dust out, and um, that might result also in less um, infection complications because it was all kinds of also septic shock that was not significant because the number was too low, but other infective complications were significantly lower. It had also a shorter operative, operative time at higher stone free rates. So this is something that seems to work. Uh, there's also a meta-analysis on that suctioning versus traditional access. The study from Zoo is also in here included. This is one of the studies. Um, and they found, I'll just make it short, that there is a higher stone free rate in the suction group. There is less operative time in the suction group. And most of the, of the studies were significant. Some cross uh, the line of insignificance, but most of them were insignificant. We have lower complication rates and we have lower um, auxiliary procedure rates. So the use of suctioning in mini percutaneous nephilitotomy provides a higher stone free rate after a single procedure, fewer postoperative infection complications. However, in this study, there were also some limitations. Uh, the stone free rate was defined as no residual stones larger than four millimeters. So I don't know if this is acceptable. Another aspect is that they used um, either non-contrast CT or KUB. So not all of them have a, have a CT scan. So these are, we know these are always problems when we compare studies with each other. But, and all included studies used uh, holmium laser lithotripsy. So different lithotripsy techniques as, for example, the tulium fiber laser might change uh, results here. There's also a study with a suction in ureteral stones. Um, the, it also significantly improved the stone free rate in stones smaller than 1.5, but also in stones larger than 1.5 centimeters. There were significant uh, differences. They had a rigid, flexible, and vacuum suction ureteroscopy. And the suction was adjustable. And um, they had, let's say, good stone free rates there. But however, larger randomized controlled trials are needed here to make safe conclusions. And also the operative time uh, was longer. They had a, a metal sheet that had uh, 13 French. So this is something that is something we don't really want to use. We want to get actually smaller, as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk. And this might not be usable. For example, in ureters, they are a little bit distorted. So, on. so this is just, uh, let's say, a pilot study. But I think uh, there's a tendency going into, into suction devices. When we have those suction devices, um, this is all about intrarenal pressure and visibility. There's a, a recent study to measure the intrarenal um, pressure during flexible ureteroscopy. That's only four patients they had. They underwent flexible ureteroscopy. And uh, they were able to, to really measure in real time the pressure inside. And it can be reliably and also conveniently monitored and recorded using just a, a tiny wire, which you can see here which is also placed within the kidney. So this is something that might 
all at the end come together with um, intelligent pumps, with intravenous pressure monitoring and suction devices. I think this all sums up to an ideal environment and safe environment for heteroscopy and PNL. So I come to my conclusion. It is nothing really completely new, but there's a tendency for further miniaturization of instruments without loss of efficacy. We have laser developments after using it now for about 30 years with still improved capabilities, dusting capabilities, improved vision. Suction devices will come, are on its way, and intraoperative real-time pressure monitoring is also an adjunct that will add up to our future safety and I think good results. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Christian, for the nice presentation and a great overview of the novelties in the flexible urethroscopy. Are there any questions from the floor? Just a short question, Christian. We are now, uh, we have more and more stronger and stronger lasers now, and it brings the opportunity to decrease the time of the operation, but is it at the expense of the later complications in the ureter especially? Because we have seen Sometimes ureteral strictures, when we tend to uh, have the high energy in short time operating at the cost of safety. I think in the ureter, high power is not so effective or relevant. Yeah? So okay. in the ureter, with a facing, I think, a 90% stones, I don't know, 5 to, to 8 millimeters or something like that. Um, this is not so effective. It, but however, yes, we, we have to be very careful there, not only with the high power lasers, also with the tritium fiber laser, with all lasers, because it's a, it's a question of energy that is within the ureter, and this should this energy will heat up the fluid. And so it's about the energy, it's about irrigation, it's about getting rid of the fluid. So that all comes together. Thank you. We are running late, so we will call on the next presenter. We start with a challenge to the expert. Should we treat four millimeter residual fragments? Can I do it also? Um, we have the case presentation. Okay. Dear Chairman, dear colleagues, so thank you very much. Uh, I will speak today instead of my colleague, Dr. Yara. She's unfortunately ill. And it's my pleasure to present you the introduction. Uh, this case of the challenge the expert session, should we treat four millimeter residual stones? The case is about a 55 year old male patient with recurrent stone disease. Uh, he had multiple uh, spontaneous passages in the past. He represents with uh, intermittent uh, left flank pain, suffers also from hypertension and atrial fibrillation uh, under therapy with oral anticoagulation. And he's also an sale agent and travels across Europe, which makes the case even more interesting. The CT scan, uh, uh, when he, uh, with uh, which we arrived at our department, uh, showed a 30 millimeter stone in the upper calyx of the left uh, kidney with 750 pounds unit, no hydronephrosis, and a negative urine culture. The treatment, uh, which was with a primary flexible retorenoscopy with a single use instrument, uh, an 11 uh, French uh, exit sheet due to a very narrow ureter, and interoperatively, and there was a uh, stone dusting and fragmentation done with a holmium yak laser. Due to the complicated anatomy, a lengthened uh, surgery time, and bedside, the endoscopic uh, status, uh, stone-free status at the end of the surgery was uncertain. So in the follow-up, a CT scan was uh, done again, and it showed a four millimeter residual fragment in the lower calyx of the left kidney. This time, the sto stone analysis of the surgery was 80% uh, calcium oxalate and 20% uric acid. And as we can see, the double J was still in place. So under these circumstances, my question to the experts, our question will be, should we treat the stone or not? Thank you very much. So our next speaker will be um, Dr. Weser. Yes, leave no stone behind. Can we have the presentation, please? 
I'm uh, happy to be here today, dear chairman, dear colleagues. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to uh, speak in front of you. And um, uh, I will defend uh, the statement to take out all the fragments today. So you all uh, heard the case now and uh, maybe thought about how bothersome can this small asymptomatic uh, storm be? Uh, may this even be a clinically insignificant uh, residual storm? This is a, a, a term or an expression uh, initially, uh, initially uh, um, used in the, in the shockwave uh, therapy era, where it is the national, um, the national course of the treatment that you will have some form of residual fragments in, uh, in the kitten or the, or the ureter in the following days uh, or weeks after the treatment. But <clears throat> even back then, there was a growing concern about uh, the, the clinical insignificance of these uh, residual fragments, since studied, uh, studies had shown that uh, almost half of the patient uh, had a stone-related event in the, in the uh, follow-up time of uh, 26 months, and, uh, and even more patients had a regrowth of the stone in, uh, in the next 15 months. But uh, this uh, expression got stuck in our minds, maybe uh, due to the fact that it uh, can be helpful in, uh, in communicating to your patient that you still uh, performed a successful treatment, even though you left some small fragments behind. Um, but uh, even in other treatment modalities, like in the PNL, we could show that in 43% of the patients, uh, uh, we had a stone recurrence in the, in the, in the follow-up period. And also in the in the URS, we uh, we could show that uh, one third of the patient had uh, had uh, some form of uh, stone uh, regrowth or even became symptomatic in uh, in uh, in the future. And what about other complications uh, besides regrowth or retreatment? What about the infectious complications of these uh, residual stones? There's one uh, one study analyzing um, over 700 PNL patients who had a residual fragment uh, at the end of the procedure, and uh, and they uh, did show that uh, those uh, patients had a higher likelihood of uh, systematic uh, inflammatory response uh, syndrome. And uh, more interestingly, or uh, an additional information is that in this subgroup of patients. Uh, there was no correlation between the, the perioperative uh, stone or urine culture. So this, uh, 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 the positivity um, of these cultures, uh, that means that we can't even predict those patients who are at uh, higher risk uh, of these uh, uh, infectious complications beforehand. And we have uh, learned a lot, of, uh, lot about uh, the pathophysiology and the mechanisms of kidney stone formations uh, formation in the last uh, in the last years, and uh, one of the one of the mechanisms that has been described is uh, is the stone formation around the stone needles. It's uh, like a seed where the super saturated uh, crystals in the urine uh, will attach to and uh, grow bigger, and uh, maybe ultimately uh, lead to symptoms like a renal colic. And uh, this is a study, a study summarizing uh, the evidence uh, we have so far um, published last year. It's a systematic review and a meta-analysis um, uh, looking at the natural history of those residual fragments. And uh, the colleagues uh, did uh, show uh, or did analyze the re-intervention rate as well as the, the disease progression rate and the, uh, and the spontaneous passage, passage rate of, uh, of those uh, fragments and grouped them into stones larger and smaller than four millimeters and they could show that even the smaller uh, fragments smaller than four millimeters had a, had a re-intervention rate of 22 percent so every fifth patient had a, had a re-intervention um, even for those super small stones or residual fragments and if if the if the stone was bigger or the, the fragment was bigger the rate uh, uh, arose to almost every second patient who had a, had a re-intervention and uh, the same goes for the disease progression, which uh, was 47% uh, in the smaller stones and even 88% in the, in the larger stones. And the uh, spontaneous passage rate was as low as 18% uh, as in stones four millimeters or bigger. Having all this evidence now, we, re we really should uh, think about um, 
the term clinically insignificant residual fragment since a lot of those patients develop symptoms, develop uh, a regrowth of the of the stone. Uh, we really should uh, should uh, take uh, this expression to bed and continue in in uh, communicating clear and honest to your patient. And uh, now we have to think about uh, a second treatment, and we just heard about. Uh, about this uh, this uh, vast uh, um, uh, vast uh, um, uh, developments, uh, the new developments uh, in in especially in endourology, like the miniaturiz uh, the miniatur miniaturization of the instruments, uh, um, which leads uh, which lead to a to a um, decrease of the invasiveness of the procedure and ultimately to decrease in complication rates as well. And we have these uh, these new high power lasers or, or new laser systems where we can uh, turn the stone into into not only fragments but dust. And uh, and this dust we we should uh, be able to flush out our scope or uh, suction it out of the scope or even aspirate it through our our uh, our instruments. And um, this uh, this helps in 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 the tedious work of. Uh, of uh, pulling out all the single fragments uh, one by one and just uh, turning the, the stones uh, into dust and flushing it out. This already leads to my conclusion that uh, if you don't want to take out the stone because it's, uh, it's a large stone and, uh, and uh, you don't want to spend too much time um, in your uh, to take out every single st stone, just turn it into dust and uh, and flush it out or um, suction it out. And uh, there should be no shame in second look procedures. You should be uh, communicating clear to your patient that if you want to treat them minimally invasive and you have a you have a big stone that uh, there might there might be the necessity of uh, of second or even third look procedures. And uh, and if the patient knows it beforehand, he he won't be. Uh, dissatisfied with the with the outcome if if the stone clearance isn't uh, isn't done in the in the first setting, and you should also adapt the treatment to the to the patient to the situation. If you didn't uh, uh, succeed with the with the uh, clearance of the stone with one procedure, just uh, just think about uh, switching to to the other procedure where you might have uh, uh, where you might be more uh, success, uh, successful in this regard. And we really should think about the expression clinically insignificant residual fragments since a lot of those patients develop symptoms and for them this is uh, for sure significant. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you so much. Contrary to the idea that we should uh, leave no stone behind, there are urologists who think that that's irrelevant. And Dr. Shendre from Hungary is. Thank you. First of all, I absolutely agree with you, but that's not the end of my speech. Okay. Um, but really, uh, we have uh, we have to remove all the stones uh, we could, and leave those stones unturned in the patient. But first of all, I have a lot of questions about the case presented at the, um, <clears throat> the previous case. Why do this patient have symptoms? Because uh, it seems to be that it was an upper calyx stone, some attached somewhere in the, in the, in the uh, calyx wall. So I'm not sure that these symptoms come really from, uh, from the stone. Uh, what was the battery background of the patient? So now it is not only the uh, not only the problem if we leave a four millimeter fragment there, uh, we can solve this metabolic disorder, making the patient uh, uh, more and more stones um, after the years. Uh, and now we know uh, well that uh, after the procedure, the stone is located somewhere in the lower calyx. But why do you uh, perform a CT scan? So it is regularly you, uh, it is your regular checkup, or or you have some problem with the patient. So that uh, raises the question again. Um, but about the the um, uh, the anatomy of the lower calyx. Um, 
to be honest, we do not perform uh, enough uh, contrast enhanced uh, CDs at our department as well. So we do not know pre uh, previously the operations, um, the correct anatomy. So now in, in that case, and I think that you should know about uh, the anatomy because if the patient has a very long and narrow uh, calyx, then it can change uh, your mind and, and your decision as well. Um, we have uh, seen that this stone was a mixed stones and it, it was partly uh, made of uh, uric acid so you can dissolve it or not. I think that this patient was not fit for, uh, for the shockwave lithotripsy because of the anticoagulant uh, therapy and uh, this uh, Hounsfield unit comes from uh, the very low Hounsfield units of the uric acid and the very high uh, Hounsfield units of the calcium oxalate monohydrate. Um, and what about with the lifestyle of the patient as well? Because we, uh, so another procedure can be uncomfortable, can be expensive, um, uh, but on the other hand, uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, he, he flies all over Europe um, as a professional. So it can, it can change your decision as well. So sometimes a tiny stone can change the whole history and uh, we were just uh, speaking about the clinically insignificant reserve fragments, so I don't want to repeat those thoughts about them. But now my question is that why do we leave uh, stones in the patients at all? Sometimes it is a must, just like in our case. Um, because you are facing with such a big high uh, stone burden because of the hard stone, uh, because of the complicated upper urinary tract, or you can just get in trouble, you have a bleeding, you have a perforation, or sometimes your surgical skills or equipments are not enough to solve the, um, solve the situation. On the other hand, sometimes it could be your strategy, that's what we were, uh, what we were talking about or we discussed previously, the dust and run strategy with, uh, with high frequency and low energy laser, you can dust the stone and leaving reserve fragments. But what's wrong with the uh, traditional active stone removal? The active stone removal, I mean that you fragment the stone and basketing remo uh, removing the stone. First of all, it makes a significantly higher uh, operative time. Um, and the higher uh, and the longer operative time means more complications from surgical and from anesthesiological point of view. And on the other hand, it makes higher costs as well. Uh, and if you go up, down, up, down in your ureter, uh, you can, uh, there's a higher risk for uh, the ureter injury. Uh, so that's why it is advised to use an ureter access sheet, but the ureter access sheet itself can damage our ureter. Of course, uh, in the majority of the cases, those are uh, superficial injuries, but we can uh, do. And of course, those disposables has their cost as well. Uh, some other disadvantages of this active stone removal, uh, the, nitinal, the nitinal baskets can be entrapped. Look at uh, this nice case for, uh, for the nightmare session. Uh, one of our uh, young colleagues just teared off the ureter uh, and pulled out uh, through the penis of the patient with a dormia basket and trapped. Um, <clears throat> On the other hand, um, if you use these high energy laser settings, the, the risk of the stone retropulsion can be higher than uh, in uh, case of the low energy and, and high frequency laser. Um, <clears throat> and it can uh, shorter the lifetime of your scope if you uh, put different devices, dormio baskets. And uh, the dusting is a one-man show. It can be boring, but... Uh, but it, it depends only on you. But if you are uh, uh, for the active stone removal, you need a qualified staff as well. Um, so there were some nice studies uh, on the uh, ins uh, insignificant reserve fragments. Um, this was a big multi-center uh, international prospective study involved more than 150 patients. Uh, and the operation time for the uh, basketing was uh, longer, but there were no difference in the readmission rates, the reintervention rates, and in the symptoms of the patient. And uh, I think that this other paper, Akan, has the same uh, conclusion as well. Um, 
I just put some papers. We are running out of time, so I, uh, I compare them in, in uh, one slide. Uh, but as you can see, the, um, uh, the need of the secondary procedures, there were no difference if you compare the dusting and fragmenting method. In the complication rate, there were no uh, real differences. Uh, and, um, um, but in the operation time, uh, there was a significantly uh, longer if you uh, look at on the fragmenting. So now arises the question that are those uh, all the fragments are so dangerous? Uh, if you look at not on the flexible scope studies as we uh, previously um, <clears throat> seen, but on the on the P PCNL studies, that uh, they can conclude that every fourth patient has residual fragments after the procedures, but only 15% of them uh, needed further intervention. So it means that uh, that less than 4% of all, all the PCNA patients needed further interventions because of their uh, fragments. Uh, so I think that we can conclude uh, altogether that that should be a, a personalized treatment decision. And I would like to just give uh, at the end some, some advices. Um, first of all, uh, your decision should be, depends on the composition of the stone. Uh, if you have uh, infected stone or the, if the patient has a metabolic background, the, the regrowth rate is very high. So you should remove all the fragments. Contrary, if you, for example, facing a uric acid stone, you can dissolve the small fragments. So it is not, uh, you, you don't have to be so active. Uh, it depends on the anatomy as well. If you have strictures or, or tricky anatomy or uh, tricky lower calyx, it is better to remove because uh, uh, the risk of the, um, of the stone regrowth is uh, higher. Um, Again, uh, some words about the complications. It could happen that you have a bleeding, perforation, or ju you just simply run out of the operation time. The patient has a lot of other comorbidities. And then in this, uh, in this cases, for example, uh, it is better uh, to choose a possible secondary intervention and leave some fragments there than uh, a, a long-lasting procedure. And now to be be honest, to, um, we are among us, so don't be shy. We can uh, talk about the costs as well. Um, um, the whole situation and your decision, it depends on how can you escape. So what are your options for handling the fragments if they couldn't be passed by the patient? Do you have a shockwave lithotripter? or do you have the possibility of the, of the minimal invasive treatments? Are all the disposables mentioned before covered by your insurance company? Or uh, are the secondary interventions covered by, this, uh, the, by your insurance company or not? To be honest, for example, nowadays in Hungary, um, we are after the COVID era, we are full of a lot of patients. Uh, the, uh, the patients are presented for one year and waiting for the operations with huge stones. So I would never go for. Uh, I, I will, so I think my boss will never allow me to uh, to go for this four millimeter big fragments. Uh, but um, that's that uh, depends on the country and and the possibilities as well. Um, so, or Bible, the EAU guidelines uh, told us that uh, if you have a stone, it is a maximum diameter of four millimeter, it, uh, it will be passed uh, within 40 days in 95% of all the cases. Um, and as I told you, sometimes leaving a reserve fragments is less invasive, quicker and cheaper than make the patient stone free in one uh, step. And uh, that is very, uh, very, very important that if you have resda fragments after the procedure, it is compulsory the regulatory follow up of the patients and you should advise the patient high fluid intake and doing exercises uh, and proper medication and frequent sexual intercourse as well because it can facilitate the stone passage and then in that case is the, the quality of life of your patients can be as good as you can remove the all, all, all part of the stones. So thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> So the floor is open for discussion. We have to hurry a little bit, maybe one or two questions. No questions? 
debate. Uh, <laughs> if, if I can ask a personal question, if you, each of you, had a residual stone of four millimeters, what would you actually opt for? I guess I personally would uh, would go for uh, take the mic, please. I personally would go for treatment. Undecided if I really want to do a, a endoscopic uh, procedure, depending how, on how good uh, 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 I tolerated it the first time. But uh, shockwave uh, treatment might be might be an option for me myself. But uh, for a four four millimeter stone, you would go for the shock treatment. In that case, I, I think I, I wouldn't choose the shockwave lithotripsy because of it is. Uh, Liverpool. Made of uric acid stone and calcium acid monohydrate stones, and the patient has coagulopathy as well, and it is located in the lower calyx. Um, but on the other hand, I think I would uh, I would wait for a while, and if the patient is not able to uh, with a with a regular ch uh, checkup, and if the patient is not able to avoid it, or if the patient has symptoms, or I can see the regrowth of the uh, stone, I would go for a flexible scope and remove it. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, I think we all like the part of frequent sexual intercourses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we start in the next session. Voiding dysfunction, not to be forgotten, and two fantastic uh, chairs that will take us through an exciting next session with topics that are not only hot, but also where the data is not that rich and debate a little bit more experience will count. Thank you so much for the two. Thank you, Shark. And we will move right on, uh, just not to uh, lose much time. So the first speaker will be uh, Professor Marta from Romania, and she will talk about management of overactive bladder in frail elderly patients. And I think that will be very uh, interesting for us because we all have more and more of these patients. Please. Thank you uh, one more for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here and to participate at this Congress. I want a little intermezzo to present my little town, which is at the heart of Transylvania. It's in Siebenburgen. Uh, it's named Turgumures Marusvasare Neumarka Mirsch. We are a multicultural, multi ethnic uh, little town. We have a beautiful university and we have also a clinic. And uh, I'm the head of, head of department, and my colleagues are looking forward to you and greeting you. So, why Ferrer elderly? Uh, time goes by, we get older, but just our morals got better. A small introduction, unhappily, social aging, one of the greatest problems of the 21st century, aged above 65 years, then are uh, more than uh, 20 and less. What is this overactive and frailty? Why it's so common and why it's the theme of my presentation today? Because we talk about the multidimensional syndrome and the prevalence of both increases with age. But urinary urgency may well be a precursor of frailty. What does the definition of frailty covers? It uh, is an accumulation of impairment it is a phenotypic model, a biologic syndrome of decreased reserve and resistance to stressors, impaired physical activities, mobility, balance, muscle strength, motor processing, cognition, nutrition, and even endurance, not synonymous with disability and or comorbidities. And it means that the subject uh, is taking five or more drugs. OAB is as we all know, with urgency, with or without urgency incontinence, usually with increased daemon frequency and nighttime frequency above 10 micturition by day, a small volume, less than 150 millis. The prevalence is uh, high and it is increasing by the age. So uh, it's uh, by the starting is similar uh, in men and women at about 12 and 70 percent, 
but uh, it has a very important uh, activity and an impact on quality of life. 32% of the patients became depressive and 28 of them feel extremely stressed. Uh, OAB is, is associated with substantial clinical and economic burden. So uh, it's a progressive debilitating condition that has a significant impact on quality of life. How to prevent, how to treat it correctly. It's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, thing that uh, our bladder has a memory and uh, our bladder is getting older and suffering lot conditions in childhood increases the risk of uh, lot in adult period of OAB and uh, it's important to treat childhood dysfunctional, dysfunctional avoiding early. Uh, among uh, factors, we presume that obesity, uh, lifestyle, uh, uh, smoking, sedentary, hormonal status, and I am thinking about the women, especially pelvic surgery, the slings which are uh, indicated uh, wrongly or uh, performed wrongly, mental disorders, cognitive disorders, a population is getting older. We are nowadays performing surgery in uh, patients older than 80 years. HBP, lots, even male can uh, present OAB symptoms. Endocrinological disorders, diabetes, hypothyroidism, cardiovascular affection, hypertension, neurological pathology, stroke, Parkinson's disease, asthma, low cerebral level of 5-HT, uh, especially demonstrated that in women blocks the mechanism that empties the bladder. So I don't want to present the diagnostic features because we all know what we can do generally, but what is special for uh, frail elderly is that uh, in uh, somehow, we have to focus uh, on residual urine because our bladder is aging and our bladder can become hypercontracted. So never forget to see the residual urine and the gait speed, which is a, a novel phenomenon and the overactive bladder and their, their association is of utmost importance. Of course, bladder diary, but diary are uh, associated with caretakers. So we have to have a conversation uh, and a decision in this direction. So what are our goals? What is practically which uh, our treatment desires? Is, uh, it, what is, uh, possibilities do we have nowadays? With Blue, you have the facilities for uh, fraidly elderly. So we have conservative therapy. Uh, very, very, very important lifestyle intervention, physical therapies, even in frail elderly, behavioral ones, electrostimulation, external, internal, intervaginal, interrectal ones, and posterior tibial nerve stimulation. Among the pre -pre appropriate drug treatment, I will underline the anticholinergic treatments, especially the antimascarinic burden. And of course, better three agonist, surgical management, uh, just a few of them which can be uh, uh, indicated in elderly. So general lifestyle changing, pelvic floor exercising are very well calmed. Internal external electrostimulation uh, with this chair we perform uh, electrostimulation stimulation is very good results after prostatectomies. The sooner the better are the results, but for the women in frail elderly, the, uh, uh, the results are really good. Uh, posterior tibial nerve stimulations uh, during a period of 12 weeks, uh, 30 minutes, um, twice, uh, twice or three times a week has good results. The peroneal neuromodulation is a nucleid on the, a nucleid on the block. It's with uh, promising results, but uh, I found no uh, presentations or no um, studies uh, uh, due uh, among the frail elderly, especially treatment from them. Uh, why is special to treat the frail elderly? Because we have to consider uh, the OAB medication from a different perspective, from the perspective of multiple drugs, because our, patient, uh, our patients are taking multiple drugs for hypertension, for cognitive impairment, for uh, Parkinson's disease, and so on, because of the age, because of the anticholinergic burden, because the frailty. And uh, the existing health issues and the associated 
medications uh, have an impact on our treatment decision. So the risk of dementia, one of the most important issues that we have to deal with, a use of three or more months, uh, some of the anticholinergics can facilitate the uh, presence of the dementia and even a, a progressive evolution of dementia. And another, another problem is the cardiovascular uh, secondary effect, uh, especially regarding the Q2 interval prolongation with the, with the risk of a life-threatening um, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which can be of utmost importance. So, anticholinergic anti burden, what does it mean? We all know that uh, the bladder function is um, very well defined and the anti uh, have a relevant impact on the storage function, uh, but they all, uh, all, uh, also have side effects. Among uh, these side effects is, uh, especially for, for free elderly, the dry mouth, the constipation, it's uh, relevant, we have to deal with it. The central, the dizziness, the somnolence, the confusion is uh, in few cases seen. The, uh, the burden becomes uh, more important when there are several uh, drugs which have an anticholinergic uh, effect. So in elderly, the cholinergic activity is increased because the Bread, the barrier, the bladder and the brain barrier is more permeable and therefore the anticholinergic increases in volume in the blood and therefore it has an impact and a very important effect on brain activity. The central nervous system deterioration uh, concerned the, the cognitive impairment by anti drugs has been confirmed in clinical studies with oral oxybutynin, especially in women. Darifenosine, tolterodine, solifenosine, and trospium chloride demonstrate little or no significant impact, impact on the cognitive function on healthy elderly patients. I have, to pres I have to tell you that there are very, very few studies concerning elderly and uh, frail elderly treatment, especially in OAB. So the anticholinergic burden, it's an important fact. There are uh, about 600 medication which have a slightly burden. Uh, they are few with more burden, and uh, of course, anti muscarinic have the most burden. But if a patient has several therapies, uh, anti-amatic, uh, hypertension treatment, or uh, for cognitive impairment of uh, antidepressant, and he has also a treatment for hyperactive bladder, then this burden is very, very important. So what about better three agonists? My background and uh, my background, which is the new entrance regarding this category of, um, of medication for OAB, uh, has a very good status because it, there are two studies. I found the Japanese one and one with uh, Adrian Weg that um, demonstrated that this uh, drug has a very good efficacy, safety, and tolerability, even if it's uh, administrated in frail elderly uh, in patients above 65 years old. The long-term outcomes of myrobagram, the treatment of overactive bladder in different groups of patients had a very good result. And so in our uh, presentation, in my presentation, I can assume that uh, besides the anti muscarinic which can be which can be used myra background is one of the solution but uh, uh, what about uh, the male patients who have uh, storage symptoms uh, due to hyperplasia hyperplasia can we uh, treat overactive bladder it's uh, it's an interesting um, uh, uh, team, I don't want to enter too much. It's that one uh, presumption that uh, Myra background can be used in these cases, uh, but we have to deal with the residual urine, and of course, uh, flometry will be of utmost help. 
So uh, what can we use? That what are the current available medical treatments for elderly people suffering from OAB? You can see them here. There is oxybutynin, which is not recommended. Trospium, low propensity. Tolterodine, low rates of adverse events. Then oxybutynin, tolterodine, pesoterodine, a unique drug. Uh, it's a unique, the most important one that um, had uh, specific studies designed for elderly patients. Solifenacin, darifenacin, uh, imidafenacin, they are not very well studied, in, uh, especially in frail elderly. And uh, the combination treatment is uh, well defined, especially in male. Uh, in uh, the new guidelines of 2022, you have a volume and a chapter uh, for frail elderly and uh, it's a very good, um, I think, uh, problem that is, is discussed because uh, underactive bladder, hypoactive bladder is very uh, frequent um, met in elderly, especially in frail elderly. But how can, uh, can we improve the results? How can we uh, lower the anticholinergic burden? It's the FORTA. It's the FORTA list which is very, very suitable to us to use in practice and which, which is the fit for age list. There are four categories. The A is indispensable drug, clear out cut benefit in terms of efficacy. The B is the drug with proven or obvious efficacy in the elderly, but limited ex extent of uh, effect. The C, and here is the phesoterodine, the C is drugs with questionable efficacy safety uh, with administration, but with uh, problems uh, among the indication. And uh, you have to control, especially those uh, elderly who have some cognitive dysfunction or who are uh, in um, a cure for anxiety or uh, depression. And from this group uh, is uh, derifenacin, uh, myrobegram, extended release oxybutynin, solifenacin, and the D is, has to uh, be avoided. So what about invasive treatment, sacral neuromodulation? Uh, there is a presentation uh, regarding this problem, but it's not very well discussed in the literature. But I found... Um, presentation uh, with uh, on a botulin toxin A uh, in association with some bulking agent uh, with very good results and promising results, especially in frail elderly women. So what brings the future? Uh, it's obvious that uh, we are getting old and uh, according to the International Monetary Fund, uh, older workers will have to retire much later uh, in the future to help pay for a rapidly increased costs and uh, rapidly increasing cost means treatment for OAB for frail elderly. And uh, more uh, patients be OAB, more costs. What are the challenges? What are the tasks for us, for the for young urologists? Uh, there are uh, some issues regarding deep brain stimulation, optogenetic neuromodulation, transient receptor potential channels, uh, intravesical installation associated with low energy shock wave and administration of uh, liposomes. As conclusion, there are a few uh, take home messages, if you permit me to say so. Uh, OAB is a chronic progressive and debilitating condition that has a significant impact on quality of life, especially in case of elderly. We have to identify risk factors for OAB and avoid if we can even treat them. And this is uh, OAB and lifespan evolution. We have to recognize as early possible the child with OAB, lack of studies in this area. There is no a few studies for children less than eight years old. Uh, and time as chronic burden in elderly patients should be always noted. Introduce the FORTA in your daily practice and management correctly the frail elderly. Frailty index need to be introduced and further studies needed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Martin, for this clear presentation. Any questions from the audience? Yes, please. 
Primus Graz. Thank you for your nice presentation. But if you speak about the elderly, very elderly patient, especially frail elderly patient, then the drug therapy is only add-on. The first pillow in this patient is um, a toilet training. That means the, 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 uh, <clears throat> the patient has to learn to go to the toilet before he feels the urgency of voice. Most of them, but they feel the urge of voice. The underwear is, is wet. And uh, the drug therapy is in this patient where we have a so-called OAB. But in the, in the frail elderly, we have not the classical OAB, but we have the neurogenic uninhibited bladder. This is also a problem of the sensory of the, of the bladder feeling. They don't feel the bladder. They feel the bladder at the moment, 150 or 150 milliliter. And this moment, has a contraction and the urine is running. Thank you. Yes, uh, it's, I, I fully agree with you. The prompted, uh, prompted voiding is what is the, the first issue. We have to deal with this frail elderly. And uh, in those patients where this uh, prompted uh, voiding, uh, uh, bladder rehabilitation uh, or pelvic floor exercising, or electric stimulation are the first steps. And then afterwards, we can have an idea or an indication regarding uh, treatment, medic medication, uh, medication treatment. But it's very important, as you said, that we have to exclude overactive detrusor, and overactive detrusor can be excluded only by urodynamics. In this patient, the indication of urodynamics is a bit limited. You have to deal with the burden uh, regarding the treatment. Have to, you have uh, to have a very good indication regarding urodynamics. So after my uh, opinion, uh, you are perfectly right. Uh, the drug uh, is be the second or even the third uh, therapy for this uh, frail elderly. We have one more question. Um, in spite of so many drugs we have, and you try some people, you know, the elderly people especially, you try the one drug you, for one month, two months, you get better, and after that, you get the same problems. But most of the people, they have got the residual urine and the overactive blazer together. And you give both combination therapy, still they are not getting better. But I think in these patients, you need sometimes intermittent self catheterization at the evening to reduce the bladder burden and they will become better. Uh, yes, if overactive bladder is uh, with associated with underactive bladder and you have a great <coughs> volume of residual urine, I fully agree with you, you have to do self intermittent catheterization. But uh, pay attention, don't, uh, don't give the second and the third line of treatment. It's you have to be very precautious when you uh, combine uh, anti-muscarinics with beta-3 agonists. It's not a, a good combination, especially for frail elderly. Thank you. May I have one question yes, to you? Please. Nice presentation, Thank very you. difficult topics. And as, uh, as far as I know, in our country and UK, probably in your country, you have, we have two lines of uh, anticholinergic drugs and we have to start with first line. There are some restrictions to start with second line. Yes, and right. according to your conclusion, you have recommended us that we can start uh, for elderly, frailly patient with second line, for example, Maya Bagel. Or we have to start with the, uh, the first line. They are the most of the studies uh, are with myrobagna. That's the that's the clear uh, mm -hmm. answer. The, they so are your two recommendation to start uh, with above myrobagna. sixty-five years old patients and frail elderly. They are the uh, most important studies. Mm -hmm. There are the, the, if you. Uh, in one of the slides I presented, you can start with, for example, solifenacin, yes, but in a special cohort of patients with no cognitive impairment, it is a very strict control. And uh, never, well, I never start with medication, medication all the uh, time. I start with something as lifestyle exchange, uh, uh, discussing what the take, take, uh, take care uh, and prompt avoiding and so on. And electrostimulation. Electrostimulation has very good results in other uh, population. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Now I am pleased to open the second part of our session. Uh, it will be challenge of the expert, uh, what is the best surgical approach for management of PPH? If you look to guidelines for the last edition of guidelines, there are a lot of recommendation of treatment, of surgical treatment of BPH. And we, would uh, we are looking forward to hear which are the best uh, way to treat patients surgically. For uh, the first uh, uh, present uh, will be by Dr. Moon Mun from Austria. It will be a case presentation. Dear Chair, dear colleagues, um, I'm very honored to be part of this session with very two dis uh, distinguished expert, Professor Achia from Graz and Professor Lusuadi from Salzburg. Thank you for coming. I prepared the case um, with a 62-year-old male, and he was treated for low urinary tract symptoms by an office urologist in Vienna. His prostate was quite large, 180 milliliters. You can see the MRI scan and he got that MRI scan because his PSA was around six, but it was only a Pirates 2 lesion. He had an IPSS of 29 and residual urine of 100 milliliters. So he was treated with Temsolosin. It was okay. I, I don't think it's surprising that in the course of, that he developed an urinary retention of 800 milliliters and the catheter removal was unsuccessful, so he was referred by that office urologist to an external hospital for further treatment, but it was during the pandemic, so there was a long waiting list. And in the meanwhile, the colleagues treated him with a suprapubic catheter because he did not tolerate the yeah, transurethral catheter. Uh, unfortunately, uh, short after that, he developed a myocardial infarction and got a stent to his left anterior descending and got three months of the dual platelet therapy with clopidogrel and aspirin. And after that, just the aspirin monotherapy. With these results, then he was transferred to our hospital because the colleagues um, there, they were not comfortable doing this procedure on a large prostate under aspirin. And in the analysis, an analysis in the analysis, this, this showed that the patient uh, also suffered from the recurrent obstruction of the suprapubic catheter. In the culture, there was a bacteria with, with pseudomonas, aeruginosa, and, but it was asymptomatic, so we did not treat it. <laughs> and because of the pandemic, there was, of course, um, problems with office urologists in Vienna. So the medical care, it was quite problematic with the changes of the sort of pubic catheter. So we got him an early appointment for surgery. Right before surgery, when we talked to the patients, uh, he went online and checked a lot of information and he re read a lot about the TRP and was very concerned about the ejaculation problems. And he told us that he's sexually active, very active. He has a much younger partner. And he, he has a strong wish for the anti-grade ejaculation. So what next? Professors, the stage is yours. Thank you. So now we have two experts to try to convince us which is the best. And Dr. Ahiai will try to convince us that prostatic enucleation is the best. Yeah, dear Chairman, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to give a talk about prostatic enucleation. Um, I think we will discuss the case later after we heard Professor Luswadi also. Yes. It's a very good case, um, good choice. I think the problem is the anti-grade ejaculation. On the other hand, um, he already had myocardial infarction. He is on Plavix and, and so on. Um, and let's say having a complete disobstruction does not mean that you cannot have sex afterwards. Okay, but let's discuss this later. Now there's my presentation. Um, prosthetic enucleation, the gold standard. There's no question mark for me and for many people. Meanwhile, um, we have to be aware that prosthetic enucleation means tumor enucleation. Um, 
the BPH is a benign tumor of the transitional zone. And I think, as you can see in the images here, you would never think approaching a tumor by chopping out pieces of it. And um, that's why we, in the, in the history, and we still, we perform prosthetic enucleation. And I think it's more than intuitive to do it transurethrally. That's what we are doing since many years. And um, I will present you data from Holeb, which is representative for anatomic endoscopic enucleation of the prostate, which is the terminology of today. So in 2016, Holeb turns 18, um, which means that at that time um, we had a publication and we, we saw that Holeb at that time was the first minimal invasive alternative for TRP mentioned in all the three guidelines, NICE, AUA, and EAU guidelines, which means that um, it withstood the test of time. And once more, I'm, I'm saying here that HOLIP is just a representative since it's the oldest procedure for AEEP. Okay, and why did it withstood the test of time? Just because we, we have 24 years of history of HOLIP and we can see all the data, it's the, it's the yellow line here, and it's the oldest minimal invasive procedure. And until now, this is 2020, end of 2020, we have a lot of published data. So we can state that HOLAB as a representative of AEP is the most widely scrutinized surgical technique for LUTs or BPH. So, and this is a big part of the body of evidence which we, which we are facing, which we are having our randomized controlled trials, comparing um, HOLEP or AEP with TRP, with open prostatectomy, with bipolar TRP, and all come to the same results, and it makes it easy to shorten or to conclude that AEP or HOLEP has lower intraoperative and perioperative mobility, it is at least equally effective as TRP and open prostatectomy, and it has significantly um, shorter catheter time and length of hospital stay. The late complications which we are facing are rare, and um, most of the time it's a urethral stricture or a bladder neck contracture, but it's really rare, and we see it as often as we see it in TRP and open prostatectomy. And one very important point for me is that um, HOLEP or AEP is totally independent of prostate size. So you, you do not have to care about the prosthetic volume preoperatively as you have to do maybe in TRP. Um, this is a meta-analysis. Again, we are talking about um, uh, HOLEP or AEP in comparison to other procedures. And um, let's say um, HOLEP was the first procedure as a representative of AEP, which showed to be more effective, demonstrating better um, Cumax and better IPSS um, reduction. So why is that so? Um, why do we have um, better results? Because we retrieve more tissue by AEP as by TRP. This is something which we found out in randomized controlled trials, showing that HOLIP retrieved more tissue than TRP, significantly more tissue. And this leads to better symptom relief. Um, if we take out more tissue, we have a higher grade of this obstruction. Um, these are urodynamic studies. It's from Tanit already published 2003. And we can see here you have a higher grade of um, this obstruction. Even here in the Schaefer grade, you have a lower Schaefer grade in the whole lab group. So, but there are also other intrinsic advantages of anatomic enucleation, endoscopic enucleation of the prostate. Um, besides um, taking out more, more prosthetic tissue, you can see that um, by enucleating, using here the Holmium laser, but also other devices, and now that Professor um, Lusoadi is um, using bipolar enucleation to tackle the prostate, um, you can see that simultaneously to the enucleation, you are coagulating, bleaching all the little bleeders, so it's more hemostatic, um, and you have a better vision, and you have a full histology. So there's an intrinsic advantage by enucleation. Um, if you come to the tissue retrieval rate, um, this is a, an older publication, but we could show 
even very time, or let's say 10 years ago almost, that um, using um, enucleation, you are faster than TRP and as fast as an open prostatectomy, simple open prostatectomy. Of course, this is dependent on your personal skills. These are data from um, Göttingen, where, where I worked until recently. Um, this is um, the whole lip data out of 2018. We performed um, more than 200 toe labs, and this is the mean enucleation weight in the total cohort. Um, and we had a mean enucleation weight of 72 gram, and we, the, the total operative time was 54 minutes, which led to a mean speed of um, resection of 1.3 gram, which in, in the very fast whole labs, it was up to three grams. So it, can be, and in general, in, in trained hands, it's also a very fast procedure. Um, at the end, AEP never gets boring. Um, you have different um, techniques you can approach with a three-lobe or two-lobe technique, which is advisable, especially when you're learning it, and later on you can proceed with the on-block technique. So it never gets boring. Um, so uh, why do I use um, the holmium laser for anatomic enucleation of the prostate because it's a Swiss army knife, in my opinion. You can enucleate, of course, you can perform urethrotomy, you can tackle stones. We heard about this um, before, and you can even um, tackle um, upper urinary tract tumors. Um, this is data from um, also from the two new universities where I worked at. Um, these are the numbers of HOLAP, this was in Hamburg. Um, when we introduced HOLAP, it led to, um, to more than a doubling of the cases. The same here, when I came to Göttingen, again, more than a doubling. And you can see that open prostatectomy, simple open prostatectomy died um, within this time. And TURP was reduced only to those cases where we wanted to teach our residents. And um, another reason why um, we had these numbers in, this, in our universities, it's also, these are the guidelines. And if you look at the guidelines, um, actually all the prostates bigger than 30 milliliters, let it be low risk or high risk patients, can be tackled by HOLEP. So most of our patients fall within this group of more than 30 milliliters. And that's why we also perform HOLEP. So thank you for your attention and um, let's go. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> now we are going to continue with another lecture, no or less invasive surgical therapy, the platinum standard. Dr. Lusarti from Austria. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, thanks Sharok for the very kind invitation and for the splendid organization. Uh, Please, uh, the slides, they are here, okay. Um, well, we know TERP has been our gold standard for almost 90 years, and we have very long data and results. And we just heard enucleation is a super technique, regardless of the energy you use, uh, whether it's holmium, tulium, probably it's true, enucleation is enucleation is enucleation, as Thomas Herman published 2016. Uh, but the question is, uh, do we know it in every case? I, what, what I am meaning, uh, do we need to remove so much transition zone in every patient? We know that uh, enucleation of the prostate produces a, a removal of tissue by over 80%, and TERP, if it's done well, uh, uh, produces a drop of PSA, and we know that the drop of PSA is a very good surrogate parameter to quantify the removal of transition zone of uh, 57%. Do we need it in every single patient is the question. Well, we know in entire Europe, we heard it also from the colleague uh, talking before, Europe is growing older and we uh, face much more people aged more than 80 in a couple of years than we have now. And already 10 years ago, and it was 10 years ago, 2010 in the UK, already uh, we were operating more than 40% uh, um, uh, of patients aged more than 75. And believe me, and we all know that, they are not looking uh, all like this uh, uh, at age 75. 
So um, we need probably something which reduces morbidity, especially in this court of patient. And I'm addressing especially those patients who have the problem that they cannot afford a general anesthesia or a spinal block because they are too frail. Or the very small group of patients, there are not so many in my experience uh, coming to you uh, with the explicit, uh, explicit uh, uh, desire of preserving anti-grade ejaculation. But we know that uh, we are increasing in age. And if we look at how many uh, patients uh, are really fit, yeah? if we really uh, ask uh, uh, the geriatric colleague to control them, we will realize that uh, uh, in this uh, patient cohort, which we are typically operating with TERP, 20, only 24% is robust enough, and 60% will be pre-frail, and even 16% uh, really frail. So, again, the question, uh, what do we do with patients who are really frail and not able to undergo uh, an operation under anesthesia? We have those four options. Urolift, which is... Uh, a prosthesis, a combination of nitinol and uh, steel uh, prosthesis applied by a single-use uh, instrument through the urethra. Uh, you can use uh, four or six or eight uh, of these uh, prosthesis. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, cost, obviously. The middle lobe is a little bit tricky, but uh, uh, probably even possible, uh, at least to the colleagues uh, who do that regularly. The complication rates uh, for this procedure are very few, very limited, and of uh, short uh, uh, um, period, only the first three weeks. But we have to consider that we will have a higher reoperation rate of 13.6% after five years, compared to sham. Sham in this uh, rareborn study after five years was a cystoscopy. Compared to sham, uh, the Eurolift was better in all functional aspects, uh, and uh, it is definitely inferior to TERP in this other uh, prospective study. But we have uh, what we were talking before. We have the advantage that if we look at antigrad ejaculation after Eurolift, uh, it, it will be spared. There, it will be not influenced. That's why our guidelines clearly state it's inferior, it's a method which is good, but inferior to TERP in terms of functional results. It is not uh, impairing sexual uh, function, and the long-term effects are surely not as good as TERP. The second option you have for frail patients uh, where you have to go for a, a local anesthesia or who want to spare antigrat ejaculation is eye tint, which is a a nice tool which uh, very much resembles a basket we use uh, for stone surgery, which is placed under local anesthesia through the urethra, uh, left in place for one week, and uh, then again removed transurethrally just by pulling the string which is in the urethra for the week. And it produces a, a kind of necrosis, a soft tissue necrosis, uh, mimicking a little bit the blood and neck incision. And the results uh, in terms of complication are uh, very, very minor, I would say, and very transient, uh, just uh, minimal dysuria, uh, few cases of really uh, uh, severe complications. In this Italian uh, uh, trial versus sham, uh, they had only 8.6% reintervention rate at three years. Uh, but uh, if we look at this, uh, uh, prospective uh, uh, multicenter analysis. Uh, in reality, if you look here at the functional result, especially for CUMAX, you, you will notice that the improvement is only 3.5, which is not really very much more than uh, with alpha blocker. Third op option is Resume, which is uh, a very nice tool with which uh, you can inject uh, uh, water vapor into the prostate. It's an application which lasts nine seconds. You can puncture as many times as you want to. And the, the effect will be necrosis after a couple of weeks, uh, up to three months. Uh, Complications are very few because, uh, and there is a bias about that, the patient are discharged with catheter. 
between one and three weeks, uh, depending on the size of the prostate. So they don't have uh, many complications because they have the catheter uh, and they are very uh, few. Um, the results in terms of uh, functional aspects, QMAX is ameliorated by nearly 50%, IPSS decreases up to 50%, so they are really good. Uh, and uh, even in Austria, we were able to demonstrate that uh, um, with an average age of 80 years, the patients were still without catheter after one year in over 90% of the cases. So that was a cohort of patients uh, uh, retrospectively collected multi-center uh, to see how many of them were after resume without catheter after one year. Last uh, but not least, prostate embolization, which is in the hand of the radiologist, which has uh, uh, clearly an advantage uh, in terms of complication compared to TURP. Uh, this is a very nice study done by a Swiss group in St. Gallen. It's probably the most clean study on uh, prostate embolization. The functional results are inferior to TERP, clearly inferior, and we have, and we have to consider that, a reintervention rate up to 21% after two years uh, in compar compared, um, compared uh, uh, to TERP. And uh, that's why our, uh, our guidelines uh, state clearly that it is less effective than TERP in terms of functional results. It has less complication. Uh, and we have to explain this to the patient. He has to accept these uh, uh, inferior optimal outcomes. And uh, uh, it is very important that the radiologist involves the urologist uh, for the follow-up because the patient will uh, uh, um, have problems in more than 20% of the cases. So we don't have only one option nowadays. Uh, uh, three, 30, 40 years ago, uh, there was one or two options, TERP and, and uh, enucleation. Uh, open adenomectomy. Now we have more uh, uh, possibilities uh, to be more individual in the choice of the treatment for our patients. Thanks very much for the attention. Thank you for this presentation, for both presentations. Uh, very, very uh, interesting and encouraging. But let's go to the specific patient that we had. Uh, uh, Dr. Ahiai, regarding the wish of the patient for uh, anti-grade ejaculation, what would you tell this patient? Mm -hmm. well, first of all, I want to say um, that actually we have a good time since we have several options and um, we already had some discussions before. It's always good to have several options now and then in the past we only had two options. Now we can really go for patient selection. And most importantly, in my clinical business, as in yours, is um, that you inform the patients about advantages and disadvantages. I personally, uh, I'm very reluctant, um, let's say, in highly obstructive patients to perform an um, ejaculation preserving technique. Um, and if I see um, this patient, um, he, he is a high risk patient, he had um, cardiomyocardial infarction his risk that he has erectile dysfunction itself is, is increased by itself. He had 800 milliliters residual urine after acute urinary retention. He has a really large prostate. I would rather go and tell him, listen, you have a big prostate. If you want to pee again, really good, go for an AEP. And um, you will not be impotent after the surgery. You just will not have an ejaculation. An alternative to it would be maybe Aquabeam um, in, in this size of the prostate. Um, but uh, we already started with Aquabeam. You, you leave quite an amount of um, residual tissue in the apical region. It's also, um, it has an increase of bleeding compared to other studies or patients have to be informed. I would be reluctant since it's also over 160s. We have data about aqua beam up to 160 if I um, if you correct me sure. and um, so it would be let's say not evidence-based sorry if I talk no, too no, much you already said everything I, I completely agree with you <laughs> I would uh, again uh, counsel the patient in the direction of uh, enucleation of the prostate probably because uh, 
he already has probably some damage for the bladder. He wants to pee again. Uh, I don't know if I would go for aquablation. I probably would do a bipolar nucleation of the prostate. And if I remember correctly, the size of this prostate was 180 yeah. milliliters. Even, so even larger. Probably yeah. what, all of these uh, minimal invasive procedures that you mentioned are not for that size prostate, right? No, they are surely not ideal. Surely yeah. not ideal. Mm. Please. Questions, please. Operations. Uh, first of all, it's not paid by the Kangan Casa. Yeah, patient has to get it pri uh, private. We did these operations about 10 years ago. The results are good. We have to take care of the middle lobe. Middle lobe must not be enlarged. And patient tolerance is very nice. No retrograde education is best operation. But the thing is, only the private. That time it was only the company has given uh, option. Okay, we can do it for free, but now it is not possible. Completely agree with that. Uh, it's a problem in Austria. We know that, uh, but it's more or less for this for for all procedures. Yeah? Reimbursement is uh, there for a TERP, so it depends how do you declare it. And if you do it very much, uh, you surely uh, will uh, spend very much money because it's a very expensive procedure. Yeah? I have a question to you, Professor Aya. Uh, could you explain for auditorium, mainly for young colleagues, what is your uh, decision for one uh, total enucleation, two lobes, three lobes? Uh, what, what is uh, the, the be uh, best treatment for small or bigger prostate? Okay. Um, I think Professor Luciano can say something to, um, to the question also. Um, I, I personally, I, I do a whole lab in all the cases, even in smaller prostate, um, even let's say less than 30, I would um, be reluctant, but if the patient asks for it, I also do it. Um, I always say to my residents that every prostate has a plane, has a surgical plane. You just have to be patient to find it and you will find it. Um, and uh, two or three lobe or on block technique, um, depends on your surgical skills. I would not start with an on-block technique. When I start with um, enucleation, exactly. it's um, probably a little bit difficult to start with. That's actually the only disadvantage probably um, about uh, anatomic enucleation of the prostate. Endoscopic anatomic, it has its learning curve. But I also mention again that um, TRP also has its learning curve. It's, the problem is that we do not have enough mentors he is a mentor. I couldn't consider myself as a mentor, but there are not so many people performing whole lab or anatomic enucleation um, professionally. Or so it's in centers, and if you are not working in the center, you're more or less obliged to teach yourself. And teaching yourself is a pain. It's a pain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. well, thank you both. I think we uh, we have to end this session. I see. Charlotte. I want to thank you so much to the chairs and to the debaters, uh, to everybody who participated. Thank you very much for this wonderful session. Morning session, Ursula. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are 15 minutes late, which for Central Europe is considered on time, right? So we have now 15 minutes break. Come back in 15 minutes. That is at 45, I think, if that is correct, right? Uh, no, sorry, at 30. At 30, you're back for the Popuri. That's going to be a little bit on the Central European Journal. We're going to talk about testosterone replacement and social media, and then we're going to go for the country competition where you have to push for your country to get the highest points. You'll be judged. Thank you very much. Have your coffee.
prices, there will be a country competition. There's got to be a million. But before that, we're going to have urology is a really exciting specialty because it's not surgery or systemic therapy, but it's so many new dimensions. And the urologists have been really technique and technology affine. And I think this session, we don't know how to call it, but there's certainly interesting areas in it. And I'm really proud and honored to have two of the you know, foremost urologists, not only in Central Europe, but all over the world, being the chairs of this session. Uh, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. On behalf of uh, myself and my uh, friend Vladimir, so that we're going to open the session. And just I would like to highlight it has to be finished until 4 o'clock. So therefore, uh, I am more than delighted and, and proud about to call the first presenters on behalf of Thomas Treva, uh, that uh, Professor Piotr Kloster, to give us just a short overview about the Central European Journal of Urology. Mr. President, dear colleagues, friends, dear Peter, dear Vladimir, um, Central European um, meeting, Central European Urological Society needs Central European Journal. It's clearly visible then it's coming, the Polish Urological Association in this matter, to offer the way, to offer the opportunity to strongly cooperate with pay. What is the role of the PUA as a part of the Central European Urological Society. Education and science strategy to do relation with the another specialties and then cooperation uh, between societies to strong position of the urology in the Central Europe. If we look for the Polish Urological Association, uh, which has a society with the different section and now it's coming the robotic session, now it's coming the urology reconstructive section, transplantology, and finally a uro oncology. Then the Polish Urological Association has their own building with their own Congress office, research office, examination office, because the EBU exam is since 25 years is obligatory exam in Poland in a case to be certified urologist. Finally assessing education based on the CME, CPD office, finally history office. Central European Journal of Urology, formerly the Polish Journal of Urology, is strictly dedicated to our society, to our group, to our community, is based in English, indexed in PubMed, and uh, from many members of our society who are sitting in a very prestigious position in that journal. It's necessity to depict the very strong role for Central European Urological Society and our president, Professor Sharok Shariat. We would like to thank you for the very strong support and uh, thank you very much for a lot of publications which offer an increasing position of the journal. If we look very shortly for the history, in 2011, the journal was indexed in PubMed, in 2015, basis Thomson Reuters and Clarivate uh, was an uh, emerging source for uh, citation English. And finally, in 2019, we start cooperation with the Scholar One. Why do we decide to do this? Because to assess the number of the citation from the years 2014, 2021, based on Scopus. And if we look for the citation score trend, despite the coming down the uh, line on the right, the citation is systematically increasing. And the sites for index offer the journal, together with the Hirsch index, the position in the impact factor receiving. If you look for the impact factor based on the clarified analysis, uh, they then translate the number of citations coming to the impact factor. And I'm deeply sure that based on the total citation and total citations index, the impact factor is coming rapidly to Central European Journal of Urology. Then this is necessity in the end to strongly depict that based on the last year, which we'll be assessing for the citation, Central European Journal of Urology is your journal. Do not forget that Central European Urological Society has its own journal and our work offering increasing not only position of the newspapers, but offering increasing position 
of the young talents of urology and offer us completely independency from the others. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about one of the products of our society for the Central European Urological Association. Thank you. Piotr, thank you very much. So that uh, we should all be proud about the Central European Journal of Urology. And we should do contribution as much as it is possible. So I, I would like to persuade everyone to publish as much or as possible and try to share the knowledge with us. And this could be a very good platform, which is a very, very high-sighted journal. Hopefully, it's going to be an impact factor. So therefore, I think it's very, very important for all of us, for our region, for uh, all of the departments of urology in the Central European region. Thanks a lot, Piotr. Yes, it is really, really inspiring for all of us to, to participate in, in, in growing the, this uh, journal uh, because I, I truly believe that Central European place and region is, is, is a region where we must get in scientific work as well. Maybe anyone would like to, to comment on this? On behalf of the editor, we are all looking forward to receive higher and higher quality papers. So if not, thank you very much, Piotr, uh, again, and thank you very much. Send our kindest regards to Thomas Driva and for everyone on the editorial. Thanks a lot. And we have to move. I Unfortunately, uh, Joot Coppa is a colleague of mine who is secretary of the European Society of Andrology, who is a member of the European Academy of Andrology and also is the head of the Center for Andrology in the Department of Urology at Semmelweis University, who is going to uh, talk about the testosterone therapy in prostate cancer patients safer than you thought. Jod is going to be, I think it's going to come from video, broadcasted. Each other and their colleagues. Unfortunately, I'm not able to attend personally at the meeting, uh, although after the COVID pandemics, and especially in one of my favorite capitals in Vienna. But now I have to send you the pre-recorded lecture of mine about the testosterone therapy of prostate cancer patients, about the safety of this treatment modality. First of all, I would like to thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me uh, for this presentation, and uh, I'm also happy uh, that Andrology can be a part of this uh, meeting. So let's see about the brief history. What is the previous base of the contraindication of testosterone treatment in prostate cancer? That comes from 1945, from the dogma uh, stated by Huggins and Hodges, but we know the base of this uh, dogma that was the hormonal dependence of prostate cancer, the, the, which is based on the androgen sensitivity of the tumor cells. <clears throat> we know that testosterone stimulates prostate cancer <clears throat> and castration reduces metastatic cancers. What is the recent evidence? The recent evidence is that prostate cancer is extremely sensitive to testosterone, especially to low levels of testosterone. Prostate cancer growth is not influenced by androgens, also not at higher concentrations. The base of this lecture today, this is uh, a publication from 2016, uh, where it was published and reported that prostate cancer mortality has decreased by approximately 50% in the past two decades. And this resulted in a significant increase in a prostate cancer survivors with the potential of experiencing the symptoms of uh, hypogonadism. We know that prostate cancer is, is increasing with age and androgens decline with age. In majority, androgen levels remain in the physiological range. But we know also from re more recent studies that 30% of the males between 40 and 80 years of age, they are hypogonadal. So one third of the males in that age period are hypogonadal. 
40% of the males between the ages of 45 and 85 have a low testosterone level lower than 300 nanogram per DL. Late onset hypogonadism is a pathological decline with testosterone absent syndromes, symptoms. This is degradating the quality of life and has a huge impact on the general health. Hypogonadism in itself is linked to development of metabolic syndrome, the type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and increased mortality rates. Testosterone replacement therapy helps to improve the energy, vitality, sexual desire, erectile function, body composition, and the bone density. What is the link between testosterone and prostate cancer? There is no clear correlation between serum testosterone and PSA levels in eugonadal men. Significantly lower testosterone levels can be detected in prostate cancer patients. Lower testosterone levels than less than uh, 10 nanomol per liter uh, mean lower prostate cancer frequency. But low testosterone is associated with the aggressiveness of the prostate cancer disease. Higher testosterone is associated with a lower clinical stage, a lower PSA, and a lower risk of progression. Low serum pretreatment testosterone level is correlated with an extra prostatic disease and the positive margins by the surgery. Five alpha reductase. Perhaps five alpha reductase can be the key of this process. Five alpha reductase convert testosterone into active metabolite dehydrotestosterone. Five alpha reductase treatment uh, inhibitors treatment. Uh, selective uh, for is a selective form of androgen deprivation. Severely reduced dihydrotestosterone levels. I mean, reduced PSA. Uh, also, when we use this kind of treatment, prostate volume will be also reduced, and so the prostate cancer risk will be reduced. After the uh, results of the prostate cancer prevention trial, we know that one quarter of the men have a reduced risk of P, uh, prostate cancer uh, when using 5 alpha reductase treatment. In men over 55 years of age, where the PSA level is less than 3 nanogram per liter, near to 25% relative risk reduction would, uh, was detected by the REDUCE study. Dehydrotestosterone has a greater role than testosterone in the development of the prostate cancer. Testosterone replacement does any effect on the PSA level. So treated for uh, uh, late onset hypogonadism do not develop more prostate cancer than the general population and do not develop more prostate cancer than in untreated men. PSA levels did not increase following long-term testosterone replacement therapy. Patients with localized prostate cancer may benefit from androgen therapy without compromising the chance of curing the cancer disease. What are the benefits of testosterone replacement therapy? There are really life quality increasing benefits. The increased muscle mass, increased bone density, increased mood, increased sexual health and performance. There is also a lower cardiovascular disease risk by the reducing of the cholesterol levels. Testosterone replacement ameliorates the glucose metabolism and lessens the risk of the metabolic syndrome. On the other hand, we have to calculate with potential side effects like polycythemia, gynecomastia, BPH, or the lowered HDL cholesterol. What are the indications of the testosterone replacement therapy recently in prostate cancer patients? The first of all, it's very important that the indication is based on the symptoms of hypogonadism and low risk localized prostate cancer, where the Gleason score is less than seven, the PT1, PT2 disease, where the preoperative PSA level was less than 10 nanogram per milliliter, and the patient is on active surveillance, as long as the patient still meets the criteria of active surveillance. Also, symptomatic hypogonadism and non high risk <laughs> localized prostate cancer can be an indication for testosterone replacement therapy.
What is the non-high risk localized prostate cancer where the Gleason score is less than eight, the PT1, PT2 disease where the preoperative PSA level is less than 10 nanogram per ml. What about after treatment, after radical treatment, after radical prostatectomy treatment? The postoperative PSA level should be undetectable in order to initiate this treatment in order to indicate testosterone replacement therapy. And the therapy can be initiated only after the first postoperative year. After brachytherapy, the start is after the PSA nadir is reached. We need personally tailored testosterone levels, but circulating testosterone level should be kept as low as possible, but overwhelming the symptoms and treating the symptoms. What are the contraindications? prostate cancer and testosterone replacement. The presence of the known prostate cancer is a clear contraindication for this therapy. Patients with high risk localized disease, the positive surgical margins, positive lymph nodes on the pathological findings, and the metastatic prostate cancer. In that case, it's not allowed to start and to perform testosterone replacement therapies. Let's look about the recent guidelines. The International Society of Andrology, the International Society for the Study of Aging Male, the European Association of Urology, the European Academy of Andrology, and the American Society of Andrology have near the same criteria in the guidelines published. In localized prostate cancer patients, only after successful treatment, where no clinical or laboratory evidence of residual cancer can be found, when suffering from confirmed symptomatic hypogonadism, it means having the symptoms and laboratory confirmed the hypogonadism, minimally two uh, examinations of the lab tests. Risk and benefits must be clearly discussed with the patient and we need a careful follow-up. Before testosterone replacement therapy in uh, over 40 years uh, of age patients, without prostate cancer, it is also a must to check the PSA level and to perform the uh, rectal digital examination. So in summary, we can conclude that testosterone replacement therapy is indicated only in symptomatic hypogonadism in low risk and non high risk localized prostate cancer patients and after radical prostatectomy after one year, after the first postoperative year, when the PSA is undetectable. And after brachytherapy, as we mentioned at, uh, before, when we reached the nadir PSA level. Testosterone replacement therapy does not increase the risk of subsequent discovery of prostate cancer. Testosterone deficiency is associated with prostate cancer aggressiveness. The administration of testosterone replacement in non-high or low-risk patients, cured prostate cancer patients need also pre-treatment PSA levels and a careful follow-up. Discussing uh, even uh, most recently that the lack of evidence regarding the safety of long-term testosterone replacement therapy in hypogonal localized prostate cancer patients in the aspect of the progression is lacking. So prescribe the lowest necessary testosterone dose to achieve the serum androgen normalization. And this normalization is not only the laboratory levels normalization, then the symptoms are the most important in that uh, question. The screen at regular intervals, it means three, but maximally six months are recommended to do the uh, screening again, and the follow-up. Testosterone is contraindicated in high-risk localized disease, positive surgical margins, positive lymph nodes, and metastatic disease. So dear colleagues, thank you uh, for your kind attention, and I wish you a pleasant stay in Vienna and a very comfortable and useful conference.
So, uh, dear colleagues, we will proceed to the, our final speaker. Uh, I would like to call Dr. Stelian Janiotescu from based in Bucharest, Romania, to give us a talk about this hot topic, social media transforming medicine, get on board or become irrelevant. <clears throat> Still doesn't work. Not yet. Okay. So, hello, dear chairman, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is Talian Yenotescu. I come, uh, come from um, Funden Clinical Institute from Bucharest. And um, I have to tell you a little bit about social media, how this is transforming medicine, and you either get on board or you become <clears throat> irrelevant. Um, it's a bit difficult, but uh, I think we should have an idea in mind when uh, in our day-to-day -day, um, life and even when we are creating our uh, online um, uh, image. And I think it's very important to be modest, but always know your worth. About social media, this is a very vast um, uh, uh, subject. And actually, it's practically impossible to explain it in 50 minutes. It's like trying to explain urology. And we know we do a lot as urologists, so it is impossible. But we will take a journey about uh, what we know and what we can find out uh, about this social media. So what do we know, actually? Uh, we, were, we learned and we were trained to, to do this exam with the patient face to face. When we start to do a clinical examination, a digital a rectal examination, uh, ultrasound, and uh, then to uh, put a diagnostic. Uh, what do the patients think in this, uh, this era? Uh, or at least what do they wish for? Well, actually, they think that their time is the most important and they wish to solve everything as fast as possible, and if they can, by the phone. I think all of you have uh, a lot of messages on WhatsApp with uh, a lot of test results and CT scans, and they are uh, ex expecting um, uh, to get an answer or how to, they can treat this, uh, this disease that they have. Uh, in order to understand uh, this phenomenon that is happening, uh, we have to go back to 1998. What happened in 1998, let's say a colleague of ours, uh, even though it's pretty difficult to say that, published a study which had no medical-based evidence. And he said that if you vaccinate your child, he will probably die or get even ill. Uh, this went on social med media, went viral and exploded. And even if in this moment there are parents in, uh, in talking to their doctors, about if they vaccinate their, their um, children, if uh, they will get ill. So this is the impact that social media can have. Um, what happened uh, since then? Well, this happened. This is uh, uh, before the COVID pandemic. And in the pandemic uh, time, things got even worse. Uh, people started to do research, uh, everybody knows medicine, and everybody will give you advices on social media, on Facebook comment, uh, and something like that. And there are a lot of people that know nothing about medicine, and there are a lot of people that are trying to cure cancer with turmeric and ginger and stuff like that, which is not okay. So this is why we have to get on board, and we have to, to be in our times, let's say, and um, we have to look uh, forward than our image as we present ourselves online and think of the greater good. And the greater good is helping as many people as possible. From what we knew, person to person, now it goes person, doctor, to the World Wide Web, and you can have access to patients from other countries, other worlds. Uh, using uh, the social media, you can help your residents uh, or your colleagues to get better in what they do um, and uh, help and save a lot of lives. It's all starting to be share, like, tweet, comment, chat, post, and join the correct group, and then people will follow. Uh, you kind of know what's happening when someone's trying to go to the hospital. The first thing they do, they, they tweet about it or they write on Facebook, and there will be a lot of responses. Many of them will be... Uh, not correct, and uh, we may lose some time in uh, trying to heal uh, uh, these patients. 
So what we can do, as I said, we have to get on board or you become irrelevant because nowadays people are, are watching what you do in online media and uh, how you present yourself. Um, as I said, you should be modest and uh, you should know your worth. Nobody likes a cocky doctor who, who knows them all and can do everything per uh, perfect. So let's talk a little bit uh, about the principal um, social media apps. If you're trying to find patients here or get uh, noticed, you're not doing it wrong. This is not a social media app. This is used for another thing. Uh, this is a print screen of my phone. This is how it should look. Uh, from my opinion, you had the LinkedIn. The LinkedIn is uh, a social media app which is used by professionals and you can interconnect and make a network of colleagues of specialists when you, uh, where you can put your credentials and there they can see what school you went with, uh, to, uh, what kind of papers you published and so on. Uh, uh, lately, you can put pictures and uh, short videos with your surgeries or your, uh, I don't know, something you're best at. Uh, Twitter, we all know Twitter. We tweet a lot with short messages. Facebook, uh, it's kind of for the old people lately. <laughs> so it's not quite that used. Um, TikTok with short, uh, short uh, videos in which um, you can present your surgeries or uh, something to help the younger generation because the visual effect has a higher uh, higher learning curve and uh, that will help uh, even though you can put uh, your mistakes there and they will learn from your mistakes it's, it's not uh, something unusual and youtube uh, on which uh, you can um, put you know films movies surgeries explain uh, explain the the surgeries the time of the surgeries and can help a lot even with the students, residents, and younger colleagues. And again, uh, the last one I saved, I think, is the most uh, important at the moment. It's Instagram. Uh, Instagram actually looks how you look. So if you're not gorgeous like I am, it will be a bit difficult, but <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, you can uh, uh, translate it in simple messages with simple posts, like, I don't know, one doctor a day keeps the one apple a day, I'm sorry, I have some uh, <laughs> track. Uh, one uh, apple a day keeps the doctor away or get funny. Uh, and this is a colleague of ours, uh, a surgeon who, as you can see, has a lot of followers. It's like 153,000 people are watching him and he's talking only about medicine. And the advice that he gives, uh, they are pretty accurately. And if it's... Uh, if he's talking about another uh, specialty, let's say, he won't give advice, but he will redirect you to a specialist on that field, which I think it's, uh, it's pretty good. And just imagine if there are 150,000 people that are watching you every day, just if 10% of them are your, become your patients, there are a lot of patients. Okay, so basically this is kind of what's happening. Uh, social media is becoming very important and uh, slight, uh, it will become even more important. If there are any questions. Okay, so I think this was it. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Ionesco, for, for a nice talk. It is really, really hot topic, and I think that all we should be aware of, of importance, uh, raising importance of social media uh, in our, our society. So if anyone has some question or comment on, on this, I'd like to call. I think that was it. Thank you, everyone. It's difficult, but uh, thank you very much. We wanted this to be aware because I think this is really a... Uh, uh, something that we have to recognize is going to be an integral part of communication, awareness, and outreach and education in the next future, right? So it's it's kind of a challenge to keep the balance between honesty, self-promotion, and so on. And there's no rules. It's an open world. And thank you so much for bringing that to us. Thank you very much to the chairs. But your work is not over, because now you're going to be the judges. So this is the famous country competition. It is for you to cheer on your favorite representative from your country. 
as you know, this has been ongoing in the SEM for many, many years. Um, each country posts one uh, uh, representative that replace, uh, represents the country, has a seven-minute talk. After seven minutes, we will turn off the microphone. Three minutes discussion. Chair will be Arno Stenzel, who, uh, not to be the perfect chair, I will be sitting next to him, making sure that he asks the right tough questions. <laughs> and then um, the judges from each country will vote. You can influence your judges. You can by clapping, by doing No, you, uh, he's not uh, voting. Um, Arno is voting, yes. Yes, 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 you're voting. So, no, you can uh, put on your own too. As, uh, please, Arnulf. And so we're going to start now. It's going to go pretty fast, seven minutes and three minutes discussions. And then um, you have the scores. The score sheets, people will be scored on two factors. Number one, research quality. Thank you so much. Presentation quality will be also an important. We're going to put the sum of the two. And uh, we will try to calculate within the next 15, 20 minutes when Arnulf is going to give his talk. So give you the winner. The winner gets 1,000 euros. And the second place will get 500, the third one 300. And after the talk, we will also tell you who won the pollster best prizes, the three best prizes for the pollsters yesterday. So there's going to be a lot of money flowing. We're going to have somebody come in with a suitcase and he's going to pay you cash. No, not cash. Today, we have to be very honest and compliant. So we're going to give you a thing and we're going to give the winners. Um, let's start. Um, Arnold, do you want to introduce the first one? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, excellent idea. Now, the first one is um, Mr. Palauf, new adjuvant versus adjuvant chemotherapy in upper tract UCL cancer. The clock is running. Thank you very much, dear chairman, dear jury, dear colleagues. I'm honored to represent Austria in this year's SAM country competition. I will present the results of my research titled New event versus adjuvant chemotherapy in upper tract urethelial cancer. The aim of this research was to clarify whether patients with upper tract urethelial cancer respond differently if they receive new event chemotherapy and radical surgery or radical surgery and adjuvant chemotherapy. We all know that the PUT trial provides level one evidence for the use of perioperative chemotherapy in upper tract urethelial cancer in the, in the localized advanced state. But this was only known for the adjuvant setting. No level one evidence is known for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So why talk about neoadjuvant chemotherapy at all? Because in upper tract in particular, the adjuvant setting has a major disadvantage, which is the imminent loss of kidney function caused by the surgery itself. And therefore, the patient will be less likely to tolerate the nephrotoxic chemotherapeutic agent cisplatin, which is favored. Obviously, this is not the case for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but neoadjuvant chemotherapy has disadvantages as well, which is that there's a high risk of overtreatment, and also the surgery is moved to a later point in the past, and therefore, there's a risk that the patient gets progression if the chemotherapy is resistant or the tumor is resistant to the chemotherapy. So there's a lively discussion about the pros and cons on near event and adjuvant chemotherapy. Recently, a systematic review summarized all the evidence known and suggested there is a benefit for near event and adjuvant chemotherapy in upper tract cancer. So therefore, we decided on the following study. We conducted a retrospective multicenter cohort study, including 39 hospitals. We included patients with non-metastatic upper tract urethelial cancer, all of which had been treated with perioperative chemotherapy and radical surgery. Patients didn't receive radiotherapy, and they were also excluded if there was missing data on patient stage or relevant follow-up data. We conducted a stepwise approach for the comparison. First, we compared the patients baseline characteristics. And there we saw the baseline characteristics different significantly between the groups. And since we didn't want to compare apples with peers, we decided on a propensity score matching on preoperative patient characteristics. So characteristics that are available when I would decide in clinical practice 
on the choice on the perioperative strategy. As a next step, after propensity score matching, we conducted survival analysis and confirmed the survival analysis based on a landmark cohort, which accounted for the time difference in chemotherapy administration. In total, we included 510 patients, which had been matched 210 to 210. Preoperative patient characteristics were now comparable, and there was a median follow-up of 29 and 24 months, respectively. However, pathology results differed between the groups with worse outcomes for adjuvant chemotherapy in terms of T-stage, N-stage, and upstaging in comparison to clinical staging. Only the variant histology rate was comparable. In the comparison of the match cohort, there was a survival benefit in overall cancer-specific and recurrence-free survival for the new advent chemotherapy treatment arm, which with hazard ratios ranging from 0.49 to 0.65. And there was an overall survival fi for five years predicted of 57% for the new advent arm and only 35% for the advent arm. However, Cox regression suggested other causes than the treatment of the perioperative chemotherapy to cause this time difference in survival. Hence, our group included also patients with favorable disease. We decided on a subgroup analysis of patients with clinically advanced disease and further stratified them into node positive and node negative disease. Then there was no overall survival benefit for this group with clinically advanced disease. Only patients with clinically advanced lymph nodes on preoperative imaging benefited from knee advent chemotherapy. The same was true for, for cancer-specific survival. There was only a benefit in clinically lymph node positive disease. Further, Cox regression suggested that the perioperative chemotherapy was one reason why there was a time difference in survival. Landmark cohort included 399 patients and confirmed the, the, confirmed the overall survival benefit in the clinically lymph node positive patients. However, the difference was not statistically significant anymore with a p-value of 0 0.054 for cancer-specific survival. Summarizing the results, the time when the chemotherapy is administered is not of interest for an unselected patient cohort. We saw an improved survival for the Needman chemotherapy group, but Cox regression suggested that the chemotherapy itself, when it was administered, was not the cause. Clinical T staging should not be the reason for knee advent chemotherapy as it is unreliable and patients without clinical positive lymph nodes didn't benefit from an early start of the chemotherapy. Clinical lymph node staging qualified best to decide on patients who benefit from an early chemotherapy start. This was conferred on Kaplan-Meier analysis and also in Cox regression and landmark analysis. Talking about the study's limitations. First is the retrospective design with missing data and selection bias. We tried to overcome these drawbacks by multiple imputation and also by propensity score matching, but they cannot be ruled out. Second is the low number of patients included in the subgroup analysis. However, this is the largest cohort of knee advent chemotherapy patients that had been compared so far, far with adjuvant chemotherapy in this setting. I thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to a fruitful three-minute debate. Thank you very much, uh, Maximilian. Um, there is one, there are a couple of things, you know, which you have to consider is, um, of course, there was always those people that have, will be able to undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapies. Uh, they will also be the, the better ones. Uh, so you mean that those who receive need when chemotherapy are automatically... Those, the, right. The, those that have cisplatinum based will always be the ones that have better kidney function and they will be in a general better status. So in this cohort, that's why we do, did the comparison with the propensity score matching. We saw that um, kidney function was preoperatively the same but not postoperatively, but there it was worse for the need when chemotherapy arm, probably because they already got the chemotherapeutic agent. 
and to account for these differences in the patient characteristics, that's why we decided for propensity score matching. But of course, you can't rule out this selection bias. Especially the frailty. Frailty, frailty index and, and stuff like that would be nice to have it. But of course, you can't have it because mm -hmm. uh, it's retrospective. Huh? Is... Any further questions? Come on, my question. He has to sweat. No, the, the other okay. thing is, you know, N1, N2. But, you know, especially in the tumor, you may have enlarged lymph nodes and we don't have anything, any tracer apart from FTG that would really uh, say that that is definitely an N1 or N2. And when you give chemotherapy, this may be masked and the, the uh, uh, metastasis may have either be gone or the inflammation has gone. Yeah, this is the main disadvantage for needle and chemotherapy because the staging in upper tract isn't very good. But also for the PAL trial and also for the Uranus trial that's going on comparing needle and adjuvant chemotherapy, they also include N1 patients. So that's why we decided to include them in our trial as well. And do you think it will be a good uh, study when once the uh, checkpoint inhibitors are proven to be good? in the upper tract, which they are in some studies, They're even better in the upper tract than in the bladder. Uh, I think especially um, before surgery, there might be a difference if they get in immune therapy, because then the immune system is probably still healthier than after the surgery. So probably this would be a great study. The probably is the probably. Yeah. <laughs> Sasha, please. No, since your data is not so conclusive, um, what are your next steps um, clinically and scientifically? How do you treat them clinically? And how, what, what are you, the next studies? You already mentioned it. but So for the next studies we already talked about, we know that there's also an, already a study going on, which is recruiting the Uranus trial comparing need event and adjuvant chemotherapy. I think the most important thing is that we, um, find out how or how reliable the staging for, for the lymph nodes is. Because for clinical stagings, there have been some studies showing that this is for, for the T staging, that it's not very good. But there's really scarce data for the lymph node staging. So this would be the next step to assess the accuracy. And maybe this will give us more, more knowledge on how to treat patients with positive lymph nodes. Because that's the one we need to focus on. Clinical T staging as an indication, I don't see it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maximilian. Great work, good presentation. The Austrians can be proud of you. <laughs> if you don't win, they're going to chase you out of the country. Anyway, he's going to John Hopkins for a fellowship, so you're safe for one year. You can come back, nobody's going to remember. Uh, we'll take it also. <laughs> <laughs> Croatia is next country. Uh, we're, uh, Robek, how would you say it? Sorry. Thank you so much. Comparison of patient reported outcomes and patient reported experiences for PNL, for flexible uteroscopy in patients with stone disease suitable for both surgical modalities. So, good afternoon, dear uh, chairman, judges, and colleagues. Uh, my name is Borna Vrhovic. I'm a urology resident at Sestri Milosevice University Hospital Center in Zagreb, Croatia. And uh, the topic of my study was as uh, professor said, the comparison of patient reported outcomes and experiences for both percutaneous nephrolithotomy and flexible urethroscopy. Uh, as we know, patient reported outcomes and experiences are in being, becoming increasingly recognized by regulators, clinicians, and patients alike as valuable tools to collect patient-centered data, which is unfortunately very uh, scarce in the field of urology. So what is a pro? PRO is a patient-reported outcome measure, and it shows us how the patients see the outcome of their surgery through their symptoms. What is a PRE? PRE is a patient-reported experience measure, and uh, it shows us how the patients experience their immediate post-operative recovery period. Um, as we are well aware, the EAU guidelines suggest that we can use both surgical modalities to uh, treat kidney stones that are 10 to 20 millimeters in size. The aim of this study was to assess from a patient's perspective their experiences with both of these surgical modalities. So this was a prospective cohort study which was conducted at our urology department. Uh, we included 50 patients with kidney stones that were 10 to 20 millimeters in size. Uh, half of our patients underwent flexible ureteroscopy and the other half underwent PNL for their kidney stone disease. 
the mean age of the patients was 58 years. And here we can see that there were no statistically significant differences between their stone size, uh, residual fragment size, and duration of hospital stay between these two groups. Uh, to assess patients' experiences, we had to design a questionnaire. The questionnaire consisted of three parts. The first part was given to the patients at the time of admission, and this part assessed uh, patient's symptoms in the period of one month before the procedure. The second part of the questionnaire was given to them at the time of discharge, and it was used to assess their discomfort levels during their hospital stay after they had their uh, surg surgery. And the third part of the questionnaire was given to the patients at the first post-operative control one month after the surgery, and it was used to assess the sym symptoms patients felt uh, in the period of one month after their surgery. Uh, in the questionnaire itself, the patients reported using the Likert scale on their symptoms related to their uh, renal stone disease, and the symptoms that were reported on were colic pain episodes, non-colic flank pain, dysuria, hematuria, high fever episodes, and hospital visits in the period of one month before uh, the surgery. Uh, here we can see that uh, both patient groups, those treated with uh, flexible ureteroscopy and those treated with PNL, had uh, no statistically different, no statistical differences between uh, the magnitude of their symptoms uh, in the period of one month before the surgery. Uh, one month after their surgery, they received the same set of questions, and once again, there were no statistically significant differences between these two groups in the magnitude of their symptoms after the surgery. Here, we can see the comparison of the patient-reported outcomes uh, in the period before and after their surgery, and uh, this graph uh, will help us appreciate the uh, regression in the magnitude of symptoms before and after the surgery, which was, of course, expected they were treated. And the second part of our study were the patient-reported experiences during their hospital stay. Uh, once again, patients were given a questionnaire, and uh, using the Likert scale, they reported on pain, discomfort, self-care, mobility, and anxiety levels during their hospital stay after uh, their surgical procedure. Uh, once again, no significant differences were, can be shown between these two patient groups. Uh, one thing to note here is that the discomfort levels caused by the nephrostomy tube after PNL, uh, as reported by our patients, were very mild to non-existent. So, in conclusion, pros and pres as measures are becoming increasingly important in medicine. Unfortunately, there is little to no data in the field of urology and even less in the field of stone disease. Uh, in our study, through pros and pres, patients reported equal discomfort levels after both surgical modalities. And uh, so, from the patient's point of view, both of those methods are uh, equally acceptable for treatment of their kidney stone disease. And we uh, consider that uh, this study gave and this information gave an added value to the guideline recommendations because in the last few years, for the first time, we are starting to ask our patients what they think of the procedures that we do on them. Thank you. Please, Dr. Vesa. Uh, congratulations to your study. Uh, interesting. Thank you. Uh, Interesting study. I want uh, to know if you had a standard uh, in the stand of the patients. For example, the the EuroS patients have they been uh, pre-stented? For example, did you do primary primary EuroS? And uh, what about um, uh, stenting after the surgery? The the EuroS patients did they routinely get a stand? And when did you remove it? As well as the PNL patients, how how was your regimen there? Thank you, Watch, for the question. Uh, that is an excellent question, and we did analyze those data, but for uh, due, uh, due to time constraints, we didn't show it here. 70% uh, of our patients in the uh, flexible ureteroscopy group were pre-stented, and all of them were uh, had uh, double J stents placed uh, at the time of the surgery, and they were taken out uh, at their first post-operative control. And uh, at the first post-operative post-operative control, they also reported that uh, their, the level of discomfort of the uh, extraction of the double J uh, prosthesis was uh, mild to non-existent. 
question additionally to that. Uh, did you analyze the discomfort uh, from the stance? You, you analyzed the one yes. from the uh, nephrostomy tube. But also yes, yes, yes. The... That's, uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear probably. That's what I uh, tried to say that at their first post-operative control, we uh, analyzed the discomfort of the uh, double J uh, itself and the discomfort of the extraction of the double J. And they uh, experienced pretty similar levels of discomfort to those shown for the nephrostomy tube after PNL. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Hello. Stay was longer in a group of flexible ureteroscopy. One can suppose uh, to be in opposite in, in PCNL to be longer stay. Can you explain why it was? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, well, uh, we had some uh, unfortunate um, fever episodes uh, that required uh, treatment with uh, targeted antibiotics, but we didn't uh, show this information here because we thought that uh, there were no, uh, there was not enough patients, uh, so we can um, uh, effectively uh, statistically uh, challenge that information. But in the future, of course, we are planning to uh, expand on this research and include that in the process. From Romania, I have one question oh. regarding the irradiation. Do you have any <coughs> data uh, regarding the volume of uh, the radiation uh, during the operation, the procedures? Uh, do you have any differences? Sorry, thank you very much for the question. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, this data wasn't collected as this wasn't the main or the secondary aim of this research, but uh, some of them patients of which course procedure to select thank you of course thank you yeah thank you very much congratulations uh, first that you have done the study i have one question for the um, study design were these 50 patients you selected were they consecutive or were they selected somehow this is the first question and the second question is as i just for, for my understanding the results showed that the pre-stenting had no impact on the symptoms. So patients with or without a stent had the same symptoms. This is somehow a little bit different from the clinical practice we see because the stent related problems are quite common. Okay, thank you for those questions. Uh, I would first like to address the second question. Uh, well, I that is what our data has shown. I know that uh, the clinical practice is somewhat different. Uh, some of my superiors uh, also uh, attack this point, but uh, that is what this data unfortunately shows, and it's uh, too small of a uh, uh, subject. And uh, if, if you could uh, uh, repeat your the, first the question. The first one, were they consecutive uh, included yes. or yes, selected? Yes, they were consecutive. Uh, unfortunately, this study was done during the COVID pandemic, so our uh, patient volume was uh, much lower than uh, it would be in uh, pre-COVID times, and that's why we only had 50 patients in the part of these two years, because we had some um, uh, logistical issues and uh, patients with malignant disease were uh, primary, uh, treated, primarily treated. Okay, thank you. When you said, also your senior said, this might be a problem. Do you have an idea why didn't your study show that uh, the stent makes problem? Do you have an idea why didn't you didn't show the results? Why it didn't came out? Hmm. Like that? Sorry, uh, I just believe that that was due to the volume of patients we uh, gathered information from. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank Great you so job. much. Thank you, great presentation. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Yeah. Our next one is uh, Mr. Fiala from the Czech Republic, the role of neoadjuvant hormone treatment in cryptorchidism management. Ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the nomination to this country competi competition. I will talk about the cryptorchidism and some possible neoadjuvant hormonal treatment. Uh, as you know, probably, uh, uh, cryptorchidism is uh, quite uh, frequent uh, full-term boys uh, 
uh, born defect. Uh, but uh, mainly, uh, cryptorchidism is known as uh, as um, a risk factor for uh, testicular cancer. But uh, the higher risk is for the fertility rate in the future. Fertility rate in unilateral cryptorchidism is uh, is uh, lower, but the paternity is almost the same. And it's, that's mainly because of the IVF uh, treatment. Um, the Former uh, hypothesis of of the of the infertility or the lower fertility was because of the higher temperature in the scrotal position than in the scrotal position. So, uh, the uh, but now nowadays we think that the the problem is in the impairment of of, uh, of endocrine situation uh, in the mini puberty. The mini puberty usually starts at one month of age and continues to the age of three months. And during the first year of life of the of the newborn male, uh, there is under uh, androgen stimulation of, to the androgen receptor. Uh, there is a transformation of gonocytes to adult dark spermatogenia. And the majority of, of uh, those uh, cells uh, undergo apoptosis. Uh, due to this uh, knowledge, of ESPU uh, guidelines uh, moved the treatment uh, until the one year of, of life. And the golden standard of the treatment is still the orchidopexy. Uh, but the hormonal treatment for, for spontaneous descent is not is not recommended uh, because it didn't work. Uh, but you know what about the what about the neoadjuvant hormonal treatment? Uh, because we know from biopsies that there is higher a number of uh, adult spermatogenia if we will uh, administer this uh, this treatment, uh, and it was. It was firstly described by by uh, Bika and Haji Selimovic in 1992, then again by Laila uh, in 97, uh, Schwentner, which is also part of guidelines in 2005, and in 2009 there was uh, the first similar study by Jaluli, and also Beers and Melon uh, summarized this evidence. Uh, and they uh, recommended to change the, the guideline uh, strategy. Uh, also, they were supported by John Hudson. Uh, but uh, there is in guidelines a uh, recommendation to treat bilateral uh, undescended testes with, with, uh, with this uh, uh, hormonal treatment, gonadoraline, but uh, for unilateral is still low evidence. Uh, in our study, uh, we wanted to avoid uh, some some limitations from from those previous studies. Uh, their problem was in in such a variety of patients, mainly uh, age variety, and also uh, they did uh, they did biopsies. Uh, so our our goal, our uh, aim of the study was uh, to assess the uh, the mini puberty. That means. Uh, to uh, assess hormonal levels in th at three months of age, then evaluate the effect of, of the gonadotropin treatment and provide them a long-term follow-up. And uh, the thing is not to treat all those boys, but only those who are in high risk for the uh, future infertility. So we need to try some key uh, how to how to select them. Uh, we included full-term boys, uh, uh, we did uh, specific uh, and precise ultrasound examination at three, six, three months, then again we confirmed the finding at uh, the age of six months, and uh, then at the age of, uh, of surgery, that means until the 12, 12 months, uh, we repeated the, the hormonal and ultrasound examination. The hormonal profile uh, at, uh, at three months, uh, and it was repeated after the treatment of, uh, of, the, uh, of the group, uh, which was randomized at the six months. Uh, we uh, closed the study recently. It started in 2016 and ended actually three months ago. Uh, we included 93 uh, boys with unilateral cryptorchidism and uh, 40 of them were 
treated with the gonadotropin and 29 boys were included as a healthy con control group. Uh, unfortunately, because we ended very, very recently, I don't have uh, the statistic evaluation of the final data, but uh, I can offer you something else. Uh, because uh, we just uh, submitted to European Journal of Pediatric Urology uh, an article about uh, which was based on preliminary data and some some preliminary uh, statistic evaluation uh, about the treatment uh, safety. Um, so we wanted to uh, to be sure if this uh, if this treatment is safe and uh, we did uh, some comparison of of the change in time between the time of mini puberty which was uh, at 3 months and at the age of 1 1 year uh, when when those levels are are in resting uh, values uh, you can see that uh, in comparison we didn't find any a significant difference, and as well uh, in the penile growth or, or testicular growth. So uh, to summarize, uh, we still think the NeoG1 hormonal treatment is is promising method, but mainly for the high risk group. And based on uh, our results, uh, we think it's it's safe method. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions. Pediatric urology, that's the thing we need to spend more time, more energy on. For me, the question is, uh, I love the presentation, similar to the pre previous presentation, I'm, I keep on looking at the data and say, you're showing me p-values, but you're totally under power to show anything. You didn't power your study to, to look you know, at the sample size to, to find uh, the primary endpoint. Or did you, uh, do, you, do you have it powered for the endpoint you're interested? Uh, from a statistical point of view, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I understand. But uh, for this this uh, was uh, in uh, in the try to to make it as simple as, as possible. Mm. But uh, it it was uh, a complete statistic evaluation of the data, and the the thing was uh, to to uh, follow the the comparison of of the change between both groups, not not uh, some some uh, absolute values and randomization. The randomization for the for the hormonal treatment was uh, was uh, you know each second child was uh, was offered with with the gonadotropin treatment. And that was that was easy to do. I mean, I, I think this is very interesting because randomization in this type of setting is in itself the uptake of the randomization is pretty interesting. I think that's exciting that you could do that. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, uh, I know we we were um, uh, we were uh, afraid about what what will happen if the patient w wouldn't uh, agree with the with the treatment. But uh, fortunately, the, the the situation was was different. And if you motivate those parents and and ensure them about the about the safetyness without any uh, without any side effects of the treatment, it uh, wasn't so a uh, huge problem. Dr. Brutus? The, the information, did you take into account the level of undescended instance, the position? Yes, uh, this is very very important, and I thank uh, thank you for the for this question because the the problem of uh, of uh, also of the previous studies was that the position of the testicle uh, wasn't confirmed always as as uh, cryptorchidism as as true understanding testis, and the situation should be different when it is uh, for example uh, ectopic testicle and not truly truly uh, re retention in the in the in the inguinal channel so uh, all of them were uh, truly cryptorchid maybe i missed it <clears throat> what was the median follow up and uh, what is the minimum follow up you know uh you know with this uh, we we offered them that we will uh, check them firstly at 3 months uh, we started at 2016 then we uh, check them again and confirm the, the cryptorchidism at six months and then uh, offer them the, the, the surgical treatment until the, the 12 months. And that's enough? Uh, no, no, no. We continue and we, we, we believe that in in uh, next 10 years, maybe, they will be already after true puberty and we can do some semen analysis. In this, in so this again, patients. country competition 2032. Probably, but uh, I think I will be too old for for it. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Okay, okay um, next one is uh, Mr. Patsikas from Hungary. Different uh, response to standard first-line treatment in breast cancer antigen-positive metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer meta-analysis. Can I, use this? Can, I, can I use this one? Dear Professor Shariat, Professor Stenzel, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to represent Hungary in today's competition and to give you a little insight in our meta-analysis in which we are assessing the BRCA positive, BRCA mutation positive metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer patients. I've got no uh, conflicts of interest in, in this topic. First of all, I would like to talk about my vision. My vision is that with the development of precision medicine and molecularly targeted individual with base therapy, the life quality and expectancy of oncologic patients can be highly improved. And in line with this vision, my mission is to find biomarkers which can guide optimal therapy sequencing in both prostate and bladder cancer patients. But let's move on with this project. First of all, I have to state out that 10% of the advanced prostate cancer pati patients are the so-called BRCA or BRCA mutation positive. But probably this is one of the most well-known, most fam famous genes of all time, because this was the one because of which Angelina Jolie underwent a prophylactic mastectomy. But what is the normal function of the gene? It's a tumor suppressor gene, and it helps in the repair of the double-strand DNA breaks, resulting in a lower mutational burden under physiological conditions. But what happens uh, in case of uh, BRCA, BRCA loss of function mutations? The mutation burden is going to be elevated, resulting in a speeded up tumorigenesis. And why is it important for us in urology? Because the BRCA positive prostate cancer patients uh, are uh, BRCA positive disease is a much more aggressive disease. It occurs in a much younger age, and these patients' survival is worse compared to the Y type ones. And besides the biologic effect of the gene, the BRCA positive patients represent a clinically different subtype of prostate cancer patients. First of all, We've got an on-label inhibitor targeted therapy for these patients, the so-called PARP inhibitors. You probably heard of it during uh, even today and, and, and yesterday's workshops. And, uh, but, but according to the guidelines, you can only give PARP inhibitors from the second treatment line. But what should we give these patients in the first treatment line? Well, this question has not been assessed and it's unclear until today, even today. So our aim with this study was to assess the first and second line therapeutic answers, answers in this novel subgroup of patients. Well, this kind of setup would cry for an interventional kind of uh, meta-analysis, but during our preliminary research, we haven't found any um, trials which would have compared directly these agents to one another. So we decided on writing a descriptional or proportional meta-analysis in which we are assessing the PSA 50 response in this novel subgroup of metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer patients. And for this purpose, we use the so-called COCOPOP framework. We registered, of course, our uh, our uh, study in the PROSPERO performed the systematic search with the following search key, and we started with, a lot, with about 11,000 hits and ended up with 16 full text eligible articles. Let's move on to the results. PSA 50, regardless of treatment line, we could assess more than 200 patients for this analysis. And in the case of abirateron, 53% of the patients responded. For enzalutamide, this response rate was 56%. And for docetoxel, the response rates were 47%. But what happens when we divide the treatment lines for first and second line treatments? In the first line, we could assess uh, about 100 patients. And for abirateron, 52% responded. For enzalutamide, 64% responded. And for docetoxel, 56% uh, of the patients responded. So you could see that the highest answer rate was in the case of enzalutamide treatment. And what can we see in the second treatment line? We could assess about 50 patients. Uh, for abirateron, 36% responded. For enzalutamide, 46 And for docetoxel, 42 responded. Well, to sum up things, on the one hand, our study 
has some limit, some um, uh, strengths. I would like to highlight that this is the first meta-analysis in the topic, gathering data on these patients uh, with the PSA 50 outcome. And we had the opportunity to uh, do further analysis in approximately 50 or 60% of the of the uh, full text eligible articles, we could use the individual patient data with all the baseline characteristics. Of course, on the other hand, we've got some limitations as well. Obviously, the small sample size is a big limitation. And as I mentioned before, there are no studies comparing directly the agents. Well, as conclusions, I would like to underline again that we found the highest proportion of patients responding with PSA 50 for enzalutamide. And this differential response rate was the largest in the first treatment line. But what should we do with this data? What does it mean for our everyday clinical practice? But based on this study, because it was a descriptional study, we can conclude that BRCA-positive patients respond for all first-line available treatment options. But I would like to add and highlight the importance of uh, performing molecularly marker-driven interventional RCTs, comparing these agents with uh, one another to have higher evidence in this uh, uh, field. I would like to close my presentation with, the, with my personal motto, with the words of San Francisco of Assisi, that first you should do what is necessary, then what is possible, and suddenly you are doing the impossible. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Tamás, for this uh, really nice presentation. Um, now, the question is, you know, PSA 50 is, we, we know that enzalutamide tended to have a, a better response with regards to PSA than, for example, some, uh, some of its competitors. Does it really mean uh, time to recurrence, time uh, disease-free time, and overall survival? quality of life and stuff like that. It, it's a, thank you for this question. We, um, I didn't include that we, uh, we have other endpoints for this study, other time to event data for progression-free survival and overall survival, but this data is under statistical analysis now. Okay. Thank you very much. Do you think that actually these patients are at all well treated with these type of therapies and should we consider, you know, some combination with, you know, Harp inhibitors and so on, probably. Uh, well, I didn't the catch the mutations. The, if, uh, if, if that we, should we give uh, yeah. single agents or combined agents? Was right. this the question? Yeah. Well, the study, the evidence that we have from the uh, profound study, for example, with with Olaparib, they combined a novel uh, antiandrogen uh, with uh, with uh, Olaparib on the arm A, and uh, on the the uh, control arm, they had uh, only. The, one of the new generation antiandrogens, and they could show a difference. Well, that study, uh, difference in radiology-based uh, progression-free survival. But obviously, that study has some limitations because of the crossovers, and in the contrast, they gave um, um, they gave abiraterone after enzalutamide or enzalutamide of the abiraterone, which we know that it's not the the uh, the best uh, possible uh, treatment that we can give. But there are ongoing studies in the topic as well, like in the PROPEL study or the, uh, or the, uh, the magnitude study assessing Olaparib and Niraparib in the first uh, setting. And we will have more evidence uh, in the near future in this, uh, regarding your question. There are a couple of other drugs, you know, Talazoparib, uh, Rukaparib, and others. And uh, it was funny that ATM was actually positive for Ola Olaparib. Uh, but it didn't make it uh, apparently to uh, to be approved by the EMA. Yeah, now, that is, depending on the drugs, do you foresee that maybe someone like ATM and others may be responsive to other drugs coming up? It's very interesting because in the profound trial, the, um, the, the, tr the design of the trial, so they made the analysis um, with a cohort of BRCA1, 2, and positive and ATM positive uh, patients as well. And uh, well, Olaparib showed significant uh, benefit for ATM positive patients as well. And but, but although it, the EMA uh, didn't approve it for, for ATM, but the EAU guidelines still suggested uh, to give these patients uh, or HRR positive 
um, patients beside BRCA mutation. So uh, you can you may give them off label, but further uh, studies are needed, and the the data in the topic is is evolving really rapidly. Very much less a question. What time should we do the genetic testing in these patients? In these, well, according to the um, guidelines, there are several indications for genetic testing. First of all, all metastatic uh, castration resistant cases should be tested in an ideal world, and uh, all localized high risk patients should be testing. Previous history of uh, breast cancer, family uh, history positive, possible Lynch syndrome in the family, colorectal endometrial ovarian breast cancer in the family, and um, and known germline um, BRCA mutation. Oh, well, well, that's uh, no well, uh, BRCA mutation in the family Fantastic. of these patients. Thank you so much. There was a fantastic Thank you very much. presentation. Fantastic. Honestly, the Hungarians can be really proud of this meeting because yesterday you have seen big hitters from Hungary and then today also tremendous performance. Uh, Poland. Uh, Mrs. Kronosta giving us a prognostic value of tumor aggression grades in uh, patients who underwent neoadjuvant chemotherapy for uh, bladder cancer, muscle invasive. Thank you so much. Ms. Kronosta. <laughs> <laughs> uh, noble Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I am very proud to uh, represent Poland in the country competition. I have a privilege to uh, present the prognostic value of tumor regression grade in muscle invasive bladder cancer patients who underwent uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by radical cystectomy. These are my disclosures. As we all know, muscle invasive bladder cancer is one of the deadliest urological malignancies. Even after radical surgical treatment, the five year overall survival rate do not exceed 60%. These outcomes have improved after introducing neoadjuvant chemotherapy into muscle invasive bladder uh, cancer patients treatment. However, we know that not all the patients will respond to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. There is no standardized way to, uh, to assess who will respond and who will not. Therefore, for all patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer, the neoadjuvant chemotherapy is recommended by guidelines for all the patients eligible for cisplatin-based multidrug therapy. The pathological examination of radical cystectomy specimen uh, in patients who underwent neoadjuvant chemotherapy gives us the unique opportunity to assess response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy in vivo. We all know that complete pathological uh, response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy is associated with superb prognosis, and the concept of tumor regression grades, which quantifies the pathological uh, response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy in muscle invasive bladder cancer was introduced by Fleischmann and colleagues, and they were also able to show the uh, prognostic value of TRGs. By the definition, TRG1 is a complete pathological response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. There is no viable, uh, viable cancer, only fibrotic tissue in the tumor bed. TRG2 is a strong pathological response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy with the domination of fibrosis in the tumor bed and a viable cancer in less than 50% of the tumor bed. And for TRG3, it is no pathological response or weak pathological response. And the tumor bed, there is like a domination of viable cancer in a tumor bed. TRGs as are uh, assessed separately for the primary tumor and separately for lymph nodes. And the worse, higher value of TRG is assigned as final. Another retrospective cohort was presented by Seiler and co-authors in the EAU Congress in 2017 in London. TRGs were determined, but they integrated TRGs with TNM classification uh, and they divided patients into three response to chemotherapy group. Major responders were patients with no muscle invasive bladder cancer and no lymph node involvements irrespective of TRG. Partial responders were patients with either muscle invasive bladder cancer patients or lymph node involvement and TRG2. And non-responders were patients with either muscle invasive bladder cancer and or lymph node involvement and TRG3. The authors were able to show that uh, integrating TRG with TNM classification provides a superb prognostic value. 
we decided to, uh, to test the uh, impact of TRG and TRG integrated with TNM classification in an independent cohort. Uh, patients with urotelial mass invasive bladder cancer who underwent full dose neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by planned radical cystectomy in a single tertiary center between 2000, December 2012 and December 2017 were included into the study. Following Fleischmann method, a dedicated uropathologist determined TRGs. And then after integrating TRGs with uh, TNM classification, we divided patients into three responders group. To estimate the overall survival and recurrence-free survival, uh, we uh, used Kaplan-Meier plots and Cox proportional hazard models were uh, used to assess the association between TRGs and between response group and overall survival and recurrence-free survival. So uh, among uh, 70 patients who were included into the study, 20 patients had complete pathological response to the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, TRG1, 37 patients had strong pathological response to the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, TRG2, and 13 patients had uh, weak or no pathological response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, TRG3. After integrating TRG into TNM classification, there were 36 major responders, 21 partial responders, and 13 uh, non-responders. Uh, most of the patients received cisplatin-based multidrug chemotherapy. So, estimated recurrence-free survival stratified by TRG is presented on the left and estimated OS on the right. The risk of recurrence uh, for TRG2 was four times higher and for uh, TRG3 nearly 10 times higher when compared to TRG1. Uh, to, to TRG1. And for death, uh, the risk for TRG2 was twice higher and for TRG3 nearly nine times higher when compared to TRG1. For response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy group, the estimated recurrence-free survival is presented on the left and uh, estimated overall survival is presented on the right. The risk of recurrence for partial responders was six times higher and for non-responders nine times higher when compared to major responders. And the risk of death for partial responders was, nearly, uh, was more than nine times higher and for <coughs> non-responders 18, time 18 times higher compared to major responders. A couple months after the publication of our study, the multicenter retrospective study was uh, on prognostic value of TRG and uh, TRG integrated with TNM was published confirming our results. Moreover, the authors were able to show that the prognostic model using TR TRG uh, integrated with TNM classification was better than the model using only TNM classification. Moreover, the authors uh, confirmed the strong association, the strong in, uh, intra-observer agreement in determining TRG, the overall kappa for uh, central uh, pathology reviewer and uh, local pathologist was 0.82. To conclude, determining TRG is simple, reproducible, cheap, and creates the possibility to assess a response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy irrespective of the uh, disease advancement, provides an incremental prognostic value to the current standard, and may be used to help us to decide uh, for, like, to make clinical decisions in both adjuvant and potentially palliative settings could potentially be used as a comparator in a biomarker study and could potentially be used in assessing pathological response in any type of neoadjuvant treatment which will end with radical cystectomy. But of course, the value of TRG needs a prospective validation. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. It was interesting. Uh, have you uh, considered or, or correlated the, the response grade to, uh, with uh, the type of chemotherapy and number of cycles? Um, thank you for this interesting question. 
we only consider patients with full dose chemotherapy and the majority of patients in our study got uh, gemcitabine with uh, cisplatin, more than 70%, and we had a very small cohort, so we didn't get that. Thank you very much for, for this nice work. Um, do you think there is a selection bias possible? Of course. <laughs> Thank you for this question. <laughs> but how would you uh, then... Well, Sorry. selection bias, because not all the patients will be able to, uh, like, not no, all no, the patients... No, no, that you don't get only pieces of certain, certain pieces of the tumor, and you may get the more, the one with the higher regression and the one with less regression. Is there a mixed pattern? Uh, could you please repeat the question? Is there a mixed pattern throughout the entire tumor area or throughout the entire uh, bladder? Uh, well, uh... These were only the patients with one solid tumor and the pathologies were like dedicated to assess because this is a quantity. So they if it's more or less than 50%. So of course there might be, the, but this is while uh, in this multi-center study, they tested like inter-observer agreement between pathologists because this is the low point of this, of this assessment. And of course we don't know if for mass invasive bladder cancer, the 50% cutoff is a good cutoff. That's why it needs uh, a prospective validation for the for one thing. Of course, the TUR might change the results of pathologies. This is the second low point of this method, but it's for free. So we can use it. It's, it can be easily added to the standard pathological uh, examination with no, no additional costs. It's great, just not for free. <laughs> In our department for free. <laughs> we don't okay. pay for that extra. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a fantastic presentation. <laughs> Bravo. I tell you, it's going to be hard to find the best uh, today. It's going to be a really challenging, a lot of great presentation. Uh, okay. Uh, next one is uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bolai. No? Yes, yeah. Mr. Bolai, sorry. Uh, narrow band imaging for non muscle invasive bladder cancer from better vision to oncologic impact. That's up your alley. Huh? Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Shariat, Professor Stensi, dear colleagues, I'm uh, honored to present you the narrow band imaging for non muscle invasive bladder cancer from better vision to oncologic impact. I have no conflict of interest. So, I'll start it with the Cystoscopy equipment, who was developed in um, 1878 by uh, Nietzsche and Joseph Later. Um, they introduced the first working cystoscope. Uh, another important point in the history is uh, when Harold Hopkins in 1959 uh, introduced the fiber optic technology into the cystoscope. And a few years later, Carl Storz uh, purchase this system and uh, provide, us, uh, provide to us a higher quality images with excellent illuminations. All these systematic advances in innovation and technology uh, provide us, provided us high quality images of the bladder, which allow us to uh, give to the patients a high level uh, of care. Uh, but white light cystoscopy of course, has a high sensitivity for detecting papillary bladder tumors, but is limited in detecting the presence of carcinoma in situ. So it uh, may be missed in as many as 20% of patients. What is narrow band imaging? Narrow band imaging is a high resolution endoscopic technique uh, that filters out the red spectrum of light and selectively transmits blue and green segments of white light. Uh, was developed in 1999 when Professor Gono voluntarily subjected himself to the MBI technique. In 2005, uh, we had the first um, scopes of MBI from Olympus, uh, Olympus Xera 2 and Avis Lucera Spectrum, but those scopes had uh, some issue with the illumination. The illumination compared with white light cystoscopy wasn't so good. 
So uh, then came the second generation of scopes and um, this second generation of scopes improve the illumination's uh, intensity. What and why is it, is it so important? Because as you can see, according to the Global Cancer Observatory, the bladder cancer has a, an incidence of 11.3 and the mortality of 3.1 in uh, 2020. And it, it is expected to increase by 31% uh, within 20 years. Of course, that the detection of bladder tumors is supported by a lot of studies already published. And we can see we have uh, this published from 2012 um, when MBI was compared with white light cystoscopy and uh, the outcomes uh, was in better patient level detection rates and narrow band imaging when compared to white light cystoscopy. Also, a better tumor level detection rates uh, in the same comparison. We have this uh, study from uh, uh, 2015 when Professor, when, uh, Professor Javlete uh, reported superior diagnosis accuracy detection rates by cases with 92.3 person versus 69.2 uh, in the analysis and by lesions when uh, discovered reported 93.75 percent versus 71.9 percent uh, all in favor of narrow band imaging also the the data regarding the detection of bladder tumors are strengthened uh, by some meta analysis uh, and we have this meta-analysis from uh, 2017 uh, when uh, they reported an additional detection rates of 9.9% uh, per patient and 18.6% per lesion. Of course, uh, the detection of the carcinoma in, in situ has a, it, is, it is a particular situation because the carcinoma in, sat, in situ have uh, a great uh, a high potential to progression. So the majority of the authors reported uh, the data separately. We have uh, the pool data of four studies, including included the 387 patients, and they reported a significantly higher detection rates of carcinoma in situ by narrow band imaging. When we are, we are talking about the recurrence, uh, the results are in contradictory because in 2015, this, uh, this study reported um, a lower recurrence rate at one year uh, of follow up in narrow band imaging assisted um, QRBT compared to light and we can see we can see here a percent of lower recurrence a lower recurrence of 21.1 percent compared to one year follow-up in wildlife cystoscopy of 39.7 also uh, recent studies from uh, 2018 uh, revealed that the use of narrow band imaging technology in the resection of margins and base improved persistence rate on red QRBT in patients with PT1 high-grade disease. The contradictions comes from this uh, important article, which is a multicenter randomized trial, uh, who emphasized two main ideas. First, narrow band imaging and wildlife guidance achieve similar overall recurrence rates after QRBT at 12 months follow-up and narrow band imaging assisted QRBT significantly reduced disease recurrence in low risk patients. What happens after BCG, BCG therapy? Uh, as we know, the reddish patches seen after intravesical BCG therapy can be mistakenly considered as tumors. So when we are switching to the MBI mode, the suspicious 
you know, vascularized lesions look brownish and black, where lesions that look greenish uh, with narrow band imaging are less likely to be tumors. So narrow band imaging appear to better identify patients who have suspected residual tumors on follow-up at three months after BCG therapy. Con considering a better visualization, an improved staging, a better local uh, control, and fewer recurrence with narrow band imaging, we can say that narrow band imaging improved the therapeutic impact. But we have this comparison uh, who concluded that the progression risk so score were not statistically different between narrow band imaging and white light cystoscopy. Of course, there are, that, uh, are available a lot of study that compares narrow band imaging and photodynamic diagnosis. And uh, as all of you know, the photodynamic diagnosis is the, it depends on the absorption of light agent contrast by cancer cells, and narrow band imaging is not cancer specific. So the interpretation is subjective. We have a study who compared narrow band imaging photodynamic diagnosis with the uh, white light cystoscopy, and uh, this study reported a significantly higher sensitivity for detection of carcinoma in situ and dysplasia in uh, narrow band imaging and PDD groups compared to white light cystoscopy, we can see 95.7 and 95.7 uh, compared to 65.2 with a p-value uh, lower than uh, 0.05. Also, the results are in favor of these two methods uh, in the analysis per lesion. Pushing the boundaries, the use of narrow... already to 10 minutes. You're already three minutes over. Please, let's move on. Okay, so I just want to say that uh, narrow band imaging is promising technique in upper urinary tract cell carcinoma, but uh, studies are necessary. Further, in conclusion, the learning curve uh, no significant learning curve with MBI, also cost effectiveness is uh, uh, the studies resulted in estimated savings of some dollars per year. MBI improves bladder cancer management uh, are irrespective of intravertical installation. Uh, it's likely that it would lead to more relaxed surveillance, easy to learn and cost effective. And considering cost reliability and simplicity, it may be a promising modality. However, it's not as extensively studied as photodynamic diagnosis. Thank you very much. Okay, um, after 10 or more years, it's only a promising study. But uh, uh, no, the, there is one mean question. I, I admit it's mean, but I thought, well, country competition. You said uh, brownish and greenish. And you know, the most common color blindness is red and green. Uh, yes. Is Thank there you. any way of objectively saying that? No, this, uh, this is the differences because uh, being not uh, cancer specific and remain the, on a subjective technique, also we know from the, from the technique the, that these uh, aspects are based on the absorption of hemoglobin in the, in the vessels. All, uh, it, it, I think it depends only in how much the morphological uh, layers are visualized. Comprehensive lecture. Just maybe one question. You know, we, we know the NBI for maybe 15 years. I don't know exactly. We still have no proof that it really uh, increase the tumor-free survival. Uh, is it necessary to confirm that? You know, it, it improves the quality of endoscopy. So what do you think? Is it necessary to make such a big study 
the method is not free of charge, of course, but it is not expensive. So, uh, in my opinion, I think that it's not so necessary to confine because uh, it is not so aggressive. So we don't need some special uh, devices or uh, some special agent contrast like in photodynamic diagnosis. So, but uh, sure that when you have some studies that uh, sustain the idea, the things are uh, more correctly to be done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Kovacic from Slovakia. Robot assisted radical prostatectomy. Do we provide the best possible care? A provocative question. Dear ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me thank you for the opportunity to speak at uh, this exceptional meeting. My name is Viktor Kovacic, and I'm going to try to answer the question if we provide the best possible treatment to our patients when we perform robot assisted radical prostatectomy to them. This is a short disclosure statement. Uh, to start, I'd like to say a few words about prostate cancer. With its uh, nearly one and a half million of new prostate cases diagnosed in 2020, it's ranked the second most frequent cancer and the fifth leading cause of cancer. Uh, the possibilities for curative treatment of significant localized prostate cancer, our radical prostatectomy radiation therapy, or eventually others uh, on a clinical trial setting. So, do we provide best possible treatment? It's quite a hard question uh, to answer, but let me introduce Peter to help us a little bit, because he's one of the patients who likes to ask similarly challenging questions as well. Uh, he's a 55 years old man who has no risk factors for prostate cancer and uh, has no significant medical history, is physically active. He was tested with a PSA value of 6.1 nanograms per milliliter so he underwent MRI imaging, which revealed a Pirates of 3 region with no enlarged lymph nodes and intact uh, capsule of the prostate. Uh, he underwent combined systematic and targeted biopsy, which showed isobrate 2 lesion in three samples. Uh, this case was presented in a multidisciplinary discussion, and a curative treatment for this patient was proposed. Let's forget about Peter for a second. And let's talk about robot-assisted radical prostatectomy. What are the goals of it? First of all, we want to leave patient cancer-free and also maintaining it functionally intact. I think uh, this is the most challenging part of the prostate cancer surgery because on one hand, we need to remove all the cancer and on the other hand, we, the, should, not, uh, we should not damage the surrounding tissue so much that it would impair the functional outcomes. The guidelines recommend us to use MRI for local staging and also to use CT stage, isograde, and combine these into the nomogram. We know that the CT stage is quite subjective and nomogram contains these parameters in itself, so we're left with isograde and resonance imaging. So these are the two pillars we build our decision on how, how radical are we going to operate our patient on. So we thought, can we rely on these? How how reliable are they? So we conducted a study on 504 patients uh, to, to examine the upgrading phenomenon, meaning the, uh, the increasing of isobrade between prostate biopsy and the radical prostatectomy specimen results. The upgrading itself was present in 39%, and when these data were subjected to statistical analysis, we are able to show a significant association of upgrading with positive surgic margins. Uh, the odds ratio is uh, 2.25 higher. We wanted to go in further and we looked at the biochemical recurrence and there was also a statistically significant association uh, with this upgrading phenomenon. The other pillar is the MRI. Uh, the important thing we want to find out on the MRI scan is whether there is extra capsule extension present or not. On the 795 patients, we found 32% of false negative MRI results, which could lead us the wrong way. After statistical analysis, we found that these false negative results were associated with 3.47 higher odds ratio for the, for the uh, 
uh, positive surgical margin presence. So this means we cannot blindly rely on this preoperative staging information because they can easily lead us the wrong way. Even more interesting is the combination of these factors because patients uh, would have upgrading and false negative MRI present together have the odds ratio of 6.26 times higher. And it's quite a significant risk, isn't it? So do you remember this slide and the two pillars we base our decision on? And do you still remember Peter and his preoperative staging? So anyway, Peter opted for a robot assisted uh, radical prostatectomy. And after the final histopathologic examination, isobrate free prostate cancer was found with its capsule disruption. Anyway, Peter was one of the lucky and didn't have uh, positive surgical margins. After all, what did we find out? Upgrading and false negative MRI can lead to positive surgical margins and upgrading even to early biochemical recurrence. Combinations of these two factors can have a multiply the risk for our patients. So, first of all, we should not blindly rely on our preoperative staging, and we should surely cooperate with our local pathologist and radiologist. And maybe in some patients, we should consider perioperative histopathological exam to confirm negative margins. And for the future, should we build uh, new MRI scoring systems or uh, should we use artificial intelligence, radiomic models, uh, PSMA, PET CT, or combine these together to get better uh, preoperative staging? So, uh, to get back to the introductory questions. I'm sure that in well-selected patients with localized prostate cancer, we do provide uh, best possible treatment, but isn't Peter the best one to answer this question? And this is Peter smiling, enjoying his happy life, being cancer-free. And this is, I think, our greatest mission in our work. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? So one question I have, um, it's a good presentation, but I don't even know if uh, the surgical margins even translate into significant endpoints, number one. You haven't proven that, right? And number two, how I, I was the whole time trying to think, what does this have to do anything with robotic prostatectomy rather than preoperative staging or preoperative variables? I mean, I know they're linked because your intervention is linked to your staging, but uh, can you make the connection for me? Yeah. Compared uh, to, because I was kind of thinking about something else. Yeah. Uh, probably you thought we are going to compare different uh, therapeutic yeah. modalities. <laughs> Actually, our goal uh, was to answer uh, the question of the patient who is sitting in front of us and is asking us, is this a good option for me? Can I be cancer free after this operation or can I not? And uh, what we wanted to find was, uh, the problems which we are facing in the preoperative staging because this can lead us uh, the wrong way and it's quite a significant problems in uh, in many centers i think thanks for you yeah mr Ramsey, also from vienna it's it's going in the same direction as shark said and thank you very much i think it shows the problem very well what we have but if the patient says he wants to be cancer free then we should not go too near to the prostate. So I think this has something to do with the counseling upfront. So if you discuss with the patient, he wants to have full nerve sparing and uh, the MRI shows it's okay, but he still is, uh, we know if we go closer, yes, a dry higher risk for positive surgical margins. But the patient makes a decision with you together. So it's not a decision you make alone in the operating theater. So TAS, uh, it means that the risk for a positive surgical margin is well known uh, before. So you counsel him, and if he gets positive surgical margin, this means he has a higher risk for maybe a salvage radiation therapy one day. So this is, the, this again, from the methodology, the question would be different. Is the MRI good enough to tell the surgeon how far we can go. I think this would be the aim of the study, and it has nothing so much to do with the robotic approach or whatever. Is this correct? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's good comment. Thank you very much. I just will not be so polite. Uh, I think uh, talking about 
we are talking about the oncological treatment. The margins is no endpoint. Uh, we should talk about oncological results. Uh, this is exactly the example why we are not so successful in medical oncologists in the last time. You know, the, the, the point is, does surgical margins really translate in, you know, disease recurrence and does that disease recurrence by chemical recurrence translate in necessity for further treatment and mortality or other effects as the, the endpoints that we are facing this disease in this disease because of long protected natural history. Please, Sasha. I think we know that um, a positive surgical margin translates into um, higher risk of biochemical recurrence. That's why he's right, isn't he? I don't know. No, I think we have really the mission that we have to avoid positive surgical margin because it's a real risk factor for recurrence. If it translates into, um, let's say, a worse survival, that's, that's what you are pointing out. That's what you are questioning. Well, the question for me was, you know, do I treat every positive surgical margin and will every surgical margin lead to bad chemical recurrence? For sure not, not even half no, of them. That's true. that's true. So half of them will be totally insignificant. I mean, depending on what margins, what grade are the margin, the, the length of your margin and so on. So I think one endpoint could be as a better surrogate as positive margins could be the grade of the margin and length of the margin, right? The diameter of the margin. That, so trying to differentiate the significant margin versus the not significant margin. And the, as you mentioned earlier, the iatrogenic and the, and the cancerous uh, uh, margins, you know, with, risk, with the robotics that could be an impact. But it's a challenge we're facing in urology, obviously, with all our studies and our endpoints, short of, you know, by chemical recurrence, which even in itself is not a good endpoint. Because metastasis is the endpoint we care about, or further treatment, right? Yeah, for sure. But as our colleague said, from the studies, we know that some patients with uh, positive surgical margins uh, lead; uh, it can lead to biochemical recurrence significantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is that we, as as a urologist, our point or our our aim is to remove the cancer. That's why the patient undergoes surgery. So I think that's our main goal. Why the patient goes on the table. So we should uh, really do everything uh, to maintain this. And uh, we, what we wanted to show that the preoperative staging is really important thing and can lead us the wrong way. And I think that uh, none of the patients which comes after the surgery for the checkup would be happy when we tell him he has a positive surgical margins, despite of how long it is, uh, how big or whatever. And we are talking about uh, the satisfaction of the patient and his quality of life, uh, the level of anxiety for the future and everything. So that's what we went, wanted to point out. Well, isn't it great to have a presentation and the longest discussion? <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Thank you. <laughs> the only thing why I'm still standing here is I really want to stress the importance of intraoperative whole mountain frozen section. Yeah, if you want to avoid surgical margin, which I as a surgeon really want, otherwise I wouldn't go for surgery, um, I really want to be safe and at the same time I want to preserve as much function as possible. So I really stress the intraoperative whole mountain surgical um, frozen section. Yeah, it's actually one of the possibilities I've mentioned. And uh, it could be a problem in many departments because of the time and everything and organization. We use it for selective patients where we ex expect a high risk of positive surgical margins. Well, Victor, very, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the extensive discussion. Thank you. And now we're getting to the next uh, and the last uh, presentation also on robots. It's the surgical treatment of renal mass with robot-assisted partial nephrectomy and the use of intraoperative ultrasound and flexible ureteroscopy. And it's Mr. Janza from Slovenia. Janza or Janza? Janza, sorry. Um, hello, I'm honored to speak here today. Um, so. I'll be talking about surgical treatment of renal mass with robot-assisted partial nephrectomy and the use of intraoperative ultrasound and flexible ureteroscopy. I'll present it on the case which will show the importance of intraoperative diagnostics during the procedure. And I'm going to pose a question if the technology is guiding us to a better surgery today. So to begin with the case, 
It was a 34-year-old male with hematuria who came to urologists and the urologist, firstly, cystoscopy was performed, which showed no sign of bladder tumor. Uh, later, uh, urine samples for cytology were taken, which were all negative. That's why we performed a CT scan on this patient. CT scan showed a renal mass the size of 20 times 20 millimeters. However, the radiologist looking at this CT scan wasn't certain. He suspected renal cell carcinoma, but could not be 100% sure if this is not, in fact, a transitional cell carcinoma. That is why we presented the case to the group of our radiologists on multidisciplinary meeting, and they took a closer look at those uh, CT images, and they concluded that this is, in fact, a renal cell carcinoma. So we decided to perform surgery. Due to the small size of the tumor, we decided to perform robot-assisted partial nephrectomy. And during the surgery, we used intraoperative ultrasound in order to find the tumor because it was inside the parenchyma. However, there we encountered a surprise. Uh, the ultrasound showed that renal mass is extending into the renal pelvis. The image shown looked very similar to transitional cell carcinoma with even small particles raining down from the tumor mass. So at this point, uh, we were faced with a dilemma. Should we do a nephroureterectomy at this stage and risk um, doing more invasive procedure in something that is, could be possibly renal cell carcinoma? Or on the other hand, we could proceed with our first plan, partial nephrectomy, and risk removing transitional cell carcinoma with partial nephrectomy. We decided for neither of those options and decided to use intraoperative diagnostic tools we had at our hand at this time. So we used flexible urethroscopy, which was technically quite challenging because of the patient's position on the side and also it was quite difficult to navigate the urethroscope towards the tumor. And that is why we guided the urethroscope with the ultrasound like shown on those images here. We guided the urethroscope right towards the tumor and the image shown showed the protruding mass which looked like a hematoma and those small particles we saw earlier on the on the ultrasound were actually, uh, was actually blood coming out of the hematoma. So we decided to proceed with our first plan with robotic partial nephrectomy. Um, the next stage, uh, we wanted to clamp the artery. Uh, in this patient, there were two arteries, the main one and one more. The main artery was more readily accessible. So we first clamped the main artery and used ICG in order to see if uh, the ischemia uh, is sufficient. And ischemia was sufficient, so we proceeded with the removal of the tumor mass. So, and then we finished with the procedure. A uh, patient was released from the hospital first day after surgery. He was able to return to his normal activities after one week. And in fact, histology, which came later, showed that it was neither a renal cell carcinoma nor transitional cell carcinoma. It was actually a hematoma, despite the fact that the patient didn't recall any uh, trauma. So in conclusion, I'd say that uh, the use of intraoperative diagnostic tools in this patient helped us avoid nephroeuterectomy in young patient. And it answers the question from the first slide that the technology is guiding us to a better surgery today. Thank you. Igor. And so why haven't you used intraoperative pathology? Um, we could also use intraoperative uh, pathology, but uh, we decided to rely on um, our intraoperative diagnostic tools instead. Um, actually, we would have done the same 
if we relied on intraoperative pathology. Decided to use diagnostics. Yeah. You rely on the look of an eye. And instead you can use the pathologist to look under the micro. Yes, yeah, that is right. Uh, however, I think that um, the images shown by our scope showed that this was clearly just a hematoma and not a transitional cell carcinoma. And also all other previous radiological findings uh, show that. But imaging also saw that he had a tumor and that was wrong. Regarding to war ischemia, uh, if you have selective clamping, you can verify ischemia by ICG as you, as you did, or it can be done by ultrasound as well. You, you are equipped with ultrasound. Which one is better? Why you decided for ICG? Because I think uh, in, in most of cases, uh, ultrasound is Doppler, it's enough. What's your opinion? Uh, yeah, we could also do that. So I think they are quite comparable. Um, but we have more uh, experience with the use of ICG for checking the ischemia. That's why we use it. Thank you very much. One more question. One more question, somebody's burning question. Yeah, burning question. Uh, you, you, you discharge the patient the first day after? Yes. So we always uh, discharge a patient after robotic partial nephrectomies. The first day after surgery. He stays in uh, the ICU until the morning and then he leaves yeah, home? Yeah, that's right. Impressive. Yeah. It's American style, I tell you. <laughs> Sometimes we discharge the patients before the surgery. <laughs> so, uh, due to Corona. No, it's, it's really good. I, I mean, this is the benefit of the minimally invasive surgery. There wasn't a, it was a bad joke. I apologize. I really thank you. Thank you very much for the great presentation. I think we can be really proud for this great uh, country competition. Really excellent. Thank you, Arnold, for the co-chairing. Um, Arnold thought he's coming to Vienna is going to work a little bit, uh, but we're going to make him work a lot. So uh, not only his great course of the ESU, uh, while we, he's going to have his Lex, the EAU lecture, we're going to count the points. Please uh, don't f uh, forget to give Sylvia the scores, uh, Milan. Uh, what are you doing? Conflict. <laughs> He's putting the points. Okay. <laughs> wow. You put Czech Republic 10 points. It's only five maximum. <laughs> okay. 11 points. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the judges as well, for the attention, for the questions. The EAU lecture by Arnold Stenzel, one of the grand seigneurs the, of the urology in the whole world. I already told you that I'm a big groupie of this man. I have always looked up to him. He's not only a superb surgeon, a tremendous communicator, a leader, a researcher. He's the type of doctor and a person we need in urology to bring the field forward. Uh, Al is the director at the Department of Urology in Tübingen. He's an author to more than 700 articles, uh, peer-reviewed articles, over uh, 600 articles. He has um, worked on many steering committees and activities around the world. Uh, he has even two international patents uh, on very interesting things that he's working with engineers. So you see a man of many talents, a renaissance man. He's also very sportive, I can tell you. I know that Peter went running with him and, and got um, a little bit uh, disappointed of his own performance. And Peter is in good shape. No I, he took me one time in Vancouver. Yeah, he's a champion, I know. He said one day, he said, let's go biking in Vancouver. And we went biking. Uh, after 15 minutes uphill, I had to fake uh, um, um, my bike broken because I couldn't breathe anymore. <laughs> the guy went up the hill. I took a, a taxi back and the bike hanging up the thing. It was very embarrassing. I, I came into the suit in addition to the biking. He made fun of me for quite a long time. He's the chairman of the Scientific Congress. Uh, he was uh, from 2012 at the EAU, moved it really to the next level, and we have really enjoyed that throughout the time. And uh, very smartly before the corona, he gave up that position uh, and now is the adjunct secretary general uh, of the EAU and also the executive uh, member of the science committee where um, I work with him as part of the EU research 
uh, foundation where he is really our uh, man, our mentor, and are pushing our agenda forward to really push the scientific agenda and bring more science to the EAU and to the European urology community. So. Thank you for being here with us today. I know you have a very busy schedule. A lot of people want uh, part of your time. Uh, we really appreciate that you came in person and uh, representing the EAU with the EAU lecture. And I think it's very appropriate for the SOIS meeting to have the EAU lecture, the last part of the day presented by you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sharok. I love you. <laughs> you know, it's uh, after hearing you, I guess I won't be able to fit through the door back home because I'm swelling. <laughs> No, thank you very much. It sounds so much better than uh, anything. Uh, actually, I was trailing Peter running. Uh, and so if you wouldn't have run so fast, I wouldn't have made it. No, uh, anyhow, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you very much for so many people uh, to have me uh, in between uh, now going home and seeing your family or having dinner or something like that. I'm sorry I'm going to spoil that when... Uh, uh, 20, 20 to five, 25 minutes. It's about precision medicine and it's about uh, precision surgery. And um, the way um, we, we, we see it is that, uh, you know, precision means we need more information during surgery. You know, it's just, uh, it's <clears throat> the robot is going to give us um, enlargement of the view. It's going to a better uh, overview, also a better view of, of little details, but still we can even do better. We can go beyond and we can go uh, to an even bigger precision. This is all work in progress and it is some, most of it is work in progress and this is something uh, which uh, I think at least some of that we'll see in the near future. These are my conflicts. Of and um, <clears throat> We've seen, and I, I told you, we have robotics now, and we have uh, precision uh, with robotics, both in the treatment, but also in the, for example, in the biopsy. You've seen it outside. There's a company uh, displaying it. We have a different one, uh, but we go into more detail. Uh, we go into, uh, we have a better outcome uh, with the biopsy because we want to have it more pre precise, but still uh, two thirds of the biopsies uh, show tumor one third doesn't and one out of that one third we don't know how many we are still missing i uh, there is a possibility of of, of using uh, simple methods like ultrasound and then uh, we can uh, have contrast enhancement there in trying to image parts of the prostate be it vessels, be it nerves, be it other things which we think could be helpful for the location of uh, the tumor. There is uh, the, the, uh, the um, three topics I, I want to address is now how golden is the gold standard in intraoperative uh, uh, diagnostics and the diamonds uh, 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 which we already have uh, what is, uh, can we add to that? And then how brilliant is the future? And um, what about the gold standard? Now the one, the gold standard intraoperatively, and I'm talking about intra or perioperatively, right in the OR. It may be in the operative field, but it may be something which we do uh, in the OR without sending, for example, a, a, a piece of, of, of uh, tissue into uh, pathology for a frozen section. The vision here was or is uh, we want to do as much of a diagnosis uh, of during the surgery, uh, either intraoperatively in the body, intracorporeally, or in the OR take the piece out and do something on the table, which uh, we give us, uh, gives us more time. And uh, it is obvious because uh, that we need that because frozen section, we use it, we use it for benefit yeah? and uh, it has a high sensitivity. But you know, if you look at some of the studies, then um, how much does it really change? How much does it change the overall um, outcome of the patient? And that is still something where we, we uh, still have to uh, uh, think, and we, we've discussed that just before in the country um, competition. 
we also do uh, what we call the two safe uh, tubing and safe uh, uh, version of the frozen section where we try to get every margin of the prostate during while I'm doing the lymphonectomy uh, the pathologist works on it and tries to get as much information but is it do we miss don't we miss something and then of course that is frozen section takes at least half an hour to get the results back now you want to do that a couple of times and you can imagine how difficult it will be uh, and how the uh, pathologist will eventually get pretty grumpy if you send him 10 or 15 frozen sections during a surgery. Huh? So, and then uh, that is one, one of the problems. It is also, you know, the, 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 the false positive and the false negative. Of course, it's small, but, you know, we still uh, do have a problem with that, that, you know, after half an hour or 20 minutes, whatever that is in your pathology, uh, then when you get it back and it's actually not what the, what, uh, the actual picture is. So it is sometimes uh, there is tumor there and there shouldn't be. Huh? Um, and then the, the other thing is uh, imaging. I'm not talking about imaging because imaging during surgery is difficult. It's possible. You, know, you can do an MRI guided surgery like the, uh, 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 the, the neurosurgeons, but um, it is difficult. It's not what um, we have in mind because um, that is uh, another, another issue. And you can use, you can try to get uh, uh, lymphanectomy, uh, salvage lymphanectomy by using, again, some form of imaging. But again, um, it's a little cumbersome and it is something which we have shown in the past it doesn't work so perfectly. So the problem is how golden is the gold standard? We are actually mostly relying on uh, a frozen section with all the disadvantages. And we can use a little bit of imaging uh, during surgery, which is uh, quite complicated, but uh, also doesn't show the entire uh, picture. So what is what can we add? Now, we can try to uh, use uh, the, the, uh, the, the cellular uh, data, which uh, data at a cell level, yeah? And then, um, um, and, and um, we can try to uh, combine that, validate that with, a, uh, with, a, with the help of the pathologists, and then uh, have a data acquisition by having the tissue examined post uh, uh, hoc, post hoc, or afterwards, and then combine it, and then have a uh, constitu constitutive model, which means you know you need uh, a lot of data, and then with the help of these data, then you can validate that with classification, segmentation, and try to make and information out of that. That sounds complicated. I'm not, my, it's not my specialty, it's not uh, informatics, uh, but we'll need it. We definitely need it. Uh, we need all these data to eventually be able to have, with that experience, uh, then have better outcome during surgery. But what do we want during surgery? We want to get a real-time information. And that, for example, can be done by optical emission spectroscopy. And the, the, that has been done. We have done that uh, some time ago. What it, what it means is that we get a, a, the, the data of an electrosurgical spark. And that electrosurgical spark, which, for example, uh, happens during coagulation, bipolar or whatever. And by, the, the, by uh, analyzing the spark, we get some information about the tissue. And this may be uh, malignant versus benign. It may have, but also be something which uh, is important for us for quality of life. Is it nerve structures? Is it fibrous structure? Is it vessel or whatever uh, type of tissue? Or is it parenchymous tissue? So that is information which we can get. We can get with one tool uh, which may be used for coagulation at the same time, but uh, may also give you, uh, give you or us uh, uh, other information. It's possible, 
Yeah, and that spark um, is uh, something that uh, uh, will uh, be able to analyze. And of course, that is uh, something that's absolutely work in progress, but it is something where we have to think about. You know, it's it's not only the optical um, or or the better uh, uh, high dent high HD quality of pictures, but it is a different form of information. And um, it's been done uh, in 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 uh, a couple of samples on uh, which we, which we have used in real cell cancer, yeah? and it allows us uh, something where we can say, okay, uh, it is uh, a proof of principle. But again, one way of uh, getting more precision, better traces. Of course, you know, we can, uh, now I'm back to imaging, but uh, uh, the imaging can, uh, of course, uh, uh, give us more uh, information if we use functional imaging. It's the it's not the, the, the black and white and gray um, pixels that we, we use in that case, but it is the functionality, it's the amount of cells that uh, tend to uh, or that are growing and the, uh, uh, the, the type of antigens these cells express and thus uh, have better traces. And that is uh, guided surgery with PSMA, for example, or other traces. And we've discussed that uh, during the day today, we need other traces because other traces, uh, then other than PSMA, either in addition or um, uh, in in uh, 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 in replacing uh, PSMA, might give us uh, for at least for certain um, uh, different cells, give us a different. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, information. And there's ways, you know, to use that endoscopically, endoscopically with the help of uh, a uh, of, of a carbon um, intraoperative uh, sensor. So then we can uh, take the robot and then really direct uh, the sensor wherever we want to get uh, to the tissue which we think might have the antigen. And that antigen is the one which we uh, recognize or which we use to recognize uh, tumorous areas. And that is, of course, uh, uh, the, the pre preliminary uh, results, and these are older results, and uh, we have uh, uh, better data right now. But, um, of course, it, is, um, uh, it needs uh, the uh, nuclear medical guys sometimes, at least in, in, in Germany, we have to incorporate them. But that allows us uh, uh, at least to get more information. And then, of course, uh, we also want to see what the PSMA is, where the PSMA is uh, accumulating. And that is uh, PSMA uh, labeled fluorescence. Something which we are used uh, already, we are well known, uh, is well known in, in photodynamic diagnosis. Uh, for example, we try to get uh, visibility of uh, areas uh, where there is a, a fast growing uh, uh, tissue or even a tissue that has an antigen which is a pure uh, tumor. Yeah. And that is, for example, uh, PSMA, uh, sorry, um, that is uh, fluorescence uh, labeled uh, lymph nodes. I, usually it comes here. Okay. There's something overlying. Um, uh, you, you should see the, the normal tissue during lymphadenectomy, and then you should see the fluorescence, which you have seen here. But um, what is the future? Where are we working right now? One, work, uh, one possibility is when we do biopsies, uh, how much information can we get out of the needle? And there is a possibility of getting more sensors into the biopsy needle that can not only differentiate between benign and malignant, but also between other uh, forms of, uh, of cells. So the biopsy needle is something where we can also integrate uh, sensors. The best way is, uh, of course, to use a multimodality uh, um, uh, using a, de com uh, a different uh, approach by combining different sensors. Sensors that use optical, electromechanical, and uh, electric um, uh, capabilities of tissue. What do I mean with that? 
for example, um, we we can use uh, Raman spectroscopy. We were discussing that Raman. Uh, he was a Nobel a Nobel laureate in 1928, the only Indian Nobel laureate. So it's almost a hundred years ago that he developed the concept that uh, as every cell has its different pattern, a different uh, uh, spectroscopic uh, um, uh, uh, pattern. Every cell. The problem was, you know, so far over the hundred years, it was used to be a huge machinery. You know, uh, it was at the beginning it was almost half the room. Yeah, uh, it would take to to develop that. And now, um, we if we want to try to to get this information now, it is uh, something that looks like a small refrigerator which you can wheel in into the OR. Which means. You know, the device is there where you can use it intraoperatively. That is one of the examples where you take a tissue out and that tissue which you take out, then you can perform the spectroscopy and then decide not only is it a, a tumor cell or a normal cell, but it's also very important to show that if maybe it is a progenitor cell, maybe it's a cell that we would uh, classify as stem cell. So it does not only mean we get uh, here a better information for oncologic surgery, but also maybe for reconstructive surgery or as the first step for reconstruction because the progenitor or the stem cell. That is what we may need in some uh, organ in order to reconstruct. Um, and that is uh, uh, the, the type of work we are, which we are currently doing in a uh, uh, DFG um, uh, supported uh, 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 project. Uh, and so uh, we can use this also probably in robotics and we can probably also combine it, for example, with infrared spectroscopy. And the concept here is that the uh, spectroscopy will be able to show uh, that different tissues have different uh, infrared wavelengths. And that is uh, something this is, you know, we, we're doing this work together with the Technical University in Stuttgart. Those are engineers, you know, you when you uh, listen to them, um, uh, it's, it's, it's like, um, you know, it's, uh, you, you, you don't understand maybe 10% of the whole thing. Huh? But um, the, the good thing is, you know, we are com uh, in, in, a, in a lab together yeah, it's called the, the joint lab. And in the joint lab, they bring their machineries and we bring our uh, tissue, our surgical tissue, which we take out fresh and they make their uh, exams. And then when they show it to us, we sometimes say, you're nuts, we don't need that. Yeah? But sometimes uh, it will, it comes out and say, okay, I would like to know whether that is a nerve or not, yeah? because in the future, it may help us in guiding us where to see that there is a couple of millimeters beyond the, 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 what you see, there may be nerves and don't cut there unless you really have to. Uh, the other thing is uh, what we're trying to do uh, together uh, to, to make it more precise and to really um, have these engineers work on living tissue, but living tissue that is defined. It's not the mixture of everything, what, what you find when, you, when we uh, go into surgery, but to have organoids and to start out with single cell, single cell cultivation, and then go to organoids. And then once we get these data on organoids, then for from then on, go into uh, into uh, uh, animal studies, and then uh, really get in the real world and try to get these uh, sensors working on uh, a uh, normal or not or abnormal tissue. Yeah? One way, I said, uh, apart from the optical sensors, we also have the me uh, mechanical uh, sensors, and that is uh, sensors that test the elastography of a tissue. Now that may be the tissue, uh, put it here. And then, you know, what happens is you press some water, you do a hydrostatic pressure, and then you measure how much resistance the tissue has where you point it, where you point your device to. That is one thing. But the next step is 
go from the tissue to the cell. Take it out and go down and down and down in size. And eventually, you know, what you do is basically you're getting it through a very thin opening. And the cell that can make it is very elastic. A cell that is not uh, elastic, that will not go through a very thin opening, just very basically. That is single cell elastography. And then, of course, have to, you have to put it into uh, a mechanical device. There's a patent on that for the uh, for the uh, tissue elastography, but uh, the the cell, of course, that is the one where we need uh, definitely further work. Yeah? And then, of course, you want to see deep tissue layers using model-based uh, optical sensors, and that is optical coherence tomography. But uh, the, the, the problem is optical coherence tomography has been around here for some time already, but you want to combine it. You want to combine it uh, with other modalities to get deep tissue information in order to, uh, as I said before, you want to know what is beyond two, three, four millimeters to what we are, what we see on the surface intraoperatively. Yeah? And the um, uh, 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 electrical impotence is something that is impedance, not impotence. Uh, it is uh, impedance that is something for uh, discriminating tissue again. Again, this is something that can be built in into, for example, a forceps, uh, and then uh, that will allow us uh, additional information. Interoperative navigation is important. Why? Because we want to know exactly where did we, in a minimally invasive surgery, get, did get that information about the resistance of the tissue, the tissue that we take out for a Raman spectroscopy. We want to have a three-dimensional picture of where exactly we were, uh, especially if we are not doing open surgery. So in, in conclusion, what we, what, we, what we are trying is, and I know it sounds complicated, but uh, precision is complicated sometimes. You know, we want to have mechanical, optical, electronic, uh, uh, sensors. And we want to get that into an information where we need to know where it is coming from, interoperative navigation. We want to see the classification and the modeling of a score. And we can do that starting out on single cell, then on organoids, then in in vivo studies. And it is very important to have the validation of the pathologist because he is the one who is telling us what type of tissue uh, it was which we were working with, where we took uh, eventually uh, uh, data from which were comparable to the single cell or to the organoid. And that is the vision. Intraoperative diagnostics is something where we want to work intraoperatively with the help of free operative data, imaging and so on, and with the help of the postoperative histology from the, patho from the uh, pathologist. But we want to avoid, or we do, we want not replace frozen section, but we want to have something in addition to the frozen section where the, uh, the, the tissue does not leave the OR. We get real time information, real time during the surgery, and thus uh, having a more precision right at hand like that. Yeah? And that is uh, the message, and that is the group that is helping us uh, at, at my place to do all this work. And it is a group uh, where there are a few urologists, a few other clinicians, pathologists, but a lot of engineers. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I think it was just right at the right time when uh, Sharok and his team made the classification. Thanks. Thank you. I'm oh, smart. Any questions? I don't think there is any question, yeah. uh, uh, especially at this time of the day. Everybody's waiting for the winner. It's waiting for the winner. Okay. There's going to be, I will ask if you would allow me, Orzola to, we have always, you know, in these events, you have watched, uh, we're not going to do like Will Smith and, and the other guy. <laughs>
but you need to have a beautiful lady next to you if you want to be a successful man. So I asked Ursula to help us. So we calculated, it took us 20 minutes. Obviously our brain cells were a little bit thin, but we had three people double check it, every number. So we're gonna give six awards yesterday for the best posters. And you know, I have to really from the bottom of my heart say thank you for everybody who participated because the poster session was really high quality. I've never seen it as high quality as any Central European meeting as that what we said yesterday, we've seen yesterday. Not only the content, but the presentation. The same for the country competition. We have really seen a tremendous change over the years in the presentation style and the research part. So I'm very, very curious. Maybe you, uh, I put it here for use because Ursula will have the microphone as well, or do you want to take this one? So let's start. Oh, and we need a, we need a little statues. Poster, please. <laughs> Thanks God, I have a brain. Uh, she's my brain. She's overthinking. So okay, we have the thing. Okay, we're gonna. We have things for you guys. We have to give the right one to the right person. We have to figure out that out. You know, the longer we make them wait, the more they're going to be stressed. Okay, poster awards. The best poster from the 100 posters that have been submitted. Goes to... Music, music, music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ekaterina Klatina. Russia. Obviously, this was voted by every judge. Probably we should have all the judges on the stage, no? This going to be a picture is good. Let's have all the judges on the stage. It would be good. You know, Ekaterina is going to have this. She's going to remember. It's going to be a memory. These were the crazy guys that gave me the award. <laughs> Do we fit? It's okay. Fantastic. So you're going to get uh, Bravo, Ekaterina, really well done. She, sub wait, wait. she submitted, I think, six posters. She submitted six posters. So she did a lot of work. A photo of the jury? Okay. Yo, yo, okay. Let's, let's do it like this. And... Is it good? Thank you so much. It's more than an hour. But we have to stay, you guys, because we're going to take the picture. And, and I have to say that the points were really close. It was really one, two points, and so on. So... The second place, and we talk about how much money Haron was it? He's the finance. Hmm? Second place was 500? <laughs> <laughs> From whose salary? <laughs> <laughs> second poster. Second poster goes to Iris Atwell and, and Adam Seelers. <laughs> Iris and Adam Selesh. Okay. You both were ex echo in a number of points. So you have to split the award. <laughs> yeah, so this is the, oh well, uh, let me look at which one is. Uh, this is, and please, one. Yeah, one of you, and this is for Iris. And uh, wait, we have to give you also this. Yes, Iris, and this is Adam Selesh. Fifty percent of the money goes always to the chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much. Really, thank you for the fantastic uh, work you did and the posters. I know it was in three weeks. I don't even know how the guys printed it in that time because we gave him the printing instructions a week before. Third place. Third place goes to Melanie Hustler and Mara Di Melinda. Mara Di Melinda. Melinda Mara Di Melinda. Yours, and that's it. This is it's great. It's all, yeah, it's all women, huh? No, Adam was a man, yeah. <laughs> and the first one. That's true. I see Peter is really proud. You know, these awards are just a start. <laughs> Today, we ex you got awards for the EA, uh, for the SOIS. Tomorrow, we want here is the boss of the EAU awards at the EAU, right? Remember the names, Arnold. Remember the names. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're so kind. So, country competition, fresh in accounting. Uh, we had three people counted and double counted. So the numbers came out right, and, and, and uh, Arnof gave uh, his lecture just perfectly for us to count. <laughs> we were a little bit slow due to the alcohol consumption yesterday. Country competition, first place. Oh, we need the uh, Oscars. Thank you so much. Maximilian Pockauf. Yeah. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. Don't give the fifty percent to Lucas, give it to me. Where's Lucas? He's already returned to Salzburg, huh? His boss is in Salzburg. Okay, bravo. 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 Congratulations. His wife's going to ask him, you did, you worked so hard, that's all you got? <laughs> Don't you have any gifts for me? From <laughs> it's pure, pure gold. <laughs> Don't melt it. Thank you so much, Shamash. And that's the third place for the country competition. Rashi. Bravo. Bravo. Very well done. So in the final words, I will uh, want to thank the judges for the hard work they did. They were uh, very generous, a lot of points. I have to say the country competition as well. A lot of people were very close. And, and uh, we talked about a few points, but um, I think this shows also that quality in the region is really high and very good.
Thank you to very, all of you. My final words I want to make and then leave to the group the final words because I think Piotr is going to announce at the end uh, the next meeting, right? You will do that at the end. You want to do it now? Um, dear colleagues, um, dear friends, um, Mr. Chairman and Presidents of the Central European Urological Society and dear formers, it's a pleasure and honor for me to announce the next meeting which will have place in Krakow in a March. 2425. Please do not forget, please save the date. The City of the Kings, very historical medieval city with the oldest university uh, in Poland is waiting for you. I will be responsible fully for, us, for our comfortable stay and together with Mr. President and the, all the executive board of the Central European Neurological Society, hopefully. See you next year in March in Krakow. Thank you. Bravo. So don't forget, put in your schedule. We expect posters. We expect hard work, country competition, warm up for it. We're going to have some data. Before we finish, and we're very close, I know everybody is ready to leave, but I want to just thank a few people who really did this work. As I said, four weeks ago, one day I came to office and I said, and I heard in the news, we're going to open, Austria is going to open and we can do events. And I called Harun and uh, Sylvia and said, let's do this meeting in four weeks. They thought you're crazy. But actually, we pulled it off. Thanks to you guys. Thanks to the National Society that made the commitment, because these are all very busy people uh, that came. And, and um, thanks to Arnulf, uh, the EAU with GERD and so on, you really made this possible. Thanks to the industry that really went out of their way to make a contract transition and the sponsoring possible, which is absolutely necessary. Companies uh, have really not only supported us, some companies have brought the products here so that for the workshops in such a short notice, it is incredible. And we are very grateful, and that is really unique. I want to thank Sylvia. Um, Sylvia has been the secretary of Michael Marburger. She thought when he went in retirement, things going to get better. It just got worse afterwards when I came. Um, and she really... <laughs> very special, very special. When she takes on something, it just, just happens. I want to thank Haron because uh, he's my alter ego. He goes through every craziness I go through. <laughs> he not only uh, made everything possible, but he's also our finance minister, making sure that the finances work. Uh, you know, you say never trust a Croatian with money, but uh, it happens, he's there. <laughs> he's much better than me. So he made it possible. And I want to uh, thank the uh, company Mediamo, uh, Christoph, where are you? Because uh, when we contacted him, Christoph is back there. Um, we called him. He's a friend of ours. <laughs> he makes PR management and things like that. And we called him, look, we need somebody crazy who can pull this off. He said it's impossible. He regrets being our friend. Uh, he called his mother, his grandmother, his girlfriend, his ex-girlfriend, his everybody to come and work on this in these three weeks, and he made it possible. Thank you so much. Posters, setups, everything he took care. Really fantastic. I want to thank, again, the national societies, the EAU, GERT, and Alnulf. I want to thank you for sticking around, for being with us and making this possible. Uh, I hope I didn't forget anybody. My mother, my thing, no, okay, that's it. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for your, everybody. Safe return. Unless anybody wants to say final words, no? I think that on behalf of the national uh, societies, we have to say many, many things for yourself, who did a great job, and we very much appreciate the staying here in this beautiful city, and thank you very much for all of you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Safe return, everybody. Safe return back home. And in Krakow, uh, I want also the hotel to call Piotr at 6 a.m. to say there's still some people at the bar. <laughs>